Body Electric, a Mystic City Novel, by Theo Lawrence, read by Amy Finnegan. Prologue Aria, Hunter says, Are you with me? My arms begin to shake from the energy still flowing from my fingers. I know I have only seconds before I pass out. With you, how? Hunter starts to say something, but I can't make it out because one of the buildings we're supporting, the skyscraper with Shannon's energy web still covering its facade, begins to fall again. Only, somehow, it has changed direction even as it's breaking apart. It is no longer going to crash into the east skyscraper. The people there will be safe. Instead, it's coming right for us. Run! Shannon screams. I can't hold it! There is no time to think. I can't run. I can barely move. Shannon's web disappears in the blink of an eye. Now Hunter's lasso is the only thing around the scraper. But the building's center of gravity has shifted, and I'm staring up at this beast of metal and steel and glass and concrete. Nothing, not even our combined mystic powers, will keep this building from collapsing. Furniture falls from the sky, crashing into the bridges and dropping into the depths. The sound mingles with the scream of steel and the cries of hundreds of people. I look around for Shannon and the others, but I can't see anything. It's too smoky. Then Hunter wraps his arms around me and gives me the tightest hug imaginable. A huge chunk of steel plummets toward our heads. I think, this is it. It's over. Part 1 That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Frederick Nietzsche. Chapter 1 I am weightless, fast, powerful. I cross the sky like a bullet, an arrow shooting through the air over Manhattan. Below me is a tightly packed mass of people who have gathered at the base of the Empire State Building to cheer for peace, for freedom, for change. I navigate the air as if I were born to fly. It's as easy as breathing. The sun is near the horizon, its rays bleeding through the grayish smog and clouds. Aria! 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 I hear below me. I can't help but smile. My heart beats rapidly inside my chest. Is it my heart I feel, or Davidus? I twist in the air. It's nothing to change direction, to go higher, lower. I tilt my head and dive toward the depths as if it were a swimming pool. The air whooshes around me. It's a good thing I barely have any hair, otherwise it would surely whip across my eyes. I feel cool, even though I'm sweating. The cries of the people echo around me as I drop down past the Aries. Past Turk, waiting for me on the observation deck. Past Hunter, presumably still on the roof of a nearby building, where I broke up with him. Past my brother Kyle, who promised he would be open to a peace treaty between the Aries and the Depths but ambushed me instead. Past Thomas, once my fiancé and now my enemy, who stood by and did nothing as Kyle unleashed his army. Past my parents, though I have no idea where they are, probably in their lavish apartment high on the west side of the Eries. Past Kiki and Benny, whom I haven't seen or heard from since I threw my lot in with the rebels. The people of Manhattan, mystics and humans alike, deserve better than Thomas and Kyle, better than my father. Their chanting grows louder the closer I get to the depths, the lower part of Manhattan where the poor and the mystics live. They deserve a leader with their best interests at heart, a leader who believes in right and wrong, in justice. Aria! 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 From the sound of it, they've already found one. I only hope I can live up to their expectations. I touch down in the depths, near a canal. The air is sticky and hot, and the scuffed-up pavement practically sizzles. The training gear I'm wearing does a little to deflect the heat, but not much. I walk a few feet along the canal, which is surprisingly empty, save for a few gondolas tied to some rickety posts in the brownish-gray water. I'm a couple of blocks away from the crowds around the Empire State Building, but it's practically deserted here. Though it has only been a few hours, it feels like a long time since I've been in the depths. 
the broken down layer of the city where everyone lives who is not a supporter of my family, the Roses, or Thomas's family, the Fosters, who together control Manhattan. It has been even longer since I left my Erie's life as the privileged daughter of one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in Manhattan. I used to spend my days with my friends Kiki and Benny, shopping, gossiping, trying to figure out who was sexier, my brother's friend Danny, or Benny's younger brother Felix, who was a class behind me in school. Benny abstained from these discussions because of her blood relation to Felix, and because she was dating my brother and was madly in love with him. This was all before I met Hunter Brooks, however, and life as I knew it changed. I pass a few storefronts with broken windows. What's left of the glass is covered with grime and the remnants of graffiti, most of which condemns my family. I duck down an alley, grateful for the shade, and glance up at the Empire State Building, towering in the distance. The Peace Summit was meant to bring city leaders together to try to find a way for humans and mystics to live harmoniously. It was to be a meeting between Hunter, representing the Depths Dwellers, mystics and non-mystics alike, Kyle, representing the Rose family, and Thomas Foster, representing his own family. The goal was to stop the impending war between the Ares and the Depths and to save as many lives as possible. It failed. And now I'm one of them, a mystic. I stretch my arm out in front of me. It looks the same as it always has, but I know it's not. There is mystic energy pulsing through my arteries, the same energy that helped to build the super-tall skyscrapers of the Ares, forged from Damascus steel, and the silvery bridges that connect them. It's the same energy that has been forcefully drained from the mystics after the conflagration, stolen from the magic workers against their will, and used to fuel the city of Manhattan. Davida, my personal servant for seven years, was one of the most powerful mystics in the city, and a rebel spy. She died for me, and with Turk's help I found her heart, which contained all of her mystic powers and had been excavated from the canals. Then, per her last wishes, I ate it, just minutes before the summit. Now I have her powers surging through my body. I already know I can fly. What else can I do? My fingers begin to tingle. The tips, I notice, are the palest shade of green. Are Hunter's fingertips like this? I can't seem to remember, even though I should know such a detail about my boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend, I remind myself. It's still hard to believe I ended things with Hunter. The boy I defied my parents for. A rebel mystic, whom I still love, though I know I can't be with him anymore. Carefully, I reach down and press my hand to the pavement. I feel a pulse in the center of my palm. My skin throbs like someone just stabbed me, and jets of electricity shoot up my arms, firing every neuron. I hear a rumble, and the ground beneath me seems to move. I close my eyes and feel a shooting pain in my chest. And then... Days like these make me wish my uniform were white. As I leave the apartment, my coal-black blouse and skirt absorb the heat like a sponge. The gloves don't help, of course. They nearly reach my elbows. But since it's my choice to wear them, I can't reasonably complain. I have an hour to meet him. And seeing how it will take me nearly twenty minutes to get there, we will have basically no time at all. A few minutes at most for the whole encounter. I keep my head down as I cross the bridge from the Rose apartment building to the nearest pod. Thank the sisters for my hair, which is even blacker than my uniform, and long enough to tousel in front of my eyes, hiding my face. The last thing I need is to have people ask Mrs. Rose why her maid was flitting around the Aries on the eve of Aria's engagement party. Engagement party. Ha! Huh, what a sham. People pass me on either side, Aries dwellers, rich humans who support either the Rose family or the Foster family, their enemies, who respectively run the west and east sides of Manhattan. Not for long, though, since tonight the families are announcing their union, which begins with Arya marrying Thomas Foster. Arya remembers none of it. Not falling in love with Thomas, or their secret rendezvous, or begging her parents to let her marry a Foster. She's been told her memory loss is the result of an overdose of stick, the drug the rich take to feel what it's like to have mystic energy coursing through them. I don't need a drug to know how mystic energy feels, and unlike Arya... I remember everything about her relationship with Thomas, notably the fact that it's a lie. 
She asked me what I make of it all, and I haven't told her the truth. That she never even met Thomas before her parents erased her memory. That she has never taken stick. It's not that I don't want to tell her, but knowing the truth right now is too dangerous for her. If she let something slip, she could be killed, and I would never want to be responsible for any harm coming Arya's way. I breathe a sigh of relief when I see the pod and finally can get out of the sweltering sun. It's a triangular heap of metal with a facade of mirrored glass, almost like a pyramid, and it works like a supercharged elevator. A point of descent station is the only way for drained mystics and humans who work as maids or cooks or janitors to get from the depths to the homes of their employers in the Aries, assuming they don't live there like I do. The only other way to get from the Aries to the depths is by private helicopter. Many of the rich Aries folks have these, but they don't travel to the depths. They use them to go on vacation somewhere exotic like Hawaii or one of those islands I've heard about in Central America. There is another way to get to the depths, of course. If you're a mystic who has access to a loophole and, like me, has managed to avoid being drained. I can't risk anyone seeing me come and go that way in daylight, though. At night... It's a different matter. In the station, two older women in maids' uniforms stare crossly at me as we wait. Pods aren't exactly the newest technology around, like the light rails, for example, which transport rich folk all over the areas at super speeds, but never make their way into the depths. I submit my gloved hand to the scanner, and the name Alana Carter flashes across the screen. Thanks to my enhanced gloves, I can ride the pods and remain off the grid, the fingerprints of hundreds of dead folks are embedded into the tips. I nod hello to the women, noticing the Rose family insignia sewn into the collars of their blouses, which means they work for families that support Johnny Rose, Ari's father. I watch the women's eyes as they locate the same insignia on my uniform. They each give me a tiny smile as the pod arrives and the doors open. They think we are the same. If only they knew who I really work for. Because I grew up there, I never realized the depths had a smell until I left and came back. The depths smell like sweat, like desperation, like struggle. It's overwhelming and fishy and dank and wet. To some it may be disgusting, but to me it smells like home. I scurried down the canal in the direction of the Magnificent Block, but not that far east. The Magnificent Block, which houses the Great Lawn, used to be known as Central Park before the oceans rose. The streets of the city filled with water, and all things green and glorious died. Now the block is where drained mystics live in tenements. It's where my parents would have lived had they not gone underground. Our meeting place is always the same, an abandoned subway station at 72nd Street in Amsterdam. It's boarded up, but that has never stopped us. I haven't seen him since the night Arya's parents had her memory erased. We met that evening on Arya's balcony while everyone was at the hospital. Since then, we've been communicating mostly through coded texts. In spite of everything, I can hardly wait to see him. I pass a few women who have set up tiny stands on the street, across from the Broadway Canal, selling trinkets and bottles of water. It's loud here, messier than the Aries. I see children rushing about, shouting and weaving through the crowds and skipping pebbles into the dirty canal water until the gondoliers yell at them to stop. It brings a smile to my face. The areas are so crisp, so clean, so quiet. It's the difference between a fancy meal in an exotic restaurant that leaves you hungry and a hearty, spicy dinner with friends where you eat and laugh so much that your belly hurts. I prefer the latter, though I haven't had many laughs or much time with friends or family in many years, not since my parents enlisted me to help the rebel cause. I was eleven when they secured me a place as a maid in the Rose household so I could spy and do their dirty work from the inside, choosing not to register me with the government to save me from being drained. I have lived in the Aries ever since, for nearly seven years. Seven years that I have lived a lie, gathering information for the rebels. Seven years I have put my own wishes on hold as I tend to the Rose family. Johnny, ruthless and powerful, his wife Melinda, their son Kyle, and their daughter Aria, who has grown to be like a sister to me. The only thing that makes it worthwhile is seeing him. I reach the subway station and see the two large green pillars that mark the entrance. Years ago, before the Aries existed, people used subways for transportation. 
Once the city flooded, though, these tunnels became useless, and the entrances were sealed. The only people who inhabit the underground nowadays are the rebels, like my parents' friend Violet, his mother, who is leading our cause, as his grandfather did before her. It is our hope that soon no mystic will be forcibly drained of his or her energy. Soon, we hope, we will not be persecuted and will live as equals with the humans in the Ares. Soon we will be able to make enough money to support ourselves and our families. We hold on to our dreams because they are free, and because without them, life would be unbearable. I check to make sure that no one is watching. Taking off my gloves, I place my palm on one of the small green globes at the subway entrance. Energy surges through me, and the globe begins to glow. Then wisps of green energy flow from my fingertips, swirling around the globe and burrowing into the hammered sheets of metal in the sealed entrance. This is when I know it's safe to enter. I walk forward and press my other hand into the metal, watching my fingers disappear, then my hand, then my entire arm. I tingle as my body passes through. For one second, it feels like I'm trying to squeeze my skull into a keyhole. The air gets sucked out of me. Then I hear a pop, and I'm on the other side. The only light is from the tiny green bulbs of mystic energy plastered to the tunnel walls to help us navigate. And there, in the shadows, is my betrothed. Hunter. He steps toward me, and my heart leaps. His blue eyes blink, and he sweeps his dirty blonde hair away from his forehead. I want to run to him, to this man I have known since I was a baby, when our parents promised us to one another before either of us knew how to speak. The trouble is that Hunter isn't mine. Not really. Instead of me, he loves Arya. I want to slap him or kiss him, but I do neither. She's all right, I tell him, confused, but fine, for the moment. He steps toward me, and I can hear him breathing. Davida, he says, I want to visit tonight. You can't just to see her, to make sure she's safe. She's safe, I tell him. You need to get a message to my parents. Tell them I want... I want to come home. I nearly choke on the words. To come home now... To give up my place in the Rose family would be to admit failure. But I don't care about the revolution, not the same way they do. I care about Hunter, about love. And in spite of everything, I do care for Arya. Hunter shakes his head like he doesn't understand what I'm saying. Home. But it's over, Hunter, I tell him. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't know who you are. He bites his lip. If she sees me, he says. If she just sees me, then I'm sure she'll remember. She won't, I say emphatically. You have to believe me. Aria, he whispers. Even in the dim green light, I can see that he's about to cry. She's gone, I tell him. Aria, he says again. Aria. 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 I gasp and open my eyes. I feel like I'm underwater, like I can't breathe. Aria? I'm on the ground, huddled up against the wall of a dilapidated building, knees pressed to my chest. I feel like I've been punched in the stomach. I blink. Yarick? He nods. Are you okay? Next to Yarick is Shannon. What are you doing? She says, glaring down at me. Taking a nap? Leave her alone. Yarick says, crouching in front of me. We saw you flying and we followed. He shakes his head and lets out a strange laugh. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. We saw you flying. What have you done, Arya? My entire body is sore and I'm weak. I feel drained. Shouldn't you be with Rhea? I ask Shannon, remembering our fight with Alyssa Genevieve, the power-hungry mystic who worked for my father and betrayed her people. She's in good hands, Shannon says. They're doing the best they can. Rhea, a spunky rebel mystic and our friend, suffered massive burns over much of her body during the fight, a victim of Alyssa's powerful mystic energy. At least she didn't lose her life like Landon did, and like Alyssa did, too, in the end. And you, I say to Yarick, shouldn't you be on the observation deck with Turk? 
The last time I saw Turk was when I left him at the Empire State Building before flying away with Hunter. I assume he's still there, and that Hunter went back to save him from Kyle's soldiers, who had attacked us before the start of the peace summit. They're handling things, Yarrick says. After Shannon left Rhea at the Triage Center, she met up with us on the deck, and that's when we saw you and, well, we wanted to make sure you're okay. I'm fine, I say. Yarrick raises one dark eyebrow. But... Whoa, I say, trying to stand up and almost toppling over. Yarrick reaches out for me, grasping my hands and pulling me to my feet. Shannon continues to stare at me like a disapproving schoolmarm. We've got to get you out of here, she tells me, and back to the hideout. Then we can discuss... But she doesn't finish her sentence, because just then, the Empire State Building explodes. Chapter 2 Turn the volume down, I say. I can't watch any more. Turk mutes the TV. We're in the library at the Rebel hideout, watching footage from the explosion. It's been three days since the bombing of the Empire State Building sent rubble flying through the sky, falling from the Ares like dangerous hail. I can still taste the smoke and hear the screams as people ran to safety while stone and metal smacked into the streets and buildings and canals of the depths. And watching every news channel play it over and over doesn't help me forget. I remember the immediate aftermath of the explosion, when the air was black and cloudy, and I don't even know how Yarrick, Shannon, and I got back to the hideout. All I know is that at the time, I had no idea whether Turk and Hunter had survived. Luckily they did. Hunter was able to swoop down and pull Turk away just seconds before the explosion. Thomas Foster, my former fiancé, wasn't so lucky. Nor were hundreds of others in the crowd around the base of the Empire State Building, a crowd that had gathered at my behest. When is Rhea supposed to arrive? Yarrick says, brushing back his long hair. Behind him, the library shelves are stuffed with old books. I didn't even realize there was a touch-me screen in here until Shannon pressed a touchpad that lowered it from a paper-thin slit in the ceiling. We're seated around a long wooden table in not very comfortable chairs. I don't know what to do with my hands, so I stuff them under my legs. Soon, Shannon says. Maybe an hour? It's already six, Yarrick says. Are you sure she's coming home tonight? Shannon says. Yes. Seeing Rhea passed out on the ground, not moving, after Alyssa attacked her was one of the most frightening moments of my life. Rhea, a mystic with boundless energy, all wide-eyed and full of fervor, was practically at death's door when I saw her last. I have no idea what state she'll be in when she gets here, or how long it will take her to recover, if she'll ever be the same. The inside of the hideout is oddly quiet. People usually are coming and going at all hours. Since the hideout is protected by mystic energy, it's a safe house for us. But after I broke up with him, Hunter and some of the other mystic rebels set up another hideout downtown. Kyle, who also survived the explosion, has informed the press that we, the Rebels, were responsible for the damage to the New York City Monument. Sadly, Kyle's relationship with the truth is as distant as his relationship with me. I've heard Hunter is preparing for retaliation, but as for Hunter himself, I haven't laid eyes on him since I broke up with him. He's made sure of that. It doesn't matter what time Rhea shows up, Turk says, as long as she does. He leans back in his chair and rubs the top of his head, now covered in dark fuzz, like he still can't believe his signature mohawk is gone. We shaved our heads together, in solidarity with the men and women in the depths who were suffering at the hands of my family and the Fosters. Glad she's okay, Yarrick says now. Shannon snorts. No thanks to you, she says, spitting her words in Yarrick's direction. Shannon has always been beautiful, with her high cheekbones, creamy skin, and garnet-colored hair— but it is a ferocious kind of beauty. She has the kind of face that makes you nervous to look away, the kind of mouth that could eat you alive, the stance of a warrior. Only now there are dark circles under her eyes, and her long hair is tied back in a careless knot. It seems the stress of the past week has gotten to her. It's gotten to me, too. I'm still not myself. I fall asleep at odd hours, and when I'm awake, my mind races, thinking about a million things at once. It's painful to be outside without sunglasses or to eat anything other than bread and bland vegetables. 
Still, I feel more alive than ever before, more aware of my surroundings. It's exhausting. You do remember what you did, right? Shannon says to Yarek. How you betrayed... Hey, I begin, but Yarek just shrugs. It's fine, Arya. She's right, he says. Despite being incredibly tall, Yarek looks like a little boy right now. His shoulders are hunched, like he's trying to curl into a ball. His cheeks turn the color of rose petals, and he averts his eyes, looking anywhere except at Shannon. See? Shannon says. Yarek knows he's guilty. Don't you think I regret what I did? Yarek says, his voice full of pain. If I had known that Alyssa would capture me, that she would use me to hurt you. He looks around. All of you and Landon. He sounds like he's about to cry. Landon and I had our differences, but I loved him like a brother. I never wanted anything to happen to him or to Rhea. Yarek's failed attempt to steal Davida's heart and ingest its powers is what led to our confrontation with Alyssa Genevieve and the battle that cost us so much. I am responsible for Landon's death. I may not have killed him, but he died because of me. I am responsible for Rhea getting hurt as well, Yarek says to Shannon. Nothing you can say to me is as bad as the thoughts running through my head. Looking at him, I can tell Yarek is racked with guilt. A small part of me doubts that I can trust him, but for better or for worse, he's one of us. As long as he's sincere about his remorse, I don't see why we shouldn't give him a second chance. Shannon, though, is another story. Some of us don't forgive so easily. She crosses her arms and stares at Turk. That's not something to be proud of, Turk says sternly. Let it go, Shannon. He gives a sympathetic glance to Yarek, who looks relieved. I watch as Shannon considers Turk's advice. Fine, she says at last. Besides, we have more important things to worry about, like this. She takes the remote and unmutes the television so we can hear the announcer and some dark-skinned man with a fake smile. In a matter of weeks, he is saying, nearly the entire Foster family has been eliminated. Do we have to watch this? I ask no one in particular. Yes, Shannon replies. It's difficult to believe, Stern, says his co-anchor, a beady-eyed blonde. Not too long ago, it looked like the Foster stronghold on the east side of the Ares was about to expand, with their elder son Garland's run for office and their younger son Thomas's marriage to Aria Rose. Now, in what feels like the blink of an eye, both of the Foster heirs are dead. We have not been able to reach Mr. and Mrs. Foster for comment. A picture of Garland and Thomas appears as the reporters launch into a feature about the Foster sons. I stare at the screen, silent. I can't help but feel responsible for Thomas's death. He was at the Empire State Building because of the summit I helped to organize. And yet I can't seem to muster any tears. There was a point not long ago when I thought I loved Thomas, when I tried to convince myself that we could be happy together. Then I found out Thomas was a liar and that he'd cheated on me. He kidnapped me and ordered his soldiers to murder dozens, if not hundreds, of innocent people in his quest for power. No, Thomas wasn't a good man. I never wished him dead but I find myself feeling just numb when I think of him. Arya, Turk says, getting up from the sofa and coming to my side. He's wearing a loose-fitting turquoise v-neck with the sleeves cut off, leaving little to the imagination. I try to stop myself from noticing how sexy he is, but it's hard. I can see the colors of his tattoos swirling up his muscular biceps, brown from the sun. Under the neck of his shirt, I can make out bits and pieces of the tattooed image of a sister. Her emerald green and glittering blue and lavender hair, the oval face with so few defining details she could almost be anyone, any young girl. But she isn't a young girl. She's one of seven sisters, the most important figures in mystic history. You okay? Turk says. He gently touches my arm. Across the room I see Shannon glaring at me. Behind her, Yarek seems preoccupied with his own thoughts. Yes, I say, even though that isn't exactly true. I feel lightheaded and queasy, like I ate too much of the wrong thing. Maybe this is simply what it feels like to be a mystic. Arya, Turk says again. Are you okay? I used to think of Turk as Hunter's friend. He seemed rash, wild, and a little dangerous, the sort of boy your mother would tell you not to get involved with. 
Lately, I've seen his soft side. Before the explosion, I knew he was interested in me, but I told myself we could only be friends. Looking at him now, his devilish eyes filled with concern for me, I wonder if we could be something more. Before I can answer, Kyle appears on the Touch Me screen. We interrupt our current story for a live interview with Kyle Rose, says the blonde anchor, who has agreed to speak with us about the Empire State Building devastation. Kyle, are you there? Yes, Amelia, he says. I can't tell where he's being filmed. Thank you for having me. Next to Kyle, his girlfriend, Benny, is wearing a simple black dress with white piping around the neck and sleeves. She is looking at him as he speaks, a small smile playing across her lips, her naturally dark hair now dyed blonde and fashioned in a demure knot. I am surprised that my mother and father are absent, or letting Kyle represent the Rose family. Thank you for having me, Shannon repeats in disgust. Who does he think he is, some kind of movie star? He's not promoting a film. He killed innocent... Kyle, the male anchor says. The Rose family has yet to release a statement since the explosion. Why is that? We have been helping those injured in the explosion, Kyle says, and putting all of our resources into cleaning up the devastation. My father has been working non-stop to find missing persons. Luckily, we now know that the damage to the actual structure of the building was limited. Thus far, we have counted nearly 100 civilian deaths, most of whom were struck by falling debris. Kyle puts his arm around Benny, as if to safeguard her from such terrible news. It is a terrible loss, of course, but thanks to the efficiency of our military units, the area will be safe and back to normal in no time. That is such bullshit, Yarrick shouts at the screen. Some people are saying this is reminiscent of the conflagration, the female anchor continues. What do you have to tell us about that? Kyle straightens his black tie and stares directly at the camera. I can see in the way he holds himself, like a miniature Johnny Rose, that he's grown more self-confident in the past few weeks. The conflagration was one of the worst events our city has ever suffered, he says. That bomb, made of mystic energy, took the lives of thousands of innocent civilians. After that, the power of the mystic population was severely limited to prevent another such tragedy. This, of course, is only partly true. The conflagration was devastating, but as it turns out, Elisa Genevieve, a mystic trader, was responsible for making the bomb. She orchestrated the event for my father as a way to blame and ghettoize the mystic people, draining them of their powers and rights and keeping them in a perpetual zombie state. My brother knows this. Who would you say is responsible for the destruction of the Empire State Building? The male anchor asks now. Kyle answers immediately. My sister, Arya. I gasp. Seriously? He's blaming me? Ever since Arya took up the mystic cause, she hasn't been the same. Kyle continues in a calm, even voice. She's gone so far as to ingest stick, which no doubt accounts for all the footage we've seen of her flying around the Ares. Ha! Turk says under his breath. If he really knew. Meanwhile, Kyle turns to his girlfriend. Wouldn't you say so, Benny? I can't help but cling to the hope that my friend is going to stick up for me. Benny may be a few years older than I am, but she, Kiki, and I were a team, a trio. Surely she'll tell the truth, that I'm not a bad person, that I have the best interests of the people of Manhattan at heart. Aria is not the person I used to know, Benny says, shaking her head. She has certainly changed. This feels like a blow. Turk reaches out to me, but I shrug him away. I can still remember when Kyle introduced us to Benny. He'd met her at college and brought her home just before the December holidays. My parents were at dinner, and Kiki and I were stealing sips of my father's schnapps and asking my brother's best friend, Danny, what college is like. So you don't call your parents ever? Kiki had asked. Danny laughed. He and Kyle have been friends forever, like me and Kiki. Danny's father, Martin, is one of my father's most trusted employees. They've been friends since they were boys, and Martin is a full-fledged Rose supporter. It's hard to find people you can trust, my father always said. But Martin Fogg is reliable. Danny and Kyle went to preparatory school together as teenagers, and both of them attended Columbia University on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. 
I call every couple of days, Danny had said, sipping from his drink. I remember the sound the ice made as it clinked against the glass. How handsome Danny was with his tousled brown hair and his deep-set puppy-dog eyes, the sort of eyes that kept secrets. I've known Danny and his family almost as long as Kyle has, but I've never really spent any time alone with him. He was always with Kyle. So what is she like? I asked. Danny blinked. Who? Benny! Kiki shouted, throwing up her hands. Duh, the whole reason we're here! Danny shifted in his seat. She's... you know. Pretty? Kiki asked. Sweet, amazing? She narrowed her eyes. Bitchy? Just then, the front door opened, and my older brother Kyle shouted, Hello! He walked into the foyer, dressed in a dark navy suit and polished black shoes. Next to him was Benny, a beautiful girl whose shiny black hair and long legs immediately made me jealous. Guys, Kyle had said, this is Benny. I remember a lot about that night. Meeting my brother's girlfriend for the first time, realizing that not only was she beautiful, but she was smart and funny and way more interesting than Kyle. She came from a family my parents would most definitely approve of. Even Kiki liked her. The only person who didn't seem completely in love with her was Danny, who stood back from the group and drank more that night than he probably should have. I remember wondering if he had a thing for Benny himself. Benny had the kind of personality that drew you in, made you feel comfortable around her. She was kind, and soon she was my friend, and Kiki's too. At least, I thought she was. Now I'm staring at a person on the touch me who looks like someone I used to know, but the resemblance stops there. Aria is giving people false hope, my brother continues, his arms still around Benny, the happy couple. She is encouraging civil disobedience in the depths, causing death and violence when we need to restore faith in our city. Faith? What do you mean by that? The female anchor asks. Manhattan is a strong city, Kyle says, but even we are vulnerable to invasion. We must protect our borders from other cities that might view us as an easy target, like Philadelphia and Trenton, even New Haven or Boston. Easy target, the male anchor says with a nervous chuckle. Uh, what exactly are you implying, Kyle? Well, Kyle says, we cannot allow ourselves to be perceived as weak, and we cannot let people like my sister tear us apart from the inside. That is why I urge you, Aria, to turn yourself in. If you do not, there will be dire consequences. And if anyone out there knows of Arya's whereabouts, do not keep them hidden. She is a traitor to our great city. He lowers his voice. And traitors will not be tolerated. That's enough of that, Turk says, snapping off the touch me. But, Shannon starts to say, the intercom buzzes sharply. Someone is at the front door. I'll get it, Yarrick says, disappearing down the hallway. I can't believe Kyle is blaming me for the explosion, I say. Shannon rolls her eyes at me. Well, I can believe it, I amend. But it makes no sense. Everyone was cheering for me. They were cheering for peace, Shannon says. And they thought you were going to provide that. But guess what? You didn't. She sneers at me like I'm her enemy. Shannon has never liked me. After the battle last month, when Hunter's mother and Garland Foster were killed... Shannon resented having to stay in the country to train me when she'd rather have been on the streets of Manhattan fighting alongside the other rebels. Even now, back in the city, she's never kind to me. Always brash, with jabs and comments that stab like knives. Not yet, I say. I thought Shannon and I had connected after our battle with Alyssa. After all, we're on the same team. But there's still animosity between us that I don't understand. Think about it, Arya, Shannon says. People gathered around the Empire State Building because you told them to. You were the one who recorded that message, begging for peace, and sent it out into the world. What did you expect would happen? You exposed Hunter's plan to overthrow your brother at the Empire State Building and endangered the other mystics and your own family, not to mention all the innocent people who gathered around you in support, she continues. Then people saw you literally flying with no explanation, and then the whole place was blown to smithereens along with who knows how many of those people who came because you told them to. I don't think you exactly come off looking great after all that, you know? 
I want to tell her she's wrong. But there's merit to what she said. Now Kyle is playing the good guy, Shannon says, and trying to get the people back on his side. Did you hear what he said about protecting us from invasion? Yes, I say. Thomas Foster told me the same thing, that other city-states were getting ready to attack us, to invade, to conquer. Oh, it makes sense. We have to convince the people of Manhattan that Kyle is wrong, that we, the mystics, are the ones who can protect them. If they join us, Shannon says. Right, Turk? Turk nods. Shannon is right, he says to me. And you have to help us. Me? I say. How? Another rally, Shannon says with a spark in her eyes. You have to deny Kyle's accusations in public. Get people behind you. They want to believe that you had nothing to do with this. You just have to convince them. Immediately, I think of the rally Davida and I snuck out to attend when Violet Brooks, Hunter's mother, urged the people of the depths, mystics and non-mystics, to come together and retaliate against the Aries. Violet was remarkable that evening. She spoke of her dreams for a world where mystics and humans could live on equal footing, as friends, colleagues, and companions. A few weeks later, she was gone, killed in a battle she hadn't started, a victim of Alyssa Genevieve's malicious intent. Hunter was supposed to take his mother's place, but he turned out to be more interested in bombs and guns and revenge than in peace. I... I don't know, I find myself saying, thinking of how eloquent Violet Brooks was. I share her passion, but not her charisma. What if I say something wrong, or people don't find me convincing after the explosion? I'm not the best public speaker, I say to the others. Maybe it shouldn't be me at that podium. So you're backing out, Shannon says. That's it? Of course not, I say. But Kyle just put a price on my head. I look at Turk, whose lips are pressed together in an expression that's difficult to read. He wants me to turn myself in, or worse things will happen. Maybe people won't want to hear from me. Maybe... Don't, Turk says. He comes closer to me so that our arms are touching. Don't doubt yourself, Arya. Whatever Kyle said, you're a good person. You may not be a natural-born leader, but people still look up to you. You're Johnny Rose's daughter, who left behind a life in the Aries because of love, because she believed that Manhattan could be better than it is right now. No one in the depths wants to hand you over to Kyle. They want to hear what you have to say. I promise. He places his hand over his heart. Let us fight alongside you, Arya. Make people believe that peace is possible. We'll do the rest. I take his free hand and squeeze it. His skin is tough, hard. I stare into his eyes, and for a second I forget Shannon is there. It feels like we're alone. Then someone coughs. <clears throat> um, guys. I look up. I see Eric, a smile on his face. Rhea's back. Come out and see for yourselves. Outside, the air is sticky and the sky is overcast, with streaks of gray and blue. Behind me is the hideout, a five-story triangular-shaped brick townhouse, which occupies a sliver in the center of an empty lot in Upper Manhattan, in an area formerly known as Harlem. From the outside, all anyone can see is cracked pavement that takes up an entire block of city space. But if you're a mystic, you can pass through the force field and find us. Standing on a dry patch of yellowish lawn is Rhea, one hand resting on a metal cane. A woman I don't recognize is standing beside her. You look great, Shannon says, coming down the steps of the townhouse and giving Rhea a careful hug. Honestly. I need to re-dye my hair, Rhea says with a smile. But that's the least of my worries, right? Rhea still has her dimples, but the rest of her is practically unrecognizable. Her signature blue pixie hairdo is a thing of the past, charred off after the battle. All that's left are white tufts scattered across her scalp like fuzzy seeds from a cottonwood tree. A mental image hits me of Alyssa hurling green rays of energy at Rhea, blasting her into unconsciousness. Her skin is tomato red, like she has an intense sunburn. One of her eyes is covered with gauze, and her cheeks are puffy and swollen. Turk gives my shoulder a nudge. What goes unsaid is, Landon. He died in the battle, another of Alyssa's victims. 
Because Landon had no family to ingest his heart in the mystic tradition, the leftover powers from his body were used to heal Rhea, which is the only reason she isn't dead. A sad sort of sacrifice. One friend gone, the other here. Rhea motions to the woman standing next to her. Guys, Rhea says, meet Connolly. She's incredible. Took super good care of me at the Treehouse Center. Connolly, this is... everyone. Yarek, Turk, and I wave hello. We've met before, Shannon says to the new mystic. Haven't we? We have. Connolly blinks. At the farmhouse? Those words have a terrible meaning for me. After the battle, when we were staying in the farmhouse and Shannon was training me to fight, there were other mystics who came and went during the weeks we spent there. And then we were invaded by Thomas's men, who were there to kidnap me. Many people died, including a young boy named Marcus, and Frida, the old woman who instructed me to find Davida's heart. A mystic's heart is never lost. You must find it. Well, Frida, I found it, and I ate it. And now Davida's powers are inside me, mingling with my blood, changing me, morphing me into something someone new. Make sure she rests, Connolly says, cocking her head toward Rhea. She has a lot of energy. Take care now. Watch yourself. Connolly waves and walks away through the protective force field. There's a shimmer in the air as she pushes through, and then she disappears. We, Turk says warmly. We're so glad to have you back safe and sound. As good as new, Rhea says cheerfully. I'm reminded of her ability to look at life as a half-full glass instead of a half-empty one. And I wish I were more like her. Almost, she adds. I don't walk so well, yet. But Connolly taught me a bunch of exercises to strengthen my muscles, and I'm counting on you all to help. Of course we will, Yarrick says. Now, how about we get you inside? Sound good? Rhea nods, and Yarrick extends his arm for her to lean on. Oh, and guys, he turns to the rest of us. I didn't call you out here just to see Rhea. Look. Yarrick points up toward the sky. Through the smog, I can make out the tips of silvery buildings and bridges in the Aries, and in the far distance, the sun. What are we looking at? I ask. Turk points directly above our heads. There. At first, I merely see clouds and sky. But then I see green. It almost looks like the middle of the sky has been painted with something. It's like the force field around the townhouse, but stronger, brighter. A large green circle in the sky, smack over the Aries. What is that? I ask. I'm not sure, Turk says. But whatever it is, it can't be good. It's dripping, Shannon says. Like molasses, it's spreading out. Shannon is right. The midpoint of the green patch seems to be directly over the center of Manhattan, and the edges of the circle look frayed, like they're growing, the way a balloon might look if someone poured syrup over it. Could it be a force field of some kind? Yarrick asks, staring nervously at the sky. It looks like maybe the start of one, Rhea says. But who would have put it there? And why? Turk lowers his gaze. Shannon, what do you think? I'm not sure, Shannon says. It has to be made of mystic energy, but we wouldn't know if this was the work of one of our kind. Whoever started this isn't on our side. Chapter 3 After dinner, I help Rhea settle into bed. I'm sorry you have to do this, Aria, she says to me as I pat her forehead gently with a damp cloth. The severe, life-threatening burns that Alyssa left her with seem to have healed slightly, but she flinches each time I touch her. She's weak, and the skin near her eyes has turned a strange shade of reddish-purple. Don't be silly, I tell her. I'm happy to. I keep thinking if I wish myself better, then I will be, Rhea says with a frown. Mystics are supposed to heal fast. I should be as good as new by now, shouldn't I? It's only been a few days, I tell her. You're able to walk. You're out of the hospital. You're doing great. I hope this is true, since I only know that mystics heal faster than most humans, and Rhea also had the help of Landon's mystic heart. Rhea's frown softens. I guess. How are you holding up? Me? I say. 
Fine. Totally fine. A white lie. Maria is getting over a near-death experience. I don't need to burden her with my own troubles. I assume one of the others told her I swallowed Davida's heart, and people at the triage center would likely have been talking about the rally. Rhea is a social butterfly. I'm sure that even injured, she made dozens of friends there and kept up with what's happening. I know about you and Hunter, she says. He visited me in the triage center and told me that you two are, you know, on a break. Hunter. He's kept his distance. I haven't seen him since the day of the explosion. Is that what he said? Well, he said you dumped him, but I told him you probably just need some time to think. Rhea sighs. Was I right? I'm not sure how to respond. A part of me still loves Hunter. But something about our breakup feels so final. Yet we have such a history together that it's hard to imagine my life without him. You figure it out, Rhea says when I don't answer. I know you will. Then she yawns. <gasps> this pillow feels mighty good. <laughs> Nothing at the triage center was comfortable, you know. My mattress was like a piece of paper. And the thing they call a pillow, she wrinkles her nose. It was like a block of wood. I can't help but laugh. Rhea could have died, but she's complaining about the hospital accommodations. Did you meet some nice people there? Nice. Rhea shrugs. I suppose. The other girls in my tent were gossipy. They'd all been injured in the explosion. Uh, nothing as serious as me, she says. One of them, a mystic, has a few cousins in Philadelphia. Anyway, she told me her cousins said the mystics in Philadelphia are getting restless and they have a plan. A big plan. Only she wouldn't say what it was, at least not to me. Rhea lies back on her pillow and sighs. I miss this room. It's nice, like a little slice of heaven. I glance around the space. There aren't many bedrooms in the hideout. One for boys on the floor above us, and this one, which Rhea and I share with Shannon. It's nothing fancy. Three small iron beds with faded linens, two beat-up wooden dressers, and a desk tucked away in the corner. But I understand what she means. The familiarity is comforting. I'll holler if I need anything, she says. Maybe tomorrow you can help me decorate my cane. I laugh as she closes her eyes. I'm serious. Got it. I'll hunt for some glitter first thing in the morning. Good night, Ray. We can use our mystic powers for that, silly. Good night, she says as I shut the bedroom door behind me. For a moment, I stand in the hallway, my back pressed against the wall. There's so many things I still don't know about life as a mystic. When will I have time to learn them all? Then I feel a vibration in my back pocket, accompanied by a faint buzzing sound. I touch me. Maybe we should go? I hear someone say downstairs. It's a male voice. Yarek. I take a step toward the staircase, and the floor creaks. I pause, but it doesn't seem like anyone heard me. I place my hand on the banister and listen. Go? I hear Shannon say. Her sharp nasal voice is immediately recognizable. Go where? Anywhere, says Yarek. Anywhere but here. You want to leave Manhattan? Shannon says. Is that your thing? Just running away whenever things get tough? It's dangerous here, Yarek says. Kyle is out of control, and that force field. I've been asking around, and Hunter's group is sure the roses are behind it. But the level of energy it's using... He doesn't finish his sentence, but I know what he's about to say. My brother, and in turn my father, is up to something dangerous with mystic energy. They have access to all the stored mystic energy used to run Manhattan, energy that has been saved up and stored in the light posts for decades. But that green patch, whatever it is, is surely using a massive amount. Since the mystics are now refusing to be drained, there can't be enough energy left in the light posts to keep Manhattan operating and do whatever it is my family is doing. They must be putting the entire city at risk, even Ares dwellers. So the question is, why? I pull out my touch me and glance down at the screen to find a message from a private number. I click it open. Don't believe everything you see. What does that mean? And who sent it? Hunter will take care of it, Shannon is saying downstairs. He understands what needs to be done. He'll stop Kyle before he uses this shield he's creating, if that's what it is. He uses it for what? 
Yarrick asks. For anything, Shannon says. Think about it. If Kyle has a way to block off part of the city, who knows what he'll do to the other parts? Gas us, bomb us, send out all his soldiers to attack. The possibilities are endless. I snap my head up. Is that possible? That it's some kind of force field and Kyle is planning to seal off part of Manhattan? Remembering the message, I quickly key, Who is this? into my touch me and press send. We don't know that Kyle is responsible. Yarrick says, What if it's someone else? Like who? Johnny Rose? Shannon says, It's possible. But Ari's father hasn't made a public appearance in a while. He might be letting Kyle run the show. I doubt it, I think. My father may be all right with Kyle's acting as the public face of the family, but there's no way he'd let my brother just take control. I just think someone else could be behind it all. Yarrick says, I don't, Shannon says roughly. It has to be the Rose family. And if they're able to block off the area somehow, there's no telling what they'll do. Those Rose men are insane, both of them. If you really believe that, then we should go, like I said, Yarrick says, raising his voice. Get out of here. Wrong, Shannon says. We need to stay and fight. Hunter and some of the other rebels are coming up with a plan. There are rumors that Manhattan is vulnerable. Vulnerable? Yarrick asks. You've seen the news, Shannon says. We look like idiots. The city is unstable. Now would be the perfect time to swoop in and invade. Those are just rumors, Yarrick says. Don't be so sure, Shannon says. A war is coming. And we have to be ready. As they continue talking, I back away, down the hall and into the bathroom. The conversation makes me wonder where Turk is, what he knows. My stomach is rumbling and I feel lightheaded. I splash some cold water on my face. I barely recognize the girl staring back at me. I have the same features I always have. Dark brown eyes, too big for my face. Long lashes and thin lips. A straight nose that I always wished curved up at the tip. And yet I'm so different. Stronger somehow. Like my features have toughened up since I inherited mystic powers. My once dewy skin is brown from the sun. And there's a fire in my eyes I've never noticed before. I turn off the faucet and dry my cheeks. I don't want to think about what will happen to the city if Shannon is right. Maybe if I turn myself in like Kyle wants, all this fighting will stop and the city will be prepared to defend itself if we are attacked. I check my touch me, but there's no response from whoever sent me that message. Don't believe everything you see. Is that about the force field or something else? Who could have sent it? And why? What is he or she trying to tell me? I brush my teeth, noticing that the tips of my fingers are still a pale green. I glance down at my chest, then lift up my shirt and stare. Just to the side of the silver heart locket I always wear is a green patch of skin right above my heart. The color is spreading outward in a burst of tiny green veins. I don't think this is normal, even for a mystic. There's a knock at the door. There's a knock on the door. Just a sec, I say. I let go of my shirt, smoothing it over my stomach. Another knock. Just a sec, I repeat, opening the door. Turk is standing outside. Hey, you, he says with a crooked grin. Hey, I answer. Spy much? What do you mean? You were listening in on Shannon and Yarrick, he says. You're not exactly a stealth operator. Plus, these creaky floorboards are the worst. He pauses. Don't worry, I won't say anything about you spying. The shadows in the hallway play off his face, making it almost impossible to tell what he's thinking. Thanks? I say. Although it sounds like you were spying on me to see if I was spying on Shannon and Yarrick. Turk raises an eyebrow and laughs. <laughs> How do you feel? He steps into the bathroom and into the light. I don't want to tell Turk about my headaches or how difficult it's been to fall asleep. I don't want to tell him that my mind is racing a mile a minute and parts of me are turning green. What if I do and he tells me none of this is normal? None of it is what it's like to be a mystic. I shake away the thought. I'm fine, I tell Turk. Great. You can't be great, Arya, Turk says. You ingested an entire mystic heart. That's more power than any human being is supposed to have. You need help. I said I'm fine. I don't believe you, he says harshly. 
stepping toward me so I can feel his breath on my neck, sweet and warm. What you did is dangerous. I understand why you did it, sort of, he adds. But we need to get that heart out of you. No, I say, thinking of Davida, her meeting with Hunter in the depths, her job to gather information on my family. The heart has given me powers and secrets I'm only starting to understand, and I need more time with it, more memories. It's not up to you, Turk says. I put word out in the mystic pipeline to summon a sister. If she's not already here, she should be in a few days. I don't know much about the Seven Sisters, but I do know how revered they are, how integral to the mystic people. I can't imagine that contacting one would be easy. I don't want to give back the heart, I say. I only just got my powers. Davida's powers, Turk says, correcting me. She wanted me to have them, I say. She was my friend, Turk, and I lost her. This is her legacy to me. He frowns. Her legacy is killing you. Look, I say, I appreciate your concern, but really, I'm fine. I attempt to move past him back into the hallway, but he doesn't let me. Instead, he steps farther into the bathroom and closes the door. What are you doing? I ask. Blocking you, he says. Even in the unflattering bathroom light, Turk makes an impression. The tattoos along his arms fit together like puzzle pieces, each one telling a different story. A mystic slaying a fire-breathing dragon, a dozen skulls with black eye sockets, ten roses linked together around his left bicep, an angel with her wings spread wide. See anything you like? Turk says softly. I catch his eyes. What's this one? I ask, pointing to a phrase etched along the inside of his wrist in a language I don't recognize. Ut amen et foveam, he says, is Latin. It means, so that I love and cherish. I got it after my parents died, to help me remember them. It's beautiful, I say. Turk leans in so that our faces are practically touching. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if something happened to you. Davida's heart could be killing you. I need to make sure you're safe. Can you understand that? I nod. Part of me feels relieved that Turk cares about me. Another part feels guilty that his feelings for me run so deep. I understand, I tell him. But I'm fine. I can handle the heart. You can't, he says. No one could. That doesn't make you weak, Arya. It makes you human. I repeat his words in my mind. But am I? Are you what? He asks. Am I human? I ask. After what I've done. Turk is silent for a moment. Then he says, Do you know the lore of the sisters? What does that have to do with... When the world was created, Turk says, it was all one giant piece of land. A huge mass of soil and rock and green... That was God's intention, for all of his children to live as one race, one community. But the people wouldn't do that. They fought so much that God split up the land into seven different pieces. Turk uses his hands as he talks, getting into the story, and created the oceans to keep the pieces away from each other, to protect his children from themselves. But he didn't trust them, not entirely. He chose seven women, one from each piece of land, and gave them incredible powers to breathe underwater, to fly, to bend the wind to their will. Those women would watch over the lands they were given and keep the peace. They were the first mystics. So those are the sisters? I ask Turk. He purses his lips. Were the sisters. Over the centuries, they've been burned at the stake as witches, persecuted in wars. People didn't know who they were exactly, only that they were dangerous and powerful. So the sisters aren't invincible? Sadly, no, Turk says. They're more powerful than most, way more powerful. But at the end of the day, they're mortal. There's only one still alive, and no one has seen her in centuries. So even if you wanted me to see her, I say, it would be impossible. Not impossible, Turk says with a flicker of hope in his voice. Just difficult. But I'm doing all I can to make sure the sister arrives here in Manhattan, to save your life. I need time, Turk. Now that I have mystic powers, I can help with more than just my words. If I learn how to control my energy, it's not the time to give in, I say. I need this. 
Turk moves even closer, so that our noses are pressing together. He flicks off the bathroom light, and we're bathed in black, so I can't see him anymore. I can give you a few days, he tells me, but more than that is too great a risk. That's not a lot of time, I say. No, he says. It's not, but it's enough. Just promise me one thing, Aria. What's that? I feel the weight of Turk's hand on my waist. He pulls me to him. But when the sister gets here, you'll be ready. I almost don't go to sleep after that. The story of the sisters runs through my mind, and I keep thinking of how close Turk and I got, and how he almost kissed me, how he could have kissed me, and I would have let him. Why didn't he kiss me? True, I, I put him off once, before I broke up with Hunter, but we both know there's something between us. I can feel it. Electricity. Like if I touched him, it would start a fire. I hate myself for being attracted to him, and I hate that he's Hunter's best friend. If anything ever happened between us, I'm sure it would destroy Hunter. And then, somewhere inside me, a little voice speaks up and says that it wouldn't destroy Hunter, that he would be just fine. And that upsets me most of all. I broke up with Hunter, and I haven't seen him since, which I can only assume means he's still upset with me. It's not fair of me to want him to remain single, but I can't imagine him with anyone else. So where does that leave me? This is what I think about until the sunlight filters into the room and wakes my roommates up. Then Shannon and I help Rhea out of bed and downstairs to the dining room for breakfast. Breakfast of champions, Yarrick says as he finishes the last of his coffee. If he and Shannon know I was listening in on their conversation last night, they haven't let on. Champions at least put milk in their coffee, Rhea says, unbelievably chipper for someone just waking up. She still looks injured, her skin raw and pink, but perhaps a little stronger than she was yesterday. And they might have a muffin, just saying. Good point, Turk says and turns to me. So, are you ready? For a muffin? Sure. He laughs. Nope. For your first training session. I glance around the table. Yarrick looks excited, and Shannon looks annoyed, as usual. Training for what? I ask. You said you wanted to use your mystic powers, Turk says. So you need to learn how to use them without hurting anyone. I have to go check on a few things, but the others will give you some pointers. Right, guys? Turk's statement makes me realize there are no secrets at the table. Everyone, including Rhea, knows what powers I possess. Even if they didn't know Davida personally, they surely knew the extent of her powers, which were extraordinary. Is everyone okay with that? I ask. No one says anything at first. Then Rhea reaches across the table and squeezes my hand. Of course we are. Yarrick pats me on the back. Ditto. It must be hard for him to help me harness Davida's powers. After all, he wanted them for himself. Shannon is the only one who hasn't said anything yet, which doesn't surprise me. I don't know if there's anything I can do to make her like me. Arya? Yarrick starts to say. There's something I want to tell... Turk clears his throat, and Yarrick stops. Whatever he wanted to say, not important enough for him to continue. Shannon? Anything you'd like to add? Shannon rubs her temples as if she's warding off a migraine. Then she says, I have an extra training suit. You'll probably fit into it, Aria. Just don't have any more muffins. The training room is a long rectangular space in the basement with padded floors and fluorescent lights. One wall is made entirely of mirrors. Mystic power is dangerous, Shannon says as she trots to the far corner and then pivots to face me. You have to be very careful. It's strong, our energy, and if you don't control it, you can do a lot of damage in a short time. Shannon's long red hair is tied back in a ponytail, and she's wearing navy leggings and a long-sleeved shirt woven with mystic thread. I'm wearing a similar outfit in pigeon gray. Next to me, Yarrick is wearing a skin-tight shirt and white spandex shorts that leave nothing to the imagination. In his right hand is something like a shield, made of what looks like rubber, and in his left hand, he's holding a drinking glass. Rhea's upstairs resting, and Turk is, well, it wasn't exactly forthcoming about where he was going. I can only assume he's trying to locate the sister he reached out to. So, Shannon says, the first thing you need to learn is how to activate your energy. I stare down at my fingertips. 
which is still a faint green. How many times have I seen the powerful rays of green energy shoot out of Hunter's or Turk's fingers? Seen Rhea or Shannon blasting mystic energy into the air like deadly lasers? Now my fingers hold the same possibilities. The prospect is both frightening and exhilarating. This isn't like what we practiced back at the compound, Shannon says, speaking of our time at the farmhouse, when Hunter left her in charge of training me, and she worked me like a drill sergeant. It's not about force. It's about control. With that, she extends one arm toward the center of the room, palm out, and straightens her fingers. Her eyes narrow as she stares at her own hand. The color starts in the center of her palm, then blossoms outward, a bright jade green. Delicate rays of energy as thin as silk jet from the tips of her fingers into the air, stretching toward the ceiling for about a foot, and then stopping in midair. The energy brightens, deepening in color and pulsing with a tiny hum that fills the training room. Then the rays begin to swirl together, crossing over one another and weaving together like threads on a loom. The rays thicken and coagulate into a ball that spins like the earth on its axis, growing until it's the size of a baseball. Now watch, Shannon instructs, moving her hand in a small circle. The ball begins to spin, and the energy crackles like thunder. She tosses back her head and calls out, Yarrick, catch! She winds her arm back like a pitcher, and the ball whips toward Yarrick as if on an invisible string. He holds up the rubber shield, and the ball smacks into it. I'm not sure what I expected. Maybe for it to explode into a thousand sparks, or just disappear. But it does neither of those things. Instead, the ball hits the shield's center and sticks, as if the shield were coated in glue. Then the sphere flattens out, dripping like honey from a squeeze bottle, until the shield is shiny with green energy so bright I have to close my eyes. I hear something that sounds like a zap, and when I open my eyes, Shannon is standing with her arms outstretched. Yarrick's shield is back to normal, and Shannon and Yarrick are looking at me. What just happened? I ask. That, Shannon says, was your first lesson, and now you're going to repeat it. How? I ask. Good question, she says. I don't expect you to be as quick or talented or good as me at transforming and transferring mystic energy. At this, Yarrick snorts. But let's see you try to make a ball, okay? I look to Yarrick for help, but he merely shrugs. Okay, I say. First things first, Shannon says. Mystic energy is now lurking inside your blood, waiting for you to tell it what to do. Hold out your hand. I stretch out my fingers. The tips seem greener than they were yesterday. Each of your fingers is an energy access point. You can activate just one. She extends her pointer finger and lets loose a blast of energy, which smacks the wall across from her and disappears with a sizzle. Or more than one. Shannon shakes out her hand, then holds it up, facing me. One by one, her fingers put forth a tiny green flame of energy, like the mystic variation of lighting birthday candles. The flames flicker and grow, lengthening and bleeding together into one mystic ray as thick as her wrist. I watch intently as Shannon steadies the ray, then swiftly brings her arm down. There's a whizzing sound and a duck. Shannon laughs. Oh, come on, Arya, she says. I'm not going to hurt you. Not badly, anyway. Yarrick says with a smirk. Now you try, Shannon says, ignoring him. Just one finger. Again, I stretch my hands into the air, hoping no one will notice the green tips of my fingers. I choose my index finger and focus my mind on making something, anything happen. I wiggle it a little, and before I can blink, my hand is burning, as if I stuck it right into a fire, except that I feel no pain. Then a ray of green energy flies out of my fingertip and into the ceiling, bursting one of the light bulbs. Shannon frowns. What were you just thinking? She asks me. Thinking? Uh, I was thinking I want something to happen. Energy, come forth. Energy, come forth? Yarrick repeats, and I can hear the sarcasm in his voice. This isn't a movie, Aria. I sigh. I'm trying, okay? It's fine. Shannon says calmly, seeming to enjoy my frustration. It's fine. Just don't think. That should come easily to you. Hey, 
What I mean, she says, forcing a smile, is just focus. Focus on your one finger, okay? Nothing else. Not me, not Yarek, not this room. Just one finger. Go. I inhale and stare at my finger, at the nail I anxiously bit last night, at the fingerprint whorls that have turned to faint grass green. Take it slow, I think, and I feel heat in my palm, as if I pressed my hand on sun-baked pavement. The burn eases into a tingling sensation that creeps up my finger and explodes out the tip into a tiny, focused ray of energy as bright as Shannon's, maybe even brighter. I glance at Shannon. Now, she says, grow it. Grow, I think, and watch as the ray of energy begins to swirl, shooting into the air like a sword. Slowly, I sweep my arm a little higher toward the ceiling, and the ray moves with me, an extension of my arm. I move it the other way, and it follows. Now, see if you can reach Yarek, Shannon orders. Across the room, Yarek holds up the rubber shield, blocking his face. I plant my eyes on him and will my energy toward the shield. There's a buzz in the air that sounds like a nest of hornets, and the ray of energy shoots out, smacking the center of the shield. For a second, a blast of green light fills the room. Then it disappears, and I'm left holding out my hand. Yarek lowers the shield, and Shannon stands next to him. They're both smiling. Good, Shannon says. Now let's try making a ball. By the end of our session, I'm dizzy with pride and exhaustion. I wasn't able to form a sphere, but I was able to create rays with each of my fingertips, which Shannon told me was quite an accomplishment for my first session. It was a surprising compliment coming from her. You're a quick study, Arya, Yarek says, tossing me a bottle of water. I wipe the sweat from my forehead and gulp down the water, realizing how thirsty I am. I glance at the clock and see that the entire morning has flown by. Keep this up, Shannon says between sips from her own water bottle, and you'll be a fighter in no time. Thanks, I say, feeling refreshed but weak. My head is pounding, and despite all the water I just drank, my mouth feels dry like I swallowed a piece of paper. I head upstairs. Yarrick and Shannon follow me. Arya, Yarrick starts. I wanted to... Just then, I hear footsteps rushing toward us from the front door. Turk. He pops his head into the living area and locks eyes with me. How'd it go? Good, Shannon answers for me. She still has a lot to learn. It went great, Yarrick chimes in. You should have seen... I'm glad, says Turk. I just got back from downtown. Were you with Hunter? Shannon asks. Turk doesn't respond. There's going to be a peace rally in the depths this afternoon, and I think we should all go. Especially you, Arya, he says to me. I'm not sure I can even walk, let alone place myself in a high-energy situation. I might need a rest, I say. Rest when you're dead, Turk says, his eyes wide and excited. This rally is a chance for you to reassure the people that we had nothing to do with the explosion. That we're still on their side. You want me to make a speech? I say. But I haven't prepared anything. Shannon gives my shoulder a tiny punch. Wing it, Rose. She sniffs the air around me. But first, take a shower. Chapter 4 It has started to rain. Plump droplets cascade off my helmet and soak my skin in a symphony of pitter-patters. At first, the water was a nice relief from the overwhelming heat, but now I wish I'd brought a change of clothes. The last time I rode with Turk, I was in the sidecar, my knees pressed into my chest. I had opened Davida's mystic reliquary, a small wooden box with a handwritten note to me inside. Don't consign my heart to a box. By now, you know what to do with it. Turk had been distracted, watching Yarrick, as I opened the second box, the one that contained Davida's heart her life essence, which is now inside me. Hold on, Turk says. This is a sharp one. He makes a sharp right, and the motorcycle tips so it's nearly parallel to the street. Are you sure you can see? I ask Turk over the roar of the oversized engine. His hands are firmly on the handlebars, his arms pressed against my sides. His thighs squeeze me tightly, making sure I don't fall off into one of the canals. Of course, Turk says shifting his weight to the left. 
A little rain never hurt anyone. This is nothing. I could drive through a blizzard and see just fine. Not that we have any blizzards in the city, but, you know. You're very confident, I say. What? He yells, accelerating past a group of Rose family soldiers positioned on the banks of the Hudson River on Manhattan's west side. Nothing, I say, focused on the soldiers as we fly down Riverside Canal. We only left the Mystic Hideout a few moments ago, but thanks to the speed of Turk's bike and his semi-reckless driving, we're making record time. The rally is being held in the depths, on the steps of what was once the Metropolitan Museum of Art, east of the Magnificent Block. Rhea is staying back at the hideout, but Shannon and Yarrick are meeting us there, stopping to pick up a few other rebels along the way. My heart, or Davidus, seems to beat in time with the motorcycle's engine as we pass block after depressing block. The depths have always been dark and bleak, the airy skyscrapers casting long shadows over the canals, but something has changed. The stench has worsened, that's for sure, thanks in no small part to the rain. Why do we need to travel on a bike when I can fly? I asked Turk over the roar of the engine. Isn't that one of the perks of being a mystic? I can feel his chest vibrate as he laughs. First of all, not all mystics can fly. I can, I say. True, Turk says. But we don't need you expending too much energy and getting sick or accidentally blowing anything up, right? I don't respond, noticing instead what seems to be a never-ending line of Rose family soldiers along the western border of the city. No matter how far south we travel, I see them. And their weapons. Kyle can say they're protecting the city, blocking enemies at the borders, but I know they're really keeping people from getting out. I tilt my head back and see the emerald sheen that has begun to spread across the sky. It's brightest in the center, then drips down around the edges, turning the blue-gray tinged sky into something deadly, unknown. I notice people in the streets staring up and pointing. And then I realize what's so different about the depths from the last time I was here, before the explosion, when people came together and shouted my name, crying for peace. There was hope in the air then. The words change and equality were on the tips of everyone's tongues. But now, instead, there is fear. Fear that no one can save them, that their lives are only going to get worse. Fear permeates the air and billows down the streets. It clings to the broken windows and the crumbling facades. It locks people inside and lowers their voices to a whisper. Something is about to happen, and nobody knows what. Don't be nervous, Turk says to me. We're standing outside the doors of the museum, in front of the three large pillars that mark the entrance. Years ago, there were four, but one crumbled to dust and was never replaced. The white stone of the building is caked with grime, and the corners are capped in Damascus steel, the mystic-coated metal that supports the Ares. Above the museum, a slick glass office skyscraper looms, connected far overhead by bridges to the east side of the Ares, in what was traditionally foster territory, but has now been absorbed by my family. The juxtaposition of the modern building and the classical museum is like a microcosm of the entire city of Manhattan, old and new, mystics and humans, fosters and roses. In front of me, the museum steps have been blocked off with orange cones and caution tape and plexiglass barriers. Rebel mystics are stationed about a foot apart, just like the rose soldiers along the river. Beyond the steps stand hundreds of people from the depths. I can make out a few large signs that read, Peace for All and Mystics Unite. I immediately get nervous. I glance at Turk. What do I say? That the people of Manhattan, humans and mystics alike, should not be afraid, Turk says confidently, that we will protect them from your family. You will protect them. You are the depth's greatest weapon, because you are a rose, but now you are also one of us. He glances around. You know, there's enough space marked off between you and the citizens that if you wanted to show a flash of power, you could. I look at him. Flash of power? You know, he says. People like a show. He smiles at me and tickles the fuzz on my head. Get it? I can't help laughing. No, I don't actually. I mean, Turk says that in times of trouble, people want someone to believe in. A hero. The humans who live here used to be scared of mystics. 
but they're finally coming around. And we're the closest thing to superheroes the city has. He continues to speak, but I'm suddenly distracted because, off in the distance, I see Hunter. Hunter. He betrayed me, but he also loved me more than anyone in my entire life has ever loved me. And I let him go. Like the rest of the rebels, he's in uniform. Snug gray pants with metallic trim up the sides, a skin-tight bulletproof shirt with fine threads of Damascus steel woven into the fabric. I can't see his blue eyes from here, but his blonde hair seems even blonder in the sun. It's the first time I've seen him since we broke up, since I flew into the sky and never looked back at him, since the explosion. Arya, are you okay? I turn to Turk, whose eyes are full of concern. We're ready for you, Arya. Before I can answer Turk, a girl rushes up to me, grabs my arm, and leads me toward the podium. I look over my shoulder at Turk, who gives me a thumbs up. You can do this, he mouths. And before I know it, I am standing behind the metal podium. Hello, I say into the microphone, staring out at the sea of people. Some of them are still, watching me with interest, while others look nervous and jittery, perhaps wondering if I'm about to blow them all up. Shannon's right. They don't know what to think of me. Some of them might even think I caused the Empire State Building explosion. I take a deep breath. I'm here this afternoon to speak to you all and defend myself against my brother's accusations. Let me start by saying, Aria! A million people seem to call out at once, bright white lights flashing in my face, making me squint. How did you get mystic powers? Someone asks. I hesitate before answering. Swallowing Davida's heart went against mystic tradition, even if it was what she wanted. The answer to that is complicated, I say. But I was granted powers by a dear friend of mine, a mystic who saved my life. And I plan to use those powers to help Manhattan fight back against my brother Kyle. I have not changed. I am still Arya Rose, and I am still here to help all of you. Are you responsible for the explosion of the Empire State Building? Of course not, I reply. I grieve alongside all of you for the lives that were lost. Your brother says you were, the speaker continues. How do you respond to his claims? The pain in my head intensifies, and my knees begin to feel weak. I grab the podium for support. Anyone who knows me knows that I am a peaceful person, I say. I left the Ares because I do not believe in the violence that my family condones. I was at the Empire State Building that day to beg for peace between the Ares and the Depths. I was unsuccessful, and many lives were lost. But I still believe that we can unite Manhattan. We must not give in to my brother's threats. We must join together and fight for what we believe in. A man steps forward. Kyle says that if we turn you over to him, he'll stop whatever he's doing. The man points to the sky, where the green patch has grown larger. It's no longer small and blurried and round. It has angry tendrils that seem to be reaching out, spreading downward against the grayish-blue clouds. What is he doing? We're not safe here. Because of you. There's venom in the man's voice, and I see dozens of faces turned toward the sky, they want someone to blame, I tell myself. They're not really angry at you, but it feels like they are. Out of the corner of my eye, I see some of the mystic rebels shift their stances, as if preparing for the crowd to turn on me. It's, it's suddenly hard to breathe. Why are those soldiers stationed around the city? A woman asks. What are they doing? I want to know the same thing. We're looking into it, I say. Look harder! the woman says, and I hear murmurs of agreement. The air around me is hot, oppressive. I wipe the sweat from my forehead. Why won't you turn yourself into your family? I blink. Well, if you really wanted to help us, you'd go to your brother and stop this. Where can we go to be safe? Are we going to be attacked? What's happening? The questions become a barrage overlapping and bleeding into each other until I don't know where to look, what to say. Help us! Do something! Do something! 
Stop. There is silence. I realize my eyes are closed, and I open them to see Hunter standing next to me at the podium. Arya is not to blame for the city's problems, he says to the crowd. They know him, I realize. Not like they know me, some rich girl from the Ares. Hunter is a mystic rebel from birth, the son and grandson of rebels, Violet Brooks's son. Arya is on our side, he goes on. We will protect you from whatever Kyle Rose and his family have planned. They were behind the Empire State Building explosion, no matter what Kyle says. And he will do whatever it takes to go on living his privileged lifestyle. If it were up to him and Johnny and Melinda Rose, Hunter says, sweeping his arms out, all of us would be dead. Do not panic, he says directly into the microphone, his words bouncing off the buildings and the water in the canals. We will protect you. He grabs my hand in his and raises them over our heads. I shiver at his touch. That's all for now. More questions are thrown at us, but Hunter ignores them and turns to me. It's like staring at the most familiar picture I know. The deep-set blue eyes, the perfect lips, the crooked yet handsome nose. The strength and comfort of his features make me feel, for the first time in days, that I can relax and be myself. You don't look so great, he says to me. Not exactly the first words you want to hear from your ex-boyfriend. Thanks, I say. Not that, he says. You're burning up. You look like you have a fever. It's true that I'm burning up, overwhelmed by my feelings for Hunter. I want to tell him that I'm sorry for leaving him, that I made the wrong decision, that I miss him, that I don't know what to do about my brother or my parents or the city, that I want him back in my life as a friend or maybe... Arya. Hunter touches my forehead and his finger feels like a poker that has been sitting in the fire. My skin burns, and my brain feels like it's about to explode. You're... For a second, I see Hunter's lips turned down in a frown, and then I see nothing at all. Tell us, Davida. My mother looks at me with her wide-set eyes, her face concerned. What news do you have? I am with my parents at a dinner table, in a tiny ramshackle apartment in the tenements of the magnificent block, where all the registered mystics are forced to live. From the outside, it might appear to be a nice family scene, mother, father, and daughter breaking bread together. Only this isn't my parents' apartment, and all they really want is information. Yes, dear, my father says, smoothing his mustache. You must have something. Even though my parents live underground and retain their powers, they make their way into the block all the time. It's how they get their gossip. They scrape a living together, selling and trading secrets. Sometimes, when they discover that an apartment is vacant, they stay for a few days, listening in, seeing people, gathering information. I look around at the bare-bones space we're in now. Hardly more than a roof and four walls, just a tiny kitchenette with a dripping faucet, a small round table, and a deflated-looking mattress on the floor. A mystic named Rosa used to live here, an older woman with no remaining family. She died from the drainings two days ago. The city has yet to move anyone else in here. I take a sip of my soup, which is no more than water, salt, and a few turnips my mother must have picked up at the market. It pales in comparison to the food the Roses eat, to the food I eat when I am in the Aries. Just this morning I had an omelette with fresh peppers and mushrooms and toast with blueberry jam. I wonder if my parents have had jam once since the conflagration. There's not much to tell, I say, averting my eyes so they won't know I'm lying. I don't like keeping secrets from my parents, especially since the reason I'm in the Aries at all is to spy on the roses. I don't mind spying on Johnny and Melinda. Really, I don't. They're awful and cruel. But I do hate spying on Aria, lying to her. She's my friend. You are there, living with those mongrels, my father says, so that we can gain access to their information. His voice is shaking, and I see rage in his eyes. Is he any better than Johnny Rose? Perhaps just barely. They have wiped Arya's memories, I say, her memories of Hunter and how they met. 
They told her she overdosed on stick, and that's why she's forgotten her relationship with Thomas. They have paid me for my silence. As soon as the words are out of my mouth, I feel guilty. This is something my parents know they can use. Good, my mother says. But we need more. More, I say. What more do you need? Proof, my father says, his eyes glinting. I know I should be happy to provide them with this information, but I feel like a traitor. If we have proof, he continues, we can sell it, make a profit, get people to pay attention to us. I will tell the others. No, I say emphatically. My father looks at me like I've just slapped him. No, he says. Davida, since when does a daughter run the household before a father? I don't want Arya to find out, I say. She'll be heartbroken. Johnny and Melinda Rose may be evil, but they're still her parents. If Arya learns what they've done to her, she'll never forgive them. I don't want to be responsible for spilling that secret. I don't want her to hate me forever, too. Davida, my father says. His voice is soft now, and he places a hand on my shoulder. I know you're friends with Arya, and I will do my best to protect her. But information like this is worth a lot of money. We can sell it to the highest bidders in the Aries, can create a stir that the Roses and Fosters can't cover up. We can help Violet Brooks win the next election. Don't you want to help us? I swallow. Of course I do. Then trust me. He kisses my forehead. My mother looks on with approval. Go back to the Aries and get us proof. And whatever you do, don't let them discover who you really are. I walk back slowly from the apartment. Most everyone is asleep, as they should be. It's nearly 4 a.m. The city of Manhattan never sleeps, not exactly, but it's calmer than usual. In the distance, I can see the light posts, the tall glass spires full of the pulsing green mystic energy that fuels the city. Energy that is forcibly drained from my people. Most of it isn't even used for the right reasons. It's sold illegally on the black market, turned into stick. Drugs that pretty rich kids like Kyle Rose use for entertainment. My father is right. I know he is. I am doing the right thing. That's why I've stayed with the Roses for so long. I just wish things weren't so complicated. The bridge over the canal creaks beneath my feet. I feel torn between the magnificent block and the Aries, between my parents and my friendship with Arya. And I feel guilty, because the truth is... When Arya's memories of Hunter were erased, I was happy. It gave me a glimmer of hope that she would actually marry Thomas Foster, so that Hunter could be mine. Hunter Brooks, the little boy with the sweet blue eyes who used to play with me in the abandoned subway tunnels, who picked wildflowers on the great lawn and gave them to me on my birthday, who gave me my first kiss on a gondola when I was 13 years old, the son of my parents' friend Violet, betrothed to me before I was even born. Then, just a few short months ago, he fell in love with Arya. I had to watch the boy I love give his heart away to another girl, a girl I served, whose family I spy on, in order to serve my own family, my own people. How did my life get so messed up? As I approach the gates of the block, my cheeks feel wet, and I realize I'm crying. Arya has been a friend to me, the best friend I've ever had, actually. And here I am, wishing that the boy she loves, who loves her back, could be mine. Finding happiness in the fact that her parents robbed her of her memories. How selfish can I possibly be? I take off one of my gloves and wipe my eyes. I hear a crackle, a twig, a branch. I don't know. But someone is behind me. I whip around and see nothing. And then a figure emerges from the darkness, a boy in a navy blue sweatshirt. The hood covers his face, but I can see his eyes. Hunter, I say. Are you following me? Maybe. He steps forward, and a bit of light from one of the street lamps falls onto his face. I can make out the light stubble on his cheeks and his deep blue irises. He looks beautiful and tired. Are you okay? I ask him. He shakes his head. Not really. She doesn't remember me at all. I hold up my arms, and he steps into them. It's all right, I tell him. We'll get through this together. I just love her so much, he says quietly into my shoulder. 
I hold him more tightly, thinking that I know all too well what it feels like to lose someone you love. Chapter 5 I open my eyes and stare up at... Turk? Aria, Turk says to me, shaking me gently. I blink and look around. I'm in an old-looking diner slumped in a booth. Where is Hunter? Where am I? You passed out, Turk says. Thank the sister you're all right. Across the table, Shannon is reworking her long red hair into a ponytail. Instinctively, my hands go to my own head. Nope, Shannon says, watching me. You're still bald. Shannon, Turk says, scolding. Leave her alone. He turns to me. The rally got out of control. He says, people were attacking you. Hunter stepped in, but I think it was all too much for you. We're only a few blocks away. I look around. Except for a waitress and us, the diner is empty. Through a dirty window, I can see Yarrick's tall figure standing guard outside, together with a few mystic soldiers. How'd I get here? I ask, rubbing my temples. My head no longer feels like a pounding jackhammer, more like a long, slow ache. My entire body hurts, even my skin. I am exhausted. Turk flexes his biceps. You carried me? I ask. Shannon snorts. More like four soldiers carried you and Turk sort of directed them. Thank you, Shannon, Turk says. But seriously, Arya, you need to eat. Get your strength up. He calls the waitress over and orders me something. All I can think about is the memory of Davida. Not long before she died, she told me the truth about who she was. But we never really got to talk after that, about our families, about growing up in the same household. I realize now how similar Davida's parents were to mine. And we were both in love with the same boy. The kind of love that eats you up and destroys you from the inside. She and I were more alike than I ever knew. And now she's gone. And Hunter is... I can't stay, Turk says, tugging at his collar and motioning to the door. You're leaving? Shannon says, sounding distressed. Why? Turk raises his studded eyebrow. You gonna miss me? Yeah, Shannon says dryly, taking a sip of soda. It'll kill me. Gee, Shannon, Turk says with a smile. That would be a real shame. If you died, you know. Go away, Shannon says, flicking her wrist at him. We'll be fine here. Right, Arya? I nod. Where are you going? I ask him. There's something I have to check on, Turk says. But after you eat, you need to get back to the hideout and rest up. I'll tell Yarrick you'll be a few more minutes. He turns to Shannon. Can you make sure Arya gets back uptown? Sure, Shannon says. What's better than being a chaperone? Being a beautiful chaperone, Turk says, giving Shannon a friendly peck on the cheek. Any trouble, you know how to reach me. He pats his back pocket, where his touch me is. See you guys back at the hideout. Then he leans in, almost like he's going to kiss me. At the last second, he yanks himself back, lets out a little huff, and rushes out of the diner. Boys, Shannon says. Yeah, I reply. Boys. The waitress sets down our food, which actually looks pretty good. Shannon has a salad full of cheese, meat, and fruit, and Turk seems to have ordered me a burger with lettuce and tomato and sweet potato fries. So, I say, taking a bite of my burger. So, Shannon says, taking a bite of her salad. Are we okay? I ask. I mean, I know we were never best friends, but I thought there was a moment after Rhea got hurt when we sort of, I don't know, connected? Shannon stares at me like I'm speaking a language she doesn't understand. Look, Aria, I think you're fine. Fine? Yeah. Yes, she says. Fine. I'm not the kind of girl who sits in your bedroom and braids your non-existent hair and talks about boys with you. That's not me. I'm not asking you to be someone you're not, I tell her. I just don't want to walk around thinking you hate me. There are too many other more important things going on. Fair? Shannon takes another bite of her salad and chews. Fair, she says finally. So we're friends. The words sound strange coming out of my mouth. Her eyes shift and her mouth opens as if she's about to tell me something. Instead, she reaches over and steals a fry off my plate. Friends.
Outside the diner, I tell Shannon and Yarrick that I'm not ready to return to the mystic hideout. It's one of those afternoons where the sun is hiding behind the clouds, but it's so scorching hot that you can feel it there, beating down on you. I wish I had sunscreen. I've never spent much time on the east side of Manhattan, only to visit Thomas a handful of times. It doesn't feel much different from the west side, perhaps slightly cleaner, with taller apartment buildings and fewer brownstones. At least on Madison Canal, which is where I'm standing. The rebel mystics who were waiting on the street with Yarrick have dispersed, leaving the three of us outside the diner. Right next to us is a bodega that sells canned goods, as well as milk and eggs and some tired-looking vegetables. On the other side of the walkway, the canal is completely still, with not a gondolier in sight. It feels so deserted, I say, glancing up. An empty clothesline flaps between two brick buildings just ahead. People are scared. Some of them only leave their apartments to get food, Yarrick says softly. Or to leave the city altogether. Leave? Leave Manhattan? He nods. Not everyone, but some people are going. Come on, Shannon says, touching my shoulder. Let's go back to the hideout. I look down the street at the empty soda cans and plastic containers that cover the pavement and float aimlessly in the canal. Farther ahead, toward Fifth Avenue, I can hear people. I want some time to myself, I realize, to think. I'll meet you guys there, I say. Shannon crosses her arms and looks at me like I'm a child. Seriously? You think I'm just going to let you wander around the depths after you've fainted? I'm fine, I say, trying to sound energetic. Really? Yarrick looks at Shannon. I don't think so, Aria, he says to me. No offense. The last time I let you escape, it didn't end well. For either of us. He's talking about when Hunter blocked the exits of the Mystic Hideout, for your own good, and Yarrick helped me escape through the basement. I used a loophole to get out and find Davida's heart, but we were captured by my brother and nearly killed. I just want to think. Really? I say. I don't have plans to go anywhere. You can wait here if you want, and I'll circle around. I need some time alone. What I don't say is that it's Davida I need to think about. Are her memories coming to me randomly, or did she leave specific ones to me on purpose? It sounds crazy, but after all, she did plan for me to swallow her heart if she died. She left that message in the reliquary for me. Davida knew me better than I knew myself. Who is to say she didn't plan what would happen after I ate her heart? Yarrick stares at me like he's not going to give in. I give Shannon a pleading look. Friends? I say. I promise I'll be safe. She sighs and uncrosses her arms. We're heading back uptown. If you're not back at the hideout in an hour, we're going to come looking for you. We'll bring rebel soldiers, and it won't be pretty. Deal, I say. Here. Shannon is wearing a lightweight jacket over her shirt. She unzips it and hands it to me. There's a hood. Use it and keep your head down, okay? I put the jacket on. Despite the heat, the mystic-infused material doesn't add much in terms of weight. And Shannon's right. The hood is a good disguise. I flip it over my head and watch them go. Yarrick looks confused, unsure why Shannon is pulling him away. What? I hear Shannon say. It's her life. I don't listen for Yarrick's reply. I turn and walk toward Fifth Avenue. I'm alone. Sort of. The depths, even when mostly deserted, are way more full of life than the Aries. As I walk, I can hear the voices of people inside their apartments, perhaps making dinner or playing with their children or, if Yarrick is right, packing up and preparing to go somewhere else. Another city? The only way out of the depths is by boat. Either the public ones, which pack people in like sardines and are regulated by the government, or private gondolas, which aren't cheap. My family controls all public transportation. Even if anyone could afford to pay a gondolier to get out of Manhattan, soldiers from the Aries seem to have the island surrounded. I doubt they're going to let people come and go from the depths as they please, especially if Kyle is looking for me. I bet he's got soldiers checking each cargo ship to make sure I'm not a stowaway. I would, if I were him. But I'm not leaving. I'm staying. To fight. And to win. As I turn onto Fifth Avenue, the widest canal on the east side, I see chaos. Mothers and children in dirty rags are rushing over bridges. 
Men are hollering at gondoliers, haggling over prices. One man has a bundle of possessions in a sheet tied to a long stick, which rests on his shoulder and bounces as he hustles down the street. A vendor is selling dried meat and cups of water from a cart. Dozens of people crowded around her. Some heads turn my way as I walk. I've been in the news enough that it's hard to remain unknown at this point. But most people, mystics and humans alike, seem focused on their own business. Survival. I head downtown, following the canal to 59th Street, where I can cross over to the west side without having to go inside the magnificent block. In the distance is the circle, the enclosed dome in the Aries full of shops and restaurants. Kiki, Benny, and I used to eat and shop there, talking about how stressed out we were, about studying for exams at school, or some obnoxious thing one of the east side girls said about us. Little did I know what stress really is. I wander the streets for about half an hour before finding myself standing outside Java River. I'm not sure why I came here exactly, but when I look up at the faded sign outside the cafe, all I can think about is Hunter. I can vividly remember the night he saved me, after I'd snuck out of my apartment to visit Thomas Foster. Thomas and I had just had our engagement party, even though I had no memory of ever having met, let alone fallen in love with him. Later, of course, I realized that was because I'd never had fallen in love with Thomas. It was a scheme my parents had cooked up. I'd wanted to see Thomas alone, to convince myself that we really were a couple. As I stole along the unfamiliar streets that night, I'd been attacked. Me, the daughter of Johnny Rose, symbol of unattainable wealth and privilege. I might have been killed if Hunter hadn't been following me. He fought off my attackers and took me here, to Java River, where we drank coffee and talked, and I began to fall in love with him all over again, even though at the time I thought I'd never seen him before. Hunter was kind to me today. He didn't have to defend me at the rally, especially not after I broke up with him. Did I make the wrong decision? Is it a sign that I came here? Then again, I don't know that many places in the depths. I probably just walked here because I've been here before, because I know where it is. But then I peer through the window, and my heart nearly stops. Hunter is inside, drinking coffee. Alone. I edge away so he can't see me, turning down the alley where I met Tabitha, the mystic who told me about the code and the strange pulsing of the mystic light posts. Follow the lights, she'd said. Now I'm back here, and so is Hunter. Surely that's not just a coincidence. I could leave now and head back to the hideout. Hunter didn't see me. He'd never know I was here. But when is the next time I'll see him alone? If I go inside, though, will he want to talk to me? The last time he bared his soul to me, I rejected him. I told him we needed time apart, and I still believe that's true. Consumed by revenge for his mother's death, Hunter kept me in the dark. But maybe I was too rash, too unkind. I stare down at my green-tinged fingers, and then it hits me. I have Davida's powers. She was a powerful mystic, able to take on the glamour of another person, to look and sound like someone else. I could do that now, with Hunter. Pretend I'm someone he knows and go inside. It's not the most honorable thing in the world, sure, but I could ask him what he thinks about me, and he would answer honestly. If I do it, who should I be? Yarrick? Nobody truly trusts him, and Rhea is still too weak to be out on her own. I could always become Turk, but that idea is too weird for me to handle. Then I realize, Shannon, it's perfect. She and Hunter are friends. She travels alone all the time. Plus, I'm already wearing her hoodie. Okay, I tell myself. How do I do this? Davida didn't exactly leave instructions. I close my eyes and picture Shannon at the diner today. Her red hair tucked behind her ears, her dark, piercing eyes, the way her silver uniform set off the creamy color of her skin. I hear her voice in my head. Friends. And then I begin to feel something. It's almost like a whirring that starts in my toes, like I'm being pricked with a thousand tiny needles. The blood rushes to the surface of my skin. A warmth blossoms in the center of my belly and spreads outward. I can feel my bones lengthen and shift and move, my features reshaping themselves as if my body were made of clay. I'm short of breath. My scalp buzzes, and I feel hair growing and falling down my back. 
The bones in my fingers crack and lengthen. My skin pinches. And then, as quickly as the change started, it's over. I peek around the corner of the street and run in the opposite direction of Java River, toward another store with a glass window. I take off the hood and stare at my reflection. I'm Shannon. Shannon? Hunter flicks his eyes up to me. What are you doing here? Hi. What would Shannon say, I think? Sometimes a girl just wants a cup of joe, I say out loud, trying not to cringe. Sometimes a girl just wants a cup of joe? Hunter laughs. It's been so long since I've seen him laugh, his entire face brightens and relaxes. I guess that's true, he says. Here, sit. I take a seat and order cappuccino. The waiter stares at me like I have three heads. Capu what? Chino, I repeat. Cappuccino. The waiter looks at Hunter and shrugs. She'll just have a coffee, Hunter says. With milk. The waiter leaves, and Hunter looks at me strangely. Since when do you order cappuccino? I bite my lip. I'm just trying it out. Anyway, what are you doing here? Hunter fingers the handle of his cup, thinking. About what? He tilts his head. Coffee. I laugh. Seriously, though. Life, I guess. He takes a swig at the muddy brown liquid. I just never thought I'd end up here. Alone. You're not alone, I tell him. It pains me to hear him talk this way. You have friends. Turk, Rhea, Yarrick. All those other guys who worship the ground you walk on. And me. You know what I mean, he says. My mom's gone. Ari's gone. I have to fight the revolution. That's what's driving me. That's what keeps me up at night. That's a good thing, right? For now. He looks away at one of the paintings on the wall, a framed picture of a mountain range. But what happens when it's over? Sorry, I say. I'm not following you. When what's over? Hunter looks down at the table. We'll either defeat Kyle or we won't. And when it all comes to an end, which, judging from the looks of it, will be pretty soon, well... He sighs. What will I have then? Nothing. You can't think like that, I tell him, not worrying about whether I sound like Shannon. You fought too hard to give up now. I'm not giving up, he says. You sound like you are. I lean in, choosing my words carefully. You're a good man, Hunter, and there are great things in your future. When we win this war, Manhattan will need to be rebuilt. People will be looking for a leader. He rolls his eyes. They'll have one. Aria. No, I tell him, and I mean it. You. After I finish my coffee, we pay the check and leave. The sun has begun to set. I don't know exactly where Hunter has been staying. I'd ask, but I'm afraid it would give me away. I brush Shannon's long hair from my forehead. This way. Hunter says, cocking his head down a shadowy alley and motioning for me to follow him. Does he know I'm faking? Did my impassioned speech give me away? I trot behind him as he ducks behind a dumpster piled high with garbage. Across the alley is the back door to Java River. There's a bit of light coming from inside, and I can hear the sounds of dishes being washed. What are we doing here? I ask. It smells. Hunter grabs my wrist. I close my eyes and prepare for him to yell at me for trying to fool him. Instead, he kisses me. I haven't been kissed like this in a while. Hunter's lips are electric. They meet mine like puzzle pieces that are meant to fit together. His mouth tastes like coffee and cinnamon. He grips my waist and pulls me toward him, kissing me again and again, tracing my lips with his tongue. My shirt clings to my back as I allow myself to grab his shirt and tug him even closer to me, pressing my chest against his, feeling his ribs expand and collapse. And then I pull away. What? He says breathlessly. What's wrong? Why are you kissing me? He blinks, confused. Don't you like it? That's not the point, I say. We're friends. You're with Aria. Used to be with Aria, he corrects me, running his fingers down my arm. What's going on? I just feel weird about this, I say. It bothers me that kissing Hunter felt so comfortable, so right. And it bothers me that he thinks I'm Shannon. Why would he want to kiss Shannon unless... Come on, 
Hunter says to me in a low voice, lacing his fingers with mine. I'm as still as a statue, trying to understand what's happening. You didn't mind kissing me last night. All at once it makes sense. Why Hunter hasn't been to see me? Why he hasn't begged me to change my mind about breaking up with him? It's because he's already moved on. With Shannon. Chapter 6 I don't think. I run. As fast as I can, practically without looking. I race through the dingy streets of Manhattan, sweat dripping down my neck and back. Blinking back tears, I nearly knock over an old man with a cart full of apples. Hunter and Shannon? The sweet taste of Hunter's lips on mine has gone sour. What was I? No, what, what were they thinking? Did Hunter make the first move, or did she? And when? I curse them both as I run, Shannon's hair bouncing against my cheeks and shoulders. I stop when I reach the Broadway Canal, resting my back against a brownstone facing the water. The water level is high from the rain, threatening to spill over onto the street. I gulp in a few quick breaths, trying to calm my racing heart to shake the image of Shannon and Hunter together, their arms wrapped around each other. But I can't. Technically, I don't have a right to be mad at them. Hunter and I aren't together, and Shannon has no real allegiance to me. It still feels wrong, though. When Hunter was with me at the podium today, he had already been with Shannon. When she ate lunch with me and said we could be friends, she had already been with Hunter. It feels like a terrible betrayal. Aria Rose, the poor little rich girl who can't handle the press. Aria Rose, the girl who doesn't think before she acts, who swallowed a mystic heart, who has powers she doesn't deserve or even know how to use. Is that what they think about me? What they say behind my back? They lie in bed together and kiss and laugh about how naive I am, how glad Hunter is to be done with me. I start to cry again, but then I shake myself. I'm done with crying. I glance down at Shannon's hands, but now I see they're my hands again. The green discoloration has trickled down to my palms. My fingers are a deep, saturated emerald color that is impossible to hide. I raise a hand and feel fuzz in my skull. Shannon's long hair has disappeared. I'm changing back into myself. I duck down an alleyway where no one can see me at all. Once I'm completely back to normal, well, my version of normal anyway, I fly home trying to stay away from heavily traveled areas where people might look up and see me. It's still as exhilarating as it was the first time to be above the world, to look down and see specks of color that are actually buildings, people, life. Only this time my mind is consumed with thoughts of Hunter and Shannon. Did I make the right decision to let Hunter go? Am I only doubting myself now that I see he's with someone else? Davida's powers allow me to pass through the force field that surrounds the hideout. There's a feeling of tightness, like my body is being stuffed inside a tube, and then an audible pop, and then I'm looking at the brownstone at the steps that will lead me to the front door. I tuck my hands into my pockets and go inside. Aria? I hear Yarrick call from the living area. Is that you? I walk down the hallway and into the open space, where Yarrick and Shannon are perched on the frayed round sofa. They both look restless. Next to them, Rhea is sitting in a chair, her cane resting against one of the wooden side tables. I see a pile of small crystals in her open palm. I told you I was going to jazz up my cane. Rhea looks up at me with an impish grin. The bandage over the left side of her face looks fresh. Now we just have to make them stick. Shannon gets up from the sofa. We were just about to come and find you, she tells me, pacing the room. You've been gone a while. Well, I'm back now, I say. I don't need a bodyguard. I know that. Shannon actually smiles at me. I remind myself that she doesn't know what I did, that I took on her glamour and kissed Hunter. The last interaction we had was at the diner, where we'd made amends. But she was lying to me, at least by omission. Isn't she going to say anything about Hunter? I don't think you do know that, I tell her. I realize I must sound petty, but I don't care. You don't know anything about me. Shannon rolls up her shirt sleeves. What are you talking about, Arya? I am a complicated person, I say defensively. I have lots of emotions. I can see that. I have two eyes, you know. Shannon pauses. Sorry, Rhea. It's okay. 
Rhea says, shifting the crystals from one hand to the other. I have two eyes, too. It's just that one of them is, you know, hidden right now, under gauze. I look around the hideout. It's oddly silent. Where's Turk? Yarek shrugs. Not back yet. You're lucky because he'd be pissed we let you walk around the depths on your own. I'm not a baby, I say. I'm a perfectly capable woman. We know, Rhea says. Woman, I emphasize, as in grown up. Great, Shannon says. Good for you. She looks at me curiously, likely wondering what's going on in my head. Wouldn't she like to know? Yarrick glances between the two of us. I'm going to make some tea, he says. Anyone want anything? I'll have some tea, I say. Shannon says nothing, and Yarrick gives me a quick nod, then heads toward the kitchen. And then there is silence. I stare at Shannon. She stares at me. Rhea stares at her cane. What's going on with you? Shannon says. You're acting weird. No, I'm not, I say. I'm acting totally normal. I heard the rally was rough, Rhea says to me. I'm sorry. It was fine, I say. I'm fine. Shannon glares at me. You're clearly not fine. You're on edge. You're being... <sighs> sit down. You're making me nervous. I don't want to sit down because I don't want to take my hands out of my pockets. If I do, everyone will see that they're green. I'm good. Do you want to talk about the rally? Rhea asks me. Maybe it would help. She reaches for my arm. Instinctively, I pull away. I feel jittery, nervous. I don't want to be touched by anyone, even Rhea. I really don't want anyone to see my hands. Aria, Shannon says sharply. Her glossy hair frames her face. The same hair that was on my head only a little while ago. What's the matter? You're the matter, I scream. Everything about you. Shannon's mouth forms an O of pure surprise. Oh, I thought we were friends. Ha! I move away from her toward the stairs. You never thought that. Yes, I did, she insists. Only you're acting so crazy it makes it difficult to actually be your friend. I'm acting crazy. I can feel myself panting. I'm acting crazy? The others are staring at me, but I can't seem to stop myself. Maria, Rhea chimes in. You sort of are. Tea's ready, Yarrick calls from the kitchen. Aria, you're... I don't want any tea, I shout, gesturing wildly. The words fly out of me like bullets full of rage. I don't want tea and I don't want fake friends like you. I point to Shannon, realizing that I'm out of control. I wish I could fade into the wall, into the air. For a second, no one says anything. And then behind me, I hear Turk's voice. Arya, he says. What's wrong with your hands? I collapse to the floor and rest my head against the wall. I don't know, I say softly, feeling the tears begin to flow. I don't know. Turk sits down next to me, pressing his leg against mine. It's okay. You're okay. I wipe my eyes and press my leg against Turk's. Thank God for you, I think. Yarrick walks into the room. He crouches down and hands me a mug of tea. It's hot, he says. I grab the mug. It doesn't feel hot, but I do. I glance down and see that my skin is blotchy and blistery red, where it's not green, that is. I busy myself by staring at the wooden floorboards. I don't look up because I don't want to see Shannon. I don't look up because I don't want to see Shannon staring at me with anger, or worse, pity. I sip the tea, which tastes like honey and mint. It doesn't calm me, though. It only makes me hotter. Feel any better? Turk asks. When I don't respond, he pushes himself up from the floor and reaches out his hand. Come on, I'll help you upstairs. You should lie down. Take a nap. Instead of taking his hand, I grip the mug even tighter. Steam rises from the liquid like fog off a river on a warm summer night. And then, without warning, the mug shatters in my fingers. Bits of ceramic slice through the air, and I jump. I glance down at my lap, but there's no liquid anywhere, though there is steam all around me. The mere energy from my hand was hot enough to vaporize the drink. Whoa, Yarrick mouths silently. Shannon stares at me like I'm dangerous. You okay? Turk says, stepping over to me. There's a cut on the inside of my palm, but otherwise I'm fine. I grab Turk's hand, yanking myself off the ground. Seeing the concern in his eyes, I force a smile. 
Maybe I will take that nap. I'm not sure how long I sleep, though it's long enough for a jumble of dreams. Hunter and Shannon swirl through my mind, as well as my brother, Danny, Benny, and Kiki. I even see snippets of Davida, her hands in black gloves, careful not to touch anything in my parents' house with her bare skin, making sure her real identity stays hidden. I see skyscrapers flashing by, and then I'm riding the Turk on his motorcycle. I touch his shaved head, the beginnings of soft black fuzz covering his scalp. He looks so much gentler without the mohawk, less of a tough guy. His green eyes peer into mine, seeing what I don't know. Is he in love with me like Davida was in love with Hunter? A painful kind of yearning? Or has he already moved on like Hunter? I wish that I knew what he saw in me so that I could try to see it in myself. When my eyelids flutter open, I glance at the clock. 8 p.m. Ahem, <clears throat> someone says. I turn my head and realize that Turk is in a chair beside my bed. It's far from a terrible sight to wake up to. Hey, he says gently. Hey, how long was I out for? A few hours, he shrugs. How do you feel? Aside from a headache, which seems to be the norm for me these days, I'm fine. I push myself up and rest my head against the iron bed frame. Physically or emotionally? Turk rests his elbows on his knees. Both? Physically, I'm fine, I say. Emotionally, I'm... confused. He doesn't press me for specifics, which I appreciate, and motions to a bowl that's resting on the nightstand. Gaspacho, he says. Maybe I should hold the bowl and feed it to you. You know, to prevent any accidents. I laugh. I'm fine, I promise. He hands me the soup and a spoon. It's cold, which is nice. And I dip the spoon into the red concoction and bring it to my lips. Look, Arya, Turk says to me while I eat. I know you think you're fine, but... He trails off, staring at my hands. My green hands. It's a side effect from the heart, I say. It looks strange, but really, I'm all right. I know you think you are, Turk repeats. But would it hurt to have someone check? Who? I say. The last doctor I went to lied to me and stole my memories. I don't exactly have much faith in the medical profession. Turk shoots me his signature lopsided smile, playing with a silver chain around his neck. Not a doctor. A friend. I put down the soup. Who? Oh. Lyrica, he says. The name conjures up instant memories for me. Lyrica is an old mystic woman whom I've met exactly twice. I close my eyes, and an image of her sweet face stares back at me, her eyes glimmering with magic and knowledge, her long gray hair worn in dozens of thick braids. You've spoken to her? I ask. This surprises me, as Lyrica never stays in one place for long. She's nearly impossible to find. I reached out, Turk says and she asked that I bring you to her. Bring me to her? What can she possibly do for me? I don't know, he says glumly. This isn't the Turk I know, full of vigor and attitude. He seems defeated. But we can't just sit around and wait for you to... To what? Die, Turk says. The word weighs heavy in the air. I'm not going to die, I tell him. You don't know that. He stands and goes to the window, staring out of the blue-green sky. Even from here, we can see the force field, spreading like a deadly disease. Davida's heart is poisoning you. Can't you see, Arya? Look at you! I flex my fingers and hold them out in front of me. My hands look like someone else's, not mine. Lyrica can help, Turk insists. He turns from the window and stares at me with pleading eyes. I don't know what else to do, Arya. I've tried reaching out to... Well, it doesn't matter. Lyrica is the one who answered my call. We need to remove the heart from you if it's not already too late. Remove it? I suppose that deep down I knew someone would tell me this. But losing the heart would mean losing my mystic powers, my memories of Davida. I've only begun to tap into them, to understand what her life was like. No, I say to Turk. No? I don't want to remove the heart. I know this is a bold thing to say, but I mean it. I need it. You need to live, Turk says. That's all that matters. I know that's not true. 
What matters is saving Manhattan from whatever my family has planned. And to do that, I need to be as strong as possible. I look at Turk, trying to figure out how to explain. But as soon as we lock eyes, I can tell he'll never understand. Come here, I say, and pat the space next to me on the bed. Turk crawls over to me and places his hand on the covers, on the spot where my knee is. I'm allowed to worry about you, Aria, he tells me, his eyes soft. He loves me. He's worried about me. What's so wrong about letting him in? My family doesn't care about me, and Hunter, well, he's already moved on. I don't have to feel guilty about betraying him. I'll see Lyrica, I tell him. I promise. For you. Turk moves his hand up to my stomach and presses his lips to mine. His kiss is different from Hunter's. Sweeter, more tentative. He tastes like vanilla coffee with a bit of cinnamon, the kind my mother's maid Magdalena used to brew for me before school. He breaks for a second. Is this okay? I lift the bed covers so that he can slip in next to me. It's better than okay. This time I initiate the kiss, running my hands over his chest, tracing the shapes of his tattoos with my fingertips. He's wider than Hunter, with broader shoulders and a thicker waist. He's sturdy. Turk slides over me so that we're staring into each other's eyes. I wrap my legs around his, and he kisses my neck and collarbone, soft butterfly kisses that feel like jolts of electricity. I've waited for this for so long, he says in a husky voice. I pull him closer to me. I just want more and more of him. I don't even worry that he'll see the green starburst over my heart. Turk loves me, I think. Our lips meet again and again, each time a little more passionate. There's a sense of danger in Turk's kisses now. They're so powerful that if I'm not careful, I could lose myself in his arms and never find my way back. And then the door to the bedroom slams open. It smacks against the wall with a loud thud. I push Turk off me and look up to see Yarek standing in the doorway, his cheeks bright pink with embarrassment. What? Turk says, clearly annoyed. Um, well, Yarek says, stumbling over his words, I... Just spit it out, Turk says. Yarek points downstairs. You guys have to see this. Chapter 7 Good evening. I regret to inform you that Manhattan is under threat of attack from the neighboring city-state of Philadelphia. Kyle is dressed in a sharp-looking gray tweed suit, speaking directly to the people of New York City in an emergency broadcast. His blonde hair is slicked back, and his green eyes sparkle on the screen. Benny is by his side in a pale blue dress with a scooped neckline, her eyes fixed on Kyle's face, staring at him adoringly. They look like a younger version of my parents, so much so that it's frightening. We're all gathered in the library, watching. Across the room, Shannon stands behind Rhea, who is gripping her cane and looking incredibly distraught. I say this not to cause alarm, but to let the courageous people of Manhattan know that we in the Aries have a plan to protect our beloved city. Protect? Shannon says in a mocking tone. Calm down, Shannon, Turk says to her. He's standing next to me, close enough that I can feel the heat of his body. It'll be fine, she snarls, throwing a darting glare at him. Guys, Rhea says. Shh. As some of you may have already noticed, soldiers have been positioned along our borders. In addition, all of the bridges leading into and out of Manhattan by way of the depths will be closed by tomorrow morning, Kyle says. Guards will be placed at each entrance with a list of those who are approved to enter and exit. All others must remain in Manhattan until further notice. He's locking us in, Yarek says. Everyone who doesn't have access to a private helicopter in the Aries, Shannon clarifies, which means the entire Depths population. Starting tomorrow, our city is on official lockdown, Kyle repeats. It is the only way to repel potential invaders. I thank you, the people of Manhattan, for putting your faith in me and my family, especially my parents, Johnny and Melinda Rose. I promise you will not regret it. Kyle gives a stern nod, and the emergency broadcast is over. Like clockwork, everyone's touch-me's begin to sound. 
Shannon steps to the corner of the room, speaking in a low, hushed voice, while Yarrick, his device pressed to his ear, nods as if someone is giving him instructions. Rhea has a nearly invisible headset in place and is rapidly taking notes on her touch-me. The library blossoms with noise, with urgency. What do you mean they haven't found her yet? Turk says into his touch-me. Found who? I mouth to him, but he's too wrapped up in his conversation to notice. Everyone is occupied with something except me. And then my touch-me buzzes. I glance down at the screen. Get out while you still can. Like the first time I got an anonymous message, the number is private. There is no way for me to call whoever sent this. Before anyone notices, I reply, Who is this? I wait for an answer, but my touch-me remains silent. Whoever is sending these messages is trying to protect me. But why is he or she remaining anonymous? Then I see Shannon click off her touch-me. What's going on? I ask her, surprised to find that my earlier anger has vanished. Who is everybody talking to? There is a second when I think she might not answer me. Then she sighs and says, Other rebels. And I'm relieved that Shannon seems to have forgiven my earlier outburst. We need to know what's happening in Philadelphia. If what Kyle is saying is true, that they're getting ready to attack. What if it is true? I say. Shannon smooths back her hair, which looks like it could use a good wash. Then we prepare to fight. I just spoke to someone at the hideout downtown near the seaport, Yarrick says, coming over to us. He says there are rose soldiers everywhere. They're all along the west side, too, Rhea says. And in the north. I recall the line of soldiers Turk and I saw on our way to the rally. It's true what Kyle said, I say. We're surrounded. Turk gets off his touch-me as Shannon positions herself at the head of the long wooden table in the center of the room. Not completely she says. There's a spot underground where an old subway tunnel feeds into the East River. I remember, Turk says. Yarrick slipped away earlier and now returns with a plate of ham sandwiches. I take one gratefully, mouthing a quick thank you. I can't remember the last time I ate. Guards are positioned at the shoreline, Shannon says, but Hunter is organizing some of the rebels to use that spot as an emergency exit for some of the drained mystics, at least the women and children. We won't be able to save everyone, but we can try. There's a rebel there who has the ability to breathe underwater, she continues. He's helping us create boats, basically small submarines in one of the tunnels. The boats will leave through the East River, then connect with the Long Island Sound and carry mystics up toward Connecticut, where they can seek protection. Hunter thought something like this was coming. He's been working on it for some time, since well before Kyle made the announcement. Sadly, I don't need to ask Shannon how she knows this. What about the others in the depths? I say. All the humans who won't have access to these boats. There is silence in the room. We'll think of something, Rhea says. I know we will. It's all well and good to save our own kind, I say. But the humans in the depths are going to look to us for help. What are we going to tell them? Our kind? Shannon challenges. I stare at her realizing she hasn't forgotten my anger at her after I returned from seeing Hunter. Not one word of it. What? You said our kind as if you're one of us? But you're not. She leans forward, her eyes locking with mine. Just because you stole Davida's powers doesn't mean you have any idea what it means to be a mystic. To have suffered and been persecuted. You're not going to make me or anyone in this room feel guilty about a plan to save our own kind. Got it? That's not... That's not what I meant, I say. We're all in this together. I glance around at the rest of the group. Aren't we? Of course we are, Turk says. I'm trying to help, Shannon, I tell her. That's all. The time to have helped was before you got us into this mess, Shannon says angrily. Your brother is using mystic energy to close off the Ares. Do you have any idea what sort of power is needed to create a force field that big? Listen, Yarrick says to us. About that? No, I say, but, but the city has reserves, right? Drained mystic energy that's been stored for decades. Wouldn't that be enough? Turk considers this. The energy reserves have already been used up to run the city these past few weeks. The amount of energy he's using to make this thing? He must have hundreds of people being drained into oblivion. He looks at Yarrick and Rhea. Am I right? They don't respond. The thought of using innocent people, innocent mystics, this way makes me sick. There's something I have to say, 
Yarrick announces. He pushes some of his dark hair behind his ears. I know about the force field. A silence washes over the room. What do you mean you know about the force field? Shannon says. Why haven't you said anything before? I tried to bring it up a couple of times, Yarrick says, but I kept getting cut off. Shannon's eyes bug out of her head. And you didn't think it was important enough to try again? Yarrick gulps. That's what I'm doing right now. It's okay, Rhea says. Shannon, let him speak. Yarrick, what do you know? Alyssa Genevieve mentioned it, he says, back when she captured me. She said she wanted to use Davida's heart to become as powerful as his sister, and then create a force field around the Ares to control it without anyone being able to stop her. But Alyssa's dead, Turk says. And she never got the heart, I add. Then I remember how we once thought Alyssa had died after an epic battle underground, only to find out later that she had actually survived. Oh, no, I say. What if Alyssa isn't actually dead? She is, Yarrick says. I saw her die. How can we trust you? Shannon blurts out. We can trust him, Rhea says firmly. But Yarrick, she turns to him. Are you saying that maybe Kyle is following Alyssa's plan? I'm not sure. He says. Arya, what do you think? I consider the possibility. Alyssa was close to my father. It's possible that she shared this idea of hers with him. Maybe even told him how to create it. But that still doesn't clarify where all the energy is coming from. Your brother could be killing mystics for their hearts, Rhea suggests. I think we would have heard about something like that, Shannon says, narrowing her eyes. I could try to contact my parents, I volunteer. I'm not sure how successful I'll be, but maybe... Your parents are checked out, Arya, Shannon says, her beautiful features furrowed and angry. They're leaving Manhattan. Your father isn't the one organizing this mystic shield over the Ares. Kyle is. Leaving? I repeat. What are you talking about? I have a source, Shannon says. In the Ares. Your parents are fleeing the city. Tonight. I don't believe her. My parents have lived in Manhattan their entire lives. Their parents' parents lived here. They wouldn't just leave, especially not with a war about to break out. I look at Yarrick and Rhea to see if they know anything about this, but they seem as surprised as I am. Then I turn to Turk. Is this true? I just heard that too, he says, twisting one of the silver barbells in his ear. I'm sorry, Arya. It doesn't make any sense. I think of my father's bodyguards, men who would murder without hesitation at his command. And then I realize, that was the past. This is now. Think about it, Shannon says to me. When's the last time your father has appeared in public? I, I don't know, I say. Exactly. He has checked out, Arya. He knows the city is about to blow, and he's letting Kyle do his dirty work. This sounds like the opposite of the Johnny Rose I grew up with. A man who lived for power and authority, who sold lives and traded illegal drugs in the blink of an eye. A man who looked upon Manhattan as his personal playground and his family as property, which made it fine to marry off his only daughter to cement a political alliance. Maybe if I talk to him, I find myself saying, I can convince him to stay. Maybe he can rein in Kyle and fix whatever's going wrong. Even as I say this, I know how it must sound. Shannon laughs. Even if that was a good idea, which it's not, your father hates you. Turk growls. Shannon, take the bitch level down a notch, okay? Is anything I'm saying untrue? Shannon asks. Yarrick shrugs. It is sort of true, Arya, he says. I don't think your dad will put much stock in whatever you have to say to him right now. He coughs. <clears throat> no offense. It's true, Rhea says gently. Even if you went to him and pleaded... I don't think you'd get far. Turk reaches over to comfort me, but I turn away. You're right, I say to Rhea. I wouldn't. I feel for my touch-me, safely tucked into my back pocket. Someone tried to warn me to leave the city, and I have a feeling I know who it is, which is why I need some help. Now I take it out and stare at the blank screen. Quickly, I enter the most familiar name I know into the device. What are you doing? Turk asks me. Aria? It's Aria, I type quickly. Let's meet. We need to talk. Aria, Rhea says quizzically. 
I don't have to wait long for a response. I glanced down at the screen. Thought you'd never ask. It's from Kiki. Chapter 8 You sure you're ready for this? Turk says to me outside the greenhouse. He clicks the lock on his motorcycle, which stands out next to a line of small, multicolored Vespas that must belong to the various Aries kids inside. It's nearly an hour after I texted Kiki, around 10 p.m., and we're about to meet up at an Aries bar we used to frequent back when my life felt normal, when the biggest problems I had were that I had too many clothes and accessories to choose from. The air outside is sweltering. The blue dress I borrowed from Rhea already feels dank against my skin. As ready as I'll ever be, I say, wondering how to ask Kiki why she's been sending me the text messages. So far, all I have is, Kiki, what the hell, which isn't particularly subtle. I press a gloved finger to the scanner embedded in the wall outside Greenhouse. Thankfully, I've managed to hold on to a pair of Davida's mystic gloves, enhanced with various fingerprints woven into the material to protect my true identity. These gloves serve a double purpose. They allow me to enter the Aries without alerting my family, and they cover my hands, which seem to be getting more grotesquely green by the hour. The scanner lights up and the greenhouse door slides open. Come on, I say, pulling Turk inside with me. The air conditioning hits me as soon as I step inside. The lights are just the right kind of dim for a bar, bright enough that you don't trip over your own feet, but dark enough that everyone looks like a model. A memory comes flashing back as I take Turk's hand and weave through a cluster of tables. Kiki and I doing shots to celebrate the end of a school year, lying about our ages and flirting with boys who must have been two or three years older. Then we left, letting them pick up the tab. Once we were outside, we laughed so hard that we cried. This place is wild, Turk says. In a way, it is. The greenhouse bar is attached to an actual greenhouse. Ivy clings to the brick-covered walls, while tropical plants live in vases nearly as tall as I am. The mirrored glass on the back of the bar is lit with soft green lights that illuminate the liquor bottles and make them look even more expensive than they are, which is pretty pricey to begin with. I can't help but notice how many people are stuffed into this bar, drinking and chatting and eating like nothing is wrong, as if the bridges and the depths aren't being closed, possibly leaving all those who live down there to be annihilated. Outside, I can see the force field as it wraps itself around the Aries, the green visible even against the night sky. But inside, it's just a party. Girls a little older than I am show off their smooth skin in short, short designer dresses dyed in vivid, mystic-infused colors. The men wear tight pants and sparkly muscle t-shirts, or dress shirts sewn with mystic thread, throwing off bright, colorful light. Everyone's hair is dyed in wild hues like fuchsia and tangerine, the exposed skin on their necks and arms covered in mystic tattoos. I search for Kiki as I pull Turk along, locating our usual table in the back. Then I stop short. There she is, my best friend, tapping her purple nails against the table, checking her touch me, and sipping a yellow drink. Kiki, her blonde hair enhanced with mystic dye, bright blue streaks that pool together at the tips, a glowing magenta mystic heart decal on her neck. A child of the Aries, with no worries except her social life. She spots me. Are you? I just stand there. There are a million things I want to say, but hi is all that comes out. Kiki stands up and starts toward me, opening her arms for a hug. I open my arms, too, and we embrace. She's wearing the same perfume she always does. She smells like a rose garden. It has been so long, she says breaking from the hug and shaking her head. Well, not that long in the reality of, like, time, but a lot has happened, right? Before I can respond, she pivots to Turk. Who are you? Kiki, this is Turk, I say, watching as Turk extends his hand. Kiki just laughs, pushing his hand away and giving him a hug as well. Who shakes hands anymore? Turk laughs nervously. He seems completely and totally out of his element, which I find charming. I picture him kissing me. I smile at him, and he smiles back. Um, hello? Are you going to just stand there like statues? Sit. Kiki motions to the empty chairs next to her. Seriously, sit. We do. The glass tabletop lights up as soon as I touch it, listing the menu. 
I've forgotten how easy life is in the Aries, where you can order food at the touch of a button, whatever you want. How opulent everything is. Next to us, the fringy leaves of a foxtail plant graze Turk's neck. He scratches like there's a bug biting him. What do you guys want to drink? Kiki asks. Oh, you have to try the chlorophyll water here. It's to die for. I mean, not literally, because it's supposed to, like, help your immune system or whatever, but it's delicious. She looks at me eagerly. So, will you try it? Sure, I say, scrolling through the menu and selecting a drink. Turk? Kiki says. What about you? Turk shrugs. I'll maybe have regular water. Kiki throws up her hands. Boring? Anyway, Turk, is that your actual name? He grins. Yep. Kiki rests her chin on her knuckles. Like your God-given name? Turk gives me a side glance. Uh, because, like, my name is Kiki, but it's a nickname. My birth name is Claudia, but that's, like, so dull. The only person who ever called me that besides my parents was Arya's... Kiki stops herself before she finishes her sentence. Arya's mother. Anyway, what's in a name, right? Kiki laughs and bats her eyelashes. Turk, do you like pudding? Oh, God, I'm rambling. She takes a long sip from a yellow drink. Then she stares at me. I'm sorry. I'm just so weirded out that you texted me. I want to say, it's weird that you texted me, but Kiki is still talking. I've been waiting to hear from you for, like, forever. Kiki turns to Turk. We used to tell each other everything, me and Aria, or at least I thought we did. Kiki has every right to be mad at me. All our lives we shared our secrets, until I kept a huge one from her and Benny. Hunter. I didn't think she would understand my relationship with him, and things spiraled downward until now, leaving us sitting here like strangers. It's only been a few weeks since I last saw her, but it feels like an eternity. I owe you an apology, Kiki. She nods. Yes, you do. I didn't think you would approve of me and Hunter, I say, which is why I kept the truth from you. I wouldn't have approved, Kiki says without flinching. He's wrong for you. Look at the person you've become, Aria. You're so political. And your hair. She gestures at my head. It was so pretty, so long and lush. Now you're just scalp. She turns to Turk. For you, it's a good look. For Aria, not so much. Her eyes flicker for a moment. Where is Hunter, anyway? We're not together anymore, I tell her. I hold my breath for her reaction. After all this? I can tell she's trying as hard as possible to keep her voice down. After everything you lost? I thought it was true love. I thought it was too, I say, oddly relieved to have Kiki know this. Kiki seems shocked. She doesn't say anything for a few seconds then glances down and begins to scroll through the menu. I need another drink, she says. Have you tried the cactus caprino? I think there's real cactus in it. It's super sweet. A waitress comes and sets down my chlorophyll water. It's thick and green, almost like soup. Turk wrinkles his nose. That looks like muck from one of the canals in the depths. Some of us wouldn't know what that looks like, Kiki says, then orders another drink. Some of us don't know what caipirinhas are, Turk replies in the same tone. Kiki rolls her eyes. Who's he? She says to me as if Turk is invisible. Some comedian you're hanging out with? No, I say. He's my... he's... I stop and think. Who is Turk to me at the moment? He's more than a friend, that's for sure. But is he my boyfriend? I know he wants to be. But what do I want? Her comedian? Turk says. Is that a compliment? What do you think? She replies. Then she notices my gloves. Dressing like your servants now, Arya? What's with people in your household in gloves? I realize from her comment that she's talking about Davida, and that Kiki has no idea that she's dead. Nothing, I say, taking my hands off the table. Look, Kiki, I texted you because... Let's cut to the chase, Arya, Kiki says dryly. She daintily blots her forehead with a napkin. I appreciate the apology, even if it's a little too late. I saw you flying on television. She waves her hands in front of her face. Talk about blindsided. I don't know who you are anymore. What happened to my best friend? The truth, I say. The truth, she says. 
That girl is gone, I admit. I've seen things that have changed me, opened my eyes. I'm not the same person I was the night of my engagement party, I say. My parents stole that from me. Stole what? She blinks. Diamonds? I glance at Turk. He nods, giving me the support I need. Something more valuable, I say. My innocence. And then I recount the story of what happened to me. The real story, leaving nothing out. How I met Hunter and fell in love with him and kept that from her. How my parents tried to eliminate any trace of him from my life and marry me off to Thomas. How their plan failed and people died because of it. How Davida sacrificed herself for me and Hunter and is gone forever, leaving me her heart. Last of all, I tell her how I'm one of them now, a mystic, one of the people we were both taught to be afraid of. Only there's nothing to be afraid of, Kiki, I tell her. She looks at me with her eyes wide open, dumbstruck. Does she think I'm lying? Crazy? Say something. I reach a gloved hand across the table. Please. Kiki stares at Turk, then at me. She purses her glossy, scarlet-colored lips. I can't remember the last time I wore lipstick. The last time I did anything remotely similar to what we used to do together. Then slowly, she reaches out her hand and places it in mine. I give it a squeeze. I didn't know, she says. Any of it, really. How could you have, I say. I never told you. You never gave me enough credit, Kiki says. Sadly, I can't refute her statement. Look, I appreciate your telling me this, all of this, but, but what do you want, Aria? I don't mean to be nasty. I just figure you need something if you're reaching out to me now. It's true, I say. Turk remains silent, letting me lead the conversation. I need your help getting to my parents. Kiki guffaws. Your parents? You really want to see them? What for? It's Kyle, I say. He's messed up, Kiki offers. Insane? Turk laughs and steals a sip of Kiki's cocktail. You're funny, he says to her. Don't get too comfortable, she yanks her drink back. Seriously, though, Kyle's lost it. I need to see him, I say, and I don't have any way of finding him except through my parents. Kiki glances around the bar, making sure no one is listening. You don't want to, she says. He's insane. He does stick now all the time, loads of it like it's medicine. Turk shifts in his seat. I've known for a while that Kyle has a drug problem, but I didn't know how bad it's gotten. Kiki rests her elbows on the table and leans forward. You're not the only one with powers, you know, she says. I hear Kyle takes so much of it he can do stuff, mystic stuff. Like what? Turk asks. I don't know, really I don't. Kiki finishes her cocktail, then takes a sip of my chlorophyll water. I only knew because of Benny, but she's pretty tight-lipped about your brother these days. She's like his ventriloquist doll. Just stands by his side and lets him speak for her. She's been playing that part for quite a while. It's sad, really. Tragic. I think about how Benny looked when I saw her on TV with Kyle, like the perfect wife. If Kyle is feeding her a script, as Kiki suggests, why is she going along with it? What about Danny? I say, asking about Kyle's best friend. Surely he still sees Danny. Maybe he has some influence over Kyle. Kiki bites her bottom lip. No one's heard from Danny in a while, she says. Not since that soiree Benny threw at her folks place, actually. Pictures from that night immediately come back to me. How I watched someone overdose on stick right before my eyes. How I walked in on Thomas cheating on me. What a terrible night. I've called him a few times, but he never picks up. Kiki rolls her eyes obviously bothered that someone would screen her calls. My folks even called his parents. Nothing. He probably got out. Out? I ask. Of the city, Kiki says. He and Kyle were so close, it's hard to believe he'd just go, but where else would he be? I heard his parents took some sort of extended vacation to Hawaii or somewhere. She narrows her eyes. Maybe your brother scared Danny away. Then she lets out a small laugh as though she's just said something hilarious. But Kyle is scary, I think. I just need to see him, I say, to convince him to stop what he's doing in the depths. He's not going to see you, Aria, Kiki says emphatically. 
We know that, Turk says. He hates Arya. But surely he doesn't hate you. Kiki thinks about this. No, I suppose he doesn't. But even if I wanted to help you, Arya, I have no idea where your brother is. Benny said he changed his number and went totally off the grid. She smacks her lips together. And don't even get me started about her. She's totally MIA, sends a few texts now and then, saying everything's just dandy, but I'm not sure I believe her. The most I've seen her is on TV. I have no idea where either of them are. But, I say, leaning back into my chair, I'm sure my parents do. Probably, Kiki says, taking a loud sip from her drink. You're not exactly the golden child, though. Why would they tell you anything, especially now that they're leaving? Leaving? So it's true, what Shannon said. I feel numb. My father, Johnny Rose, is abandoning Manhattan. You didn't know? Kiki says. I can see in her eyes that she feels bad about breaking the news. Why would you, I guess? Yeah, they're leaving, and rumor has it your father's transferred all his wealth outside the city, too. I don't know where they're going, only that they've left Kyle in charge. And since the Foster family is pretty much, well, dead, your brother's really running the show around here. All of your father's supporters have pledged their allegiance to him. My parents are leaving. Kyle is in charge. My half-insane, stick-addicted brother, who is only three years older than I am. He wants to destroy the depths and everyone who lives there. I need to see my parents before they go, I tell Kiki. They won't let me into the apartment if I just show up. Can you help me? It feels strange to be asking for help to see my own parents, but what choice do I have? Kiki looks at me with a mixture of fear and pity. I'll see what I can do. She takes her touch me and excuses herself from the table. So, Turk says casually, that one will. I can tell he's joking, and I allow myself to laugh. Kiki seemed to accept my apology, I say. I guess asking her a favor is a lot right now. Turk smiles. Yes, but there's no harm in asking. And Kiki is important to you. You needed to tell her the truth. The rest? We'll figure it out. I stare at Turk. Then I smile back at him. There's no doubt he's out of place in this over-the-top Aries bar, but I like him all the more for it. He's real. I'm so grateful to have him by my side that I almost forget why we came here in the first place. That is, until Kiki returns to the table and plops into her seat, looking defeated. They don't want to see you, Aria, she says. I'm sorry. My heart sinks. Oh, I say. Turk looks at us and excuses himself to use the men's room. Nice meeting you, he says to Kiki. So, I say to the girl I've known since I was a toddler, is this it? Or can we still be friends? Kiki smiles at me, tossing back her hair. One day soon, she says. Friends would be nice. Meanwhile, I took care of the tab while I was up. You're welcome. She leans in to hug me, and I wrap my arms around her. Her purse smacks my side, and I think about her touch me and the messages I've been receiving. Kiki pulls back and wipes her eyes. You don't have to warn me anymore, I tell her. I'm okay. She looks at me funny. Warn you? The messages, I say, from a private number. I haven't been sending you any messages, are you? Kiki pats her purse and motions to the door. I should go. She gives me a quick kiss on the cheek, whispering, Good luck. I watch her leave. If Kiki hasn't been sending me those texts, then who has? Chapter 9 What now? Turk and I watch Kiki walk away, giving us a tiny wave over her shoulder before she disappears onto the bridge, heading back to her family's apartment in the Aries. The skin on her back almost glitters in the dim light. As we stand watching her in the broiling air, the mystic force field is clearly visible, casting a green glow over everything, skyscrapers, bridges, people, as it continues to spread. Tentatively, I take off one of my gloves and grab Turk's hand. We're standing outside the door to the greenhouse in the middle of a sleek bridge, all around us are immense skyscrapers that twinkle in the night like metallic stars. The skin feels warm against mine. I forgot what it's like here, I say. How high up we are and how far down the rest of the world is. I peer over the edge of the bridge, carefully holding the railing with my free hand. 
It's so dark I can't even make out the depths or the canals. All I see is blackness tinged with green. I hear a noise and swivel nervously. Relax, Turk says. They're just people. He's right. Two women pass us, their heads covered with shawls despite the heat, each holding the hands of two children. Three men follow them, wheeling a pile of suitcases. They must be attempting to flee the Ares. But how? By a helicopter? By boat through the depths? Or over one of the old bridges? Where do you think they're heading? Turk asks. A few blocks ahead, practically hidden by the tall buildings, I can just make out the glassy structure of a light rail station. I think about Kyle's announcement, how he's closing all the bridges out of the depths in the morning. Out of Manhattan, I say. I can hardly blame them for wanting to leave. I let my eyes sweep across the horizon. The tall, mystic light spires are mostly empty, save for a bit of dull yellow energy. It's just enough illumination for us to see dozens of people scurrying across the Ares bridges like ants. Don't worry, Turk says, pulling me close. His touch feels surprisingly comfortable, like we've been intimate for months instead of, well, a day. How can I not worry? I reply. Come on. I tug his hand and look around to get my bearings. The greenhouse is in an area known as Chelsea, and we need to head uptown. Let's go. Go? Turk says as I lead him toward the nearest light rail station. Where? To see my parents, I say. But they don't want to see you, he says, confused. A minor roadblock, I say as casually as possible, dipping into my pocket and pulling out a pink touch-me. Recognize this? His hazel eyes widen. Is that Kiki's phone? I allow myself a tiny smile. Yep. Turk holds up his hand. Aria, seriously, you jacked a phone? I'm going to give it back, I say. I just needed it. For what? Turk says. I glance around to make sure no one's watching, then pull Turk across the bridge into the shadows. Watch. I hold onto the phone and close my eyes. I did this yesterday for no reason other than to talk to Hunter. But this is different. Now I need to see my parents and find out where Kyle is. I think of Kiki at the bar tonight, of her hearty laugh and her glowing skin, her honeysuckle blonde hair streaked with midnight blue. And then I feel it. My toes begin to tingle, and my skin feels like it's been lit with a match. My pores seem to widen and hiss, and my body goes red hot and freezing cold at once. My head feels like it's being pulled and stretched like I'm a marionette, and my torso contracts like it's being suffocated by an ancient corset. I can actually feel my fingernails lengthen, feel the bones in my legs crunch together until I'm almost numb. I relax and open my eyes. I can tell by Turk's expression that the magic has worked. His handsome eyes are wide, and his lips are parted in awe. I do a little spin, realizing I'm wearing Kiki's clothes, too. Say something. Turk closes his eyes, then opens them again. Wow. I've seen a lot of things, but... Wow. Now for the second part of my plan, I say, taking out Kiki's Touch Me and scrolling to the listing that reads, Rose Melinda, my mother. I click her name and send a quick text. Thanks for chatting just now. Can I come over and say goodbye? I need to talk to Johnny. Urgent. While we wait to hear from her... We walk along the arched bridge, away from Greenhouse, toward the large rectangular light rail station. It resembles a glass box dropped from the sky, covered in dark reflective material to block the sun's rays. Everything appears different now because of the light from the force field, bright green against the night sky like it's all been bathed in emeralds. The same green as my hands, I realize. I can't believe how much you look like her, Turk says. Seriously, it's freaky. Don't worry, I tell him. Even my voice sounds different now, like Kiki's. It won't be for long, just until I talk to my father. Has your mother texted you back yet? Turk asks. I glance down at Kiki's touch me and shake my head. No response, but there's still time. You're even crazier than I thought, Turk tells me. That's a good thing, right? He doesn't answer. When we reach the station, I give one of my gloves to Turk. Here. I say, put it on. Then I press my hand to a scanner and the doors slide open, letting us into a large waiting area. The station is always bustling with activity. 
Tonight there are loads of people inside, even more than I expected, but you could cut the silence with a knife. Dozens of families I recognize are waiting in line to catch a car, to leave Manhattan, somehow. As we wait, Turk casually attempts to stuff his large hand into the glove, the only way he'll be able to access one of the cars, since he isn't registered with the government. Thanks to Kiki's fingerprints, I'll be fine. We join one of the long lines for an uptown car. On either side of the station is a wall of terminals, one side for uptown, the other for downtown. The light rail is so fast, you usually never have to wait more than a few moments. But tonight is different. Kiki, says a woman a few feet in front of us. Is that you? I turn my head and look down. Stand in front of me, I tell Turk. Block me. Never mind, I hear the woman say to her companion. As we wait, I let my eyes wander to the various terminals, which light up when a car is ready. The shuttles blink in and out, with more and more people leaving the station. People just keep coming, Turk says, and I see that he's right. The lines for the shuttle cars extend out of the station onto the bridge. Finally, it's our turn. We walk forward, and I press my hand again to the scanner. Claudia Shoby flashes overhead on a small screen. The doors retract, and I step into the car. It worked. I glance back as Turk presses his gloved hand to the scanner. The name Evan Lycus flashes overhead. Thank you, Evan, says Turk, as he steps inside and the doors close behind him. Broadway Station at 86th Street, I say aloud to the autopilot, and we start to move. Turk peers down at the glass floor, watching the depths pass underneath us as we move. Fancy. Never been in one of these before. He sits on a cushioned seat, and I follow his lead. You know, he says, staring out at the city lights as we move. In another world, this would be romantic. Imagine me and you heading out after an elegant dinner at a five-star restaurant. We'd have caviar, I say with a smile, surprised that Turk isn't freaking out that I look like Kiki right now. And champagne, pink champagne. I lean into his shoulder, feeling his chest expand. And afterward, we could go to the theater and see some big, loud musical with lots of dancing. And I could wear a cape, Turk says. I stare up at him. What? I've always wanted to wear a cape. I laugh and let my fingers, a Kiki's fingers rather, trace patterns on his thighs. We shoot across the city so fast that it doesn't feel like we're moving at all. Another world, where there are no soldiers or awful parents or brothers or injustice, and everyone is treated fairly. Where there are no Aries and no depths, Turk says. There's just Manhattan. Another world, I repeat. You're right. It does sound nice. Before we know it, we're exiting the light rail station and heading toward my parents' building. The apartment I grew up in. Kiki's touch me buzzes with a text. It's from my mother. Come now. At least they'll let me in, I say. If they don't kill you, Turk says. Are you sure you don't want me to come up with you? You could say I'm your boyfriend, or... It's too risky. They might recognize you somehow, I say. I'll be fine. My parents wouldn't hurt Kiki. What I don't say is that they would hurt me. In a second. Keep me prisoner, erase my memories as a start, and then... I'll wait for you out here. Turk points to the bridge that connects my building to the one on West End Avenue, slightly farther west. Aria. Yes. He gives me a fast kiss, touching his nose to mine. Be careful. You too, I say. And then I take a few steps and enter the place I used to call home. The lobby is exactly as I remember it. A checkerboard floor made of large black and white marble tiles imported from Italy. The hefty walnut desk is the same, although the doorman behind it is different. His name tag says Robert, and he seems to be in his mid-forties with a thin gray mustache. Ms. Shoby, he says. I nod. He motions to the elevator bank. They're expecting you. I ride to the penthouse in silence. My family occupies the entire building in one way or another. The top three floors are our apartment, and everything below is where the staff lives, bodyguards and cooks and accountants and anyone else my father deems necessary to the Rose family. Only our personal servants live upstairs. 
The elevator opens with a ding, and I knock gently on our door. It swings open, and I see Magdalena, my mother's maid, who helped raise me. Her gray hair is thinner than I remember, and her face is more wrinkled. She smiles at me and pulls me into a hug. Miss Kiki, she says. Come in. I don't remember Magdalena ever being friendly enough to give anyone a hug, but then again, times have changed. She shuts the door behind me, and I look around. It feels like stepping inside a museum. The decor is exquisite, of course, from the French chandelier that hangs above the foyer to the sweeping, expansive staircase that leads to the second floor where the bedrooms are. The living area has a wall of glass that opens onto a wraparound terrace. Somehow, the view of Manhattan in here is even better than it was on the bridge outside. Miss Melinda and Mr. Rose are upstairs, Magdalena says. Would you like a drink? Water? Coffee? No, I say. Thank you. She turns to leave. It is good you came to say goodbye, she says in a soft voice. We will miss you. The farther I go into the apartment, the more I realize it's in slight disarray. The window sills are dusty, and there are suitcases piled up next to one of my father's favorite statues, a bronze piece nearly eight feet tall of a boy pricking his finger on the thorn of an English rose. I feel my chest tighten as I remember the life I left behind. Kiki and Benny and the girls from school, waking up early and making chocolate chip pancakes with Davida, though my parents would have punished me if they'd seen me cooking alongside a servant. The parties my parents used to host, when the apartment would fill with laughter and music and white tuxedos and luxurious, brilliantly colored dresses woven from mystic-infused thread. I remind myself of other things. Being handcuffed to my bed so I wouldn't escape having my memories wiped by my own parents and my marriage arranged, proof I was nothing more than a commodity. My father killing an innocent man right before my eyes to teach me a lesson, the sound his body made when it fell into the canal. No, this isn't a joyous trip down memory lane, I tell myself. You're here for one thing only, information. Claudia? I look up. My mother is standing on the second floor, peering over the iron railing. She forces a smile. You're here. I am, I say. She waves me upstairs. A flash of memory fills my mind. My engagement party. How nervous I felt as I gripped the banister and Kiki led me into a room overflowing with people and roses to meet my fiancé, Thomas Foster, who, it turned out, loved me as much as I loved him, which is to say, not at all. It's nice of you to stop by my mother says. She seems rushed, not as put together as usual. Her platinum blonde hair hangs down past her shoulders instead of being pinned into an elaborate updo. She's wearing a simple navy blue dress and no makeup or fancy jewelry, just her wedding and engagement rings. Johnny's in the library. You said it was urgent? Her eyes dart wildly around the apartment, and I imagine she's far more concerned with what she can fit into her suitcases than with whatever her daughter's former best friend has to say to her husband. I'll only be a moment. She gives me a simple kiss on the forehead. I force myself not to recoil. Goodbye, Claudia. Give our best to your parents. We'll see you soon. She turns and hurries back into her bedroom. I press my fingers to my forehead. I can't remember the last time my mother kissed me. I pass my bedroom and resist the temptation to peer inside. I don't want to think about the dozens of gowns in my closet, hand-sewn silk flown in from Paris and Milan and Vienna, dresses that represent exorbitant wealth and excess. I don't want to think about the jewels and the mystic comforts that my upbringing brought me, comforts that many people suffered for so a few could enjoy. I don't want to think about my brother's room next to mine how we used to laugh together and fill our amuse-me's with music that annoyed our parents, until one day we stopped being friends and started being strangers. I wonder what Kyle saw in Benny and his friend Danny that he didn't see in me. I don't want to think about Davida, who used to roam these halls not only as my maid, but also as my friend and confidant, whose heart now fills my chest and whose body lies somewhere in a canal, rotting with the fish. Instead, I head toward my father's library, which is next to his bedroom. Outside the door, his tattooed bodyguard, Clartino, stands watch. I'm here to see Johnny, 
I announce. Clartino says nothing in response, simply presses the touchpad on the wall. The door slides open, and I step inside. The library is just as I remember it. The walls are painted a rich, glossy lavender and covered with built-in bookcases. Normally, I'd say the color is feminine, but somehow, accented with black leather furniture and a glass desk, the room manages to be one of the most masculine spaces I have ever seen. When I was a little girl, he would let me pick one of his old-fashioned books each night, and he would read to me. I never understood what he was reading. Johnny Rose wasn't one to read children's books, but his familiar voice soothed me to sleep. My father looks the same. Exhausted, but the same. He's wearing a suit of cream-colored linen, his dark hair slicked back. The neck of his white dress shirt is open, and his cufflinks, lapis lazuli ones I bought him three years ago, poke out from his sleeves like tiny turtle heads. Kiki, he says. The deep, gravelly tone of his voice startles me. When was the last time I heard it? I remember the brief period when I worked in his office, when he told me that we were the same, the two of us, that I was destined to succeed him, to run Manhattan myself. He was on top of the world that day one of the most important figures in the entire city, even if he was a high-powered drug runner. Surely you didn't come to say a simple goodbye, he says, strolling toward the wall of windows that gaze out onto the Hudson. You were always a good girl, flighty but sweet. Thank you, I say. You understood your place. How to take orders, he smiles. Those are valuable traits, especially now. He motions to a chair in the corner of the room, covered in dark, shiny leather. Would you like to sit? I'd rather stand, I say. I won't be here long. If you come to ask where I'm going, my father says, you made a pointless trip. But you are leaving, I ask. He chuckles. Of course. <laughs> Didn't you see all the suitcases? You of all people must sense something is off. Of course, I say. But I find it hard to believe. The West Side, the city, they're so important to your family. I'm surprised you would let that all go. My father has his back to me. Silently, he peers out onto the water, pressing his hand to the window glass. He leaves it there and then draws it downward, making a screeching sound that is absolutely unsettling. Manhattan's over, he says, more to himself than to me. I'm sorry. He turns around his eyes troubled. Sometimes you have to take stock of what you have, he says. In business, when you make a decision, you have to think about the future. You have to have a plan to compare the relative costs and outcomes of possible courses of action. How does that apply to a city, I say, to millions of people? He shakes his head, as if he's disappointed that I don't understand. I'm not worried about them, he says. I'm worried about me. I've decided that the cost of remaining here is too high for the rewards. He sighs. So I'm getting out. I've already transferred my assets outside the city. And I suggest you and your parents do the same. What about Kyle? I ask. There's a split second when my father looks like he feels something. Remorse? Regret? At the mention of Kyle's name. But then it's gone. Let Kyle have his little toy until he breaks it. He walks over to his desk and takes a seat in his leather chair. I'm done. I watch as my father closes his eyes. I worry he's going to tell me to leave. About Kyle, I say. Do you know where he is? My father opens his eyes, blinks, wets his lips with his tongue. No. Any idea at all? I ask. I need to speak with him. My father tilts his head, stares at me inquisitively. No. It's just that I've heard that Manhattan is going to be invaded by Philadelphia. My father offers no reaction. And? And don't you think we, I mean, Kyle should do something? If I could just talk to him, I think I could help. Slowly, my father arches his eyebrows. Since when do you care about politics? My chest begins to flutter. Can he see through the glamour? I don't. Not really. I'm just curious. Curious, my father repeats. 
Hmm. Unexpectedly, he rises from his chair. Do you like this picture? He motions to an oil painting of a young girl in a field, surrounded by cornstalks. I always thought it was an odd painting for someone like my father to keep in his library. I figured it reminded him of another simpler time. It's very nice, I say. But, Mr. Rose... It's mystic art, he says. Which isn't my thing. But Melinda wanted it because a friend of hers got one and loved it. She said the colors were richer. You know, she's right. About Kyle, sir? I take a step closer. I really need to know where he is. Sometimes, when you study this painting, I can swear the little girl moves. My father stares at me with his empty, deep-set eyes. Kyle always loved this painting. That's great, I say, but I think you should go now, Kiki. I take a step back. That's it? I'm being dismissed. Mr. Rose, I say, it's really important that I reach Kyle. If you could simply put me in touch with him, then... I feel two large arms wrap themselves around me, lifting me off the ground and carrying me out of the apartment into the hallway. I struggle against Clartino's grasp, but it's no use. He's too strong. I glance over my shoulder at my father for what I imagine will be the last time. This is when I realize that even now, as he's leaving, he still runs the show. Kyle is only front and center because my father wants him to be. Goodbye, little girl, he says. And then Johnny Rose closes the door. Chapter 10 It's okay, Turk tells me as we hurry from my old apartment building. I want to get as far away from my father as possible. We'll figure out another way to contact Kyle. We head toward a pod station, which will take us back to the depths. There's so much resentment inside me toward my father that I just want to lift off and crack into the sky like a firework. But the truth is, I don't feel so well. My head is throbbing, and I'm sweating uncontrollably, my stomach twisting itself in nervous knots. The only comfort I have is Turk's hand in mine. I failed, I tell him. I got nothing from him, Turk. Nothing. The most he talked about was some stupid painting. It's all right. Turk says calmly. Everything will work out, I promise. The bridges are more hectic than when I went to see my parents, not even half an hour ago. There are dozens, maybe hundreds of families rushing along the silvery Aries bridges to the light rail stations, hauling luggage that clinks and clanks against the pavement. Fathers are carrying their children on their shoulders, running as if they're being chased. It almost feels like the depths, with nervous chatter filling the air. Aries dwellers are fleeing. But where are they all going? The energy force field over the Aries has grown. It drips down from the clouds, low enough that I can make out the asparagus green glow beginning to touch the tips of the tallest skyscrapers. Up close, it pulses in a way that reminds me of the light posts where the drained mystic energy is stored. At the rate it's been growing, it will only be a few days at most before this shield covers the entire Aries. The force field is taking shape now. I can see that it's not just green energy coloring the sky. It's like a massive bubble that's spreading out over the Aries and beginning to pinch inward below us, at an angle that will cut the Aries off completely from the depths. The air fills with the sound of helicopters, the richest Aries dwellers providing their own escape. The others? Once they make it down to the depths, what will they do then? Walk out of the city across the lower bridges? Surely Kyle's soldiers will prevent them from leaving by boat. And even if they do succeed in leaving Manhattan, how do they know troops from Philadelphia aren't lurking across the border, waiting to attack? They don't, but they seem willing to take a chance. They're scared, I find myself saying. Turk takes in the scene around us. Can you blame them? No, I say. I guess not. I'm angry, I realize. At my parents? At my brother? at myself, for not finding a way to stop this, for not reaching a truce with Kyle, for falling in love and not understanding soon enough what really matters. Life. My legs ache, and I stop walking and rest against the railing. Don't you see what this means? That everyone wants to get out of the city, Turk says. Yes, I say, because they don't trust Kyle. Turk scratches his head. Where are you getting that from? 
If the people trusted him, I say, they'd be staying. They'd be confident he would protect them. Look around. We stare at the crowds. Maybe if my father had been the one giving the instructions, people would have listened. But they don't have the same faith in Kyle that they do, that they did in Johnny Rose. Turk's eyes light up. We can use this. If we convince people that we'll fight for them, they'll come to our side. Exactly, I say. But it means not fleeing. We have to convince Hunter and Shannon to spend their time rallying everyone in the depths to fight back. It's the only way we can win. We need to find Kyle and get him to stop this once and for all. But why not help the weaker mystics escape? Turk asks. Don't you think Hunter has a point? We can protect them, I say. We just have to focus all our energy, all our manpower on finding Kyle right now. Are you with me? Turk leans down and kisses me. Around us, the mystic force field bathes everything in its greenish glow. Turk's eyes glint in the darkness. I press my hands to his cheeks, tracing his lips and nose, the metal piercings in his ears and his eyebrows shimmering like constellations against a midnight sky. You're changing, Turk whispers. I think about how foreign my family's apartment felt, how strange it was to speak to my parents, how I'm standing here with Turk instead of with Thomas or Hunter. I am changing. I'm different than I was before. I know, I tell him. I'm not my father's political puppet anymore. I'm me. Yes, Turk says. But that's not what I mean. I mean you're changing, literally. I pull away from him and watch as my fingers blur together. My nails shrink. The hair on my head largely disappears. My breasts shrink. My legs lengthen. My body twists and molds itself like taffy. I scream in agony. It feels like I'm being eaten alive. Are you okay? Turk asks nervously. Are you? The pain is too intense for me to speak. I feel breathless. Say something. Turk shakes me gently. Anything. I take in as much air as I possibly can. I... A boom echoes across the Aries, like two gigantic cymbals crashing together. I recognize the sound immediately. An explosion. Then we hear the screams. Turk yanks me down to the ground, covering me with his body. Don't move, he whispers. I gaze up. At first, all I can see is a blaze of light. Red, white, yellow, and orange flames, the smoke billowing into the sky. There's nowhere for it to go. The force field deflects the smoke back down, creating a fiery cloak that will soon smother us. The heat is intense. I hear the wailing of sirens as thousands of feet race past us. Go, I whisper. What? Turk says over the roar. They need you more than me, I say. Go! I'm not leaving you, Turk says in a low growl. Please, I say. Help them. Find out what's happening. I can feel Turk breathing, his ribs expanding against my back. He stands up and pulls me to my feet, locating a part of the bridge where the railing juts out, almost like a small awning. Okay, Arya, he says. Together we rush over to the side of the bridge, and I crouch underneath the covering. But you have to stay here. He presses his lips to my ears. Promise me you'll stay right here. I'll be back as soon as I can. I whisper, I promise. And he rushes off. I sit for a minute, propped against the metal railing of the bridge, catching my breath. I can see exactly what happened now. A skyscraper a few blocks away has burst into flames. The glass windows have exploded, exposing its inner workings. If I squint, I can make out bedrooms and kitchens, some of them on fire, and many with people huddled inside. I glance down toward the depths, where flames are licking the sides of the building and shooting up to the Aries. I'm betting the explosion started in the depths. If we're not able to kill the fire down there, it will only get worse. Because of the force field, as the smoke rises, it will continue to be trapped in the Aries. Even now, just minutes after the explosion, it's so smoky that it's hard to breathe. I lean over and rip off the bottom of my dress. The fabric tears easily, and I wrap the material over my mouth, creating a mask to filter some of the smoke. On the next bridge over, I see a group of men dragging a long, thick fire hose from the back entrance of the building that's ablaze. I look for Turk, but don't see him. Staring down, I realize my two touch-me's, mine and Kiki's, have fallen to the ground. I pick them up and begin to panic, using mine to send a text to everyone I can think of. Turk, Hunter, Shannon, Yarrick, Rhea. 
Outside my parents' apartment building. Need help. Bomb. I type as quickly as my fingers will let me. The intense heat and the chaos surrounding me have made me feel like I'm about to faint. I can barely keep my eyes open as crowds continue to rush by me. Stay awake, I tell myself, pinching my legs. Don't fall asleep. I don't want to risk being trampled, or worse, being accidentally kicked off the bridge. Then I hear the soldiers. It's too dark to tell if they're mystic rebels or Kyle's men, or even invaders. I bring my knees to my chest and huddle in a crouch, close to the railing, as man after man after man passes by, each with a gun strapped to his back, many yelling orders. They're here to help, I think. But I soon realize this isn't true. Back away from the building, one of the soldiers hollers, speaking into a megaphone. I turn my neck and realize he's speaking to the men with the fire hose. Back away from the building, the soldier repeats, or you will be shot. You want us to let those people die? A man yells back. What are you doing to help? There are more screams in the background, more cries. Despite my makeshift mask, I'm choking on the thick black smoke that is circling the area, coughing so hard I fear I might rip open my throat. No one seems to notice or care. This is your last warning, the soldier says. Back away from the building. I don't hear a response, but then I hear the worst sound imaginable. Gunshots. No! I hear a woman cry. Please! The gunshots continue. I feel sick. You want us to die? A man shrieks. More soldiers move past me, marching who knows where, and I glimpse the rose insignia on their uniforms. They must be my brother's men, and they're obviously not here to help, which must mean that Kyle is behind this explosion. With all my strength, I reach for the spindly bars of the bridge and grab on. For some reason, my legs are so weak I can barely stand. Painfully, I pull myself to my feet, my arms slung over the railing. I wince as my head explodes in sharp pangs, like someone is stabbing my brain with a knife. And then I see her. Davida. Do you love him? She asks me. We're in my bedroom. I think. Or are we right here on this bridge? It's impossible for me to tell. The images swirl together like memories of memories, wispy snapshots I can't hold on to. Davida stares at me with her huge brown eyes, her long dark hair cascading down her back. I snap out of the memory. All around us people are screaming. Save us! Help us! Thomas? I say. I don't know. I don't think so. Davida's dark brown eyes are brimming with tears. No, not Thomas. Hunter. I think back to that night on the roof, all those weeks ago, back when Davida was alive and I was still living with my parents, when Thomas and I were engaged, when Davida saw me kissing Hunter. Or was that tonight, and I was kissing Turk? There is so much I can't explain, I find myself saying. I don't even know Hunter, not really, and yet there's something between us. Something that makes me feel as if I've known him forever. I try to touch her, but there's only air. Is she really here, or is she just a ghost? Another explosion. In front of me is the skyscraper with its sides blown away, its lower floors in flames, and it seems to be falling, tipping, like the world's largest domino. I glance around for Davida, but I don't see her. And where is Turk? And then I see more flames as the roof of the skyscraper just east of the damaged one blows up, breaking into a million pieces that fall like deadly rain. Behind me, people rush, screaming to find safety. The smoke is everywhere, in my eyes, in my lungs. I blink to clear my eyes and watch as the eastern skyscraper leans toward the right. If it goes any farther, it will surely crash into the next building. And what then? Will that one fall into the building on the other side? Now both buildings are burning. If I don't do something, the skyscrapers are going to topple into one another, falling in a line like dominoes. I glance down at my hands. The green has almost reached my wrists. Power, I think. I have the heart of an incredibly powerful mystic inside me. I try to remember my all-too-brief training session with Yarrick and Shannon. I focus on my hands and fingers, willing them to life. I extend them before me and reach. And then it happens. Ten filaments of green energy explode from my fingertips, each no thicker than a needle and about a foot long. 
I shake my hands and watch them grow, thickening and spiraling outward. I squeeze my fingers and the filaments braid into one thick ray for each hand, two light swords that I raise into the sky. My feelings for Hunter are real, I find myself saying. Is it love? I don't know. Maybe. I'd like it to be. Then I will protect you both, Davidus says, for as long as I can. Her tears are gone, but her eyes are filled with dark emotion. She seems on the verge of saying something else, but then she brushes her black curls behind her ears, glancing away. How will you protect Hunter? Davidus swallows. I will protect him the only way I know how. With my powers. I can feel my blood pumping, Davidus' heart coming alive inside me. My body crackles with electricity, like I've been struck by lightning. And then I shoot. The building to the left, the first one bombed, is collapsing. People are jumping from the open floors into the depths. I must save them, I tell myself. I must help. I extend my left arm behind me, like a pitcher winding up for a throw, and then I let go. My arm shoots forward, and so does the ray of braided energy, flying in front of me like a fishing line. I flick my wrist and watch as the mystic energy lassoes the building, wrapping itself around the exterior once, then twice. I let out a wild cry as I do the same thing with my right hand, creating another lasso that soars into the sky, cutting through the smoke and targeting the second building, which, without a roof, is crumbling from the top, floor by floor. I pull my left hand in and watch as my lasso stops the first building's downward slide before it crashes into its neighbor. I keep pulling with every ounce of strength I have, and slowly the building begins to straighten. Meanwhile, on the right, my rope of energy spreads out over the building's face, keeping the windows from falling off and crashing into the depths. I will protect you both, I can hear Davida say to me again. Only this time I see her face floating before me. There is no body, just her head. Davida? I whisper. She smiles at me. Hold on, Arya, she says. Help is on the way. I squeeze my eyes shut, and her image disappears. I focus on one thing, keeping the energy flowing from my fingertips. I feel like meat on a stick, roasting on an open fire. Sweat and tears trickle down my cheeks. My arms feel like they're going to fall off. I can't do this any longer. A voice inside me is saying, I need help. Help me. Help is on the way. I hear Davida's voice say to me again. And then I hear another voice. Aria. Hunter's rich baritone fills my ears. It's me, he says, and I feel his hands on my arms. Let go. And I do. Chapter 11 I close my eyes and stillness washes over me. I'm able to forget the heat, the smoke, the screaming and shouting and crying. Hunter is behind me and it's almost as if I'm flying. My heart warms in my chest, and I relax. I feel no pain, just lightness, as if I'm a feather, free, easy, fearless. Then I open my eyes. Hunter's chest presses against my back as he leans forward, green rays pulsing from his fingers. Don't move, he says. The rays from his fingers have woven themselves into the lassoes I created, and we're both supporting the skyscrapers. Sweat from his forehead drips onto my neck. Aria! Yarrick calls out, standing at the opposite end of the bridge. You okay? I blink, taking in the scene. When did Yarrick arrive? Shannon is standing on the bridge next to him, her hair even redder from the flames. Energy explodes from her hands in long green spindles that she weaves together, creating a net which she flings in the direction of the first skyscraper that exploded on the west whose glass facade has nearly fallen off completely. The people inside have stopped jumping, waiting to see what will happen. Many of the fleeing Ares dwellers have paused to observe the rebel mystics. Do they understand what we're doing? Shannon's net lands on the tip of the skyscraper and falls down over the facade, helping to steady it. Don't let go just yet, she shouts at us. I won't, Hunter shouts back. He groans. Amid the black smoke, I see a blinking white light. 
At first, I think it must be reflected from something, but then I recognize the familiar chrome wheels of a motorcycle. Turk. Thank God. The engine roars as Turk surges forward. He raises one of his arms high in the air, draws it back, then releases, loosing incandescent rays of energy that streak through the sky. The rays thicken and bleed together into one long band that wraps around the eastern skyscraper, the one with no roof, steadying it and ensuring that it won't topple into the adjacent towers. I think we did it, Hunter whispers behind me. I think so, too, I managed to say, keeping my eyes and fingers on the scene in front of me. Davida's power still blazes out from my body, though Hunter is controlling it now, and I feel even weaker than before. Davida, was she really here? I could have sworn I saw her, spoke to her. But it could have been a memory, a recollection of when I told her about my love for Hunter. I breathe in Hunter's familiar scent, now mingled with smoke and debris. Davida gave up so much for us. And for what? Hunter and I aren't together anymore. He's with Shannon, and I'm with Turk. Right? I hear a cackle of glee in midair, where Turk's mystic-powered bike hovers just above the top of an Ares bridge. Arya, Hunter says, are you with me? My arms begin to shake from the energy still flowing from my fingers. I know I have only seconds before I pass out. With you, how? Hunter starts to say something, but I can't make it out, because one of the buildings we're supporting, the skyscraper with Shannon's energy web still covering its facade, begins to fall again. Only, somehow, it has changed direction as it breaks apart. It is no longer going to crash into the adjacent skyscraper. The people there will be safe. Instead, it's coming right for us. Run! Shannon screams. I can't hold it! There's no time to think. I can't run. I can barely move. Shannon's web disappears in the blink of an eye. Hunter's lasso is the only thing around the building, but the center of gravity has shifted, and I'm staring up at this beast of metal and steel and glass and concrete. Nothing, not even our combined mystic powers, will keep this skyscraper from collapsing. Furniture falls from the sky, crashing into the bridges and falling into the depths. The sound mingles with the scream of steel and the cries of hundreds of people. Remember when your father discovered me in your room? Hunter says. When Kyle ratted us out and he tried to kill me? Yes, I say. We're going to do that again. Just hold on to me. He flicks his wrists, and the energy he's been holding evaporates. I feel something. Relief, as my own energy dissipates as well. The damaged building begins to crumble even faster. I look around for Shannon and the others, but I can't see anything. It's too smoky. Then Hunter wraps his arms around me and gives me the tightest hug imaginable. Above us, a huge chunk of steel plummets toward our heads. I think, this is it. It's over. And then there's a whoosh, a slight change of air pressure, a tingling sensation through my body as we drop through the steel base of the bridge and into the air below. I almost forgot. Hunter can walk through walls and drop through ceilings. My heart lurches in my chest as we fall. Hunter lets go of me with one hand and aims it upward, creating a line of energy that latches onto a window in the center of a nearby skyscraper with a pointed top. His energy sticks to the glass like some sort of mystic glue, and we swing out of the way of the bridge we were just standing on as it breaks in half and falls into the depths. Hunter! I cry as we're about to swing right into a wall of mirrored glass. Watch out! At the last second, he switches the direction of his hand, propelling his rays onto another building diagonally across from this one. For a second, we're in free fall, but then we swing toward the new building, and I realize that Hunter has everything under control. He's going to get us out of this alive. He has a plan. It feels like we're flying. I suppose that's because, in a way, we are. Hunter and I sail from building to building, swerving around the metal bridges and light rail stations, as crowds of people watch, cry, and scream into the night for the skyscraper we were unable to save. I don't want to think about all the people inside, or those caught in the path of the falling building. About Shannon, Yarrick, and Turk. For a second, all I can picture is the last plummet party I attended, at which rich people in the Aries gathered to drink and cheer as old dilapidated buildings crumbled into the depths. Back then, it was a sport, a spectacle. Now it's life and death. 
We move so quickly through the sky that it's difficult to tell where we are or where we're heading. Unlike me, Hunter isn't tentative with his energy. He knows what he's doing. He swings and spins us through the air like we're acrobats in the circus. His arms around me feel normal, natural, and his breath warms the back of my neck. Eventually, we swing onto the rooftop of a skyscraper farther uptown, near 130th Street in the Hudson River. Hunter falls first, hitting the roof on his back and catching me in his arms. There's a thud as we both collapse. I can't believe we're safe. We're alive. Are you okay? I ask him. Yes, he says between gasps, wiping his forehead. Are you? I nod. Yes, you... I trail off, getting lost in his ice-blue eyes. I feel confused. Faint. Thank you. I'm not sure what else to say. You don't have to thank me, he says, his chest heaving. Yes, I tell him. I do. I can feel his heart beating wildly. I press my hand, now a uniform, dark green, over it. You didn't owe me anything. I owe you everything, Hunter says. I always will. His words remind me of the old Hunter, the one I fell in love with, before the lies and the betrayal, before he put the revolution above all else. You just saved my life. I smile tentatively. So I guess we're even. I love you, Arya. Even if we're not together, Hunter says. Even if we never will be. I never want to see you hurt. I stare at Hunter and whatever anger I felt for him fades away, like it never existed. I want to ask him about Shannon, but somehow it doesn't feel right. It's been so long since Hunter and I have been together that I just want to savor the moment. Remember our notes? Hunter asks, smiling. Of course, I say, thinking back to all the letters we wrote, professing our love. Romeo and Juliet, we called ourselves. And look at us now. I miss you, Hunter says. I miss you, too. I tell him, and it's true. I miss his companionship, his laughter, how he seemed to know what I was thinking. But there are also things I don't miss, I say, thinking of the recordings of me he used as propaganda, how he was consumed with revenge for his mother so there was no room for anyone else. I look into his blue eyes, and it seems like maybe now there is room for someone else. Only it isn't me. Do you ever wish you could just rewind life like a movie? Hunter asks me. Go back to the past? I think about the life I used to live, full of parties and clothes and superficial things. Then I think about the life I live now, how I'm fighting for justice and freedom, how I'm actually doing something, or trying to. No, I say. And it's the truth. Hunter considers this. Yeah, me neither, I guess. Well, except for my mom. I nod, acknowledging Hunter's loss, which is so much greater than my own, in spite of everything. Yet that is all I feel. Empathy. I don't want to lean over and rip his clothes off. I don't want to be comforted in his arms. My desire for Hunter used to be like water gushing from a faucet. Steady, strong, unrelenting. But now it's as though the faucet has been abruptly turned off, and I couldn't turn it back on, even if I wanted to. Hunter was my first kiss— my first love. But we grew apart somehow, and now it seems like forever ago that I was madly in love with Hunter Brooks. I don't yet understand how you can know someone so intimately that the world revolves around him, and then he's gone, and the world keeps spinning. I glance up at the sickly green sky. It's less smoky here, but I can still hear the faint wail of sirens. I can't help but envision all the people caught nearby, searching for their loved ones and their belongings, simply trying to make it through the night. I see that between them, the smog and the force field have covered all the stars. I pray that my friends are all right, that they escape the scene unharmed. I press my hand to Hunter's cheek and lean in to kiss his forehead. And then I collapse. A gunshot goes off. I can hear it from my bedroom, where I'm writing in my journal. The first thing I think is that Arya has been hurt. I hide my journal and rush out of my bedroom. Arya's door is open, and her father is inside with his bodyguards, Stixon and Clartino, and Patrick Benedict. Kyle Rose, his face an angry tomato red, holds a broken piece of lead pipe in either hand. Where'd she go? Johnny Rose yells. 
How can you just disappear through the floor? He slams his fist against the wall of Arya's bedroom, punching a hole in the plaster. White specks fly everywhere. She must have gone with him to the depths, Kyle says to his father. We need to follow them. I'm the one giving orders here, Johnny says. Not you. So far, no one has noticed me. I creep back down the hallway, out of view, where I can still hear their shouting, but have little chance of being seen. There's a crash from down below, in the living room. Aria! I hear Melinda Rose cry. What in the Aries? Thomas Foster and his parents are downstairs with Mrs. Rose. I think what Hunter must be planning. Surely he'll escape the building with Aria, then head to the depths and go underground, if he makes it that far without being caught. I remember my promise to Aria, that I would protect her and Hunter. It seems the time has come for me to follow through. I hear the men tramp down the stairs and Mr. Rose call out, Get him! Sounds of a scuffle fill the apartment, and I tiptoe downstairs. I don't see Aria or Hunter. Johnny, Mrs. Rose says nervously, what's going on? I can't tell if she's genuinely concerned for Aria's fate, or simply embarrassed that this is happening in front of the Fosters. Her husband runs his hand through his slick black hair. Sticks in, Clartino, he snarls. Mobilize a team. Follow them as fast as we can. We'll track them by foot and by boat in the depths. This ends tonight. I listen as they make calls and prepare to follow Arya and Hunter. I remain unnoticed because I am a mere servant. Who pays attention to me unless they want something? The Roses have more manpower, but Hunter knows his way around. And I do too. If I can get down there, if I can warn them of what's coming and help distract the Roses, maybe I can save my friends' lives. I run back into my room and change. I throw in a pair of black leggings and some sneakers Arya gave me for my birthday two years ago. I tack a hood to the neck of my black uniform shirt to cover my head. I find the lacquered wooden reliquary my mother gave me as a reminder of where I come from. Ripping a page from my journal, I jot a note to Arya, slip it inside the reliquary, and seal the box. Then I write her name on another paper and attach it to the top, burying the reliquary at the bottom of my closet. I hide the journal, and I make my escape. I beat Johnny's men to the nearest pod and, thanks to my gloves, make it to the depths with no problem. It's nearly midnight, and the streets are quiet, which makes it easier to listen for the loud footfalls of the soldiers. The canal is dotted with a handful of gondolas. I duck underneath the broken awning of an old pawn shop, hiding in the shadows until I see a cluster of Johnny Rose's goons on the corner. Boats! One of them cries. Where are the boats? I don't see any boats, but I sure hear them. Sirens screaming through the night air. Covering my ears, I creep along the edge of a row of shops, staying just behind the soldiers. This way, one of them calls, and they rush forward along the canal in the direction of downtown. I can only assume Hunter and Arya have been spotted. I see the boats now, nearly as large as city gondolas, red and blue police lights spinning atop the cabins. I follow them on the sidewalk, making sure to keep my head lowered. Up ahead, I hear gunshots reverberating off the walls of brownstones. Not a good sign. The canal to my left feeds into a longer, wider canal, which runs perpendicular to where I am. Two of the police boats pull up to the nearest dock. The surrounding street lamps wash the area in a dull, white light, just enough for me to make out two familiar figures in the distance, Arya and Hunter, surrounded by Johnny Rose's men. Then I hear Arya scream. I watch as the gunmen surround her. One of them grabs her by the arms. She kicks and tries to maneuver out of his grasp, but she can't. Hunter! she cries. Aria! he calls back. It takes three men to subdue him. I watch as one of the men shoves a gag into Hunter's mouth. I see Stigson point to one of the police boats as Clartino places a bag over Hunter's head. This is when I realize they are going to put Hunter on a boat and probably kill him. I act without thinking. While the gunmen are focused on Arya and Hunter, I drop to my knees and creep toward the line of police gondolas at the edge of the canal. The sharp gravel hurts my palms, but I keep going. I'm nearly positive that Stigson pointed to the last boat in line, empty save for its driver. I look up, making sure they haven't moved. Then, like a rabbit, I hop onto the back of the boat. I wait, silently, in case someone saw me. But all I hear are the shouts and cries from the street. 
quickly, I open the hatch and drop below decks. It's pitch black. I can't see anything at all. I feel along the floor and find the nearest wall, stumbling over boxes. I press myself against the wall as though I could disappear into it. And then I wait. I think about Arya, my friend, who treats me like a sister. About Hunter, my betrothed, who loves me like a sibling. The son of Violet Brooks, the mystic hope. He is whip-smart, funny. Together he and Arya could change the world, or at least Manhattan, make it a better place for the poor and mystics alike. Stop the drainings. Fight for equality. If Hunter dies, all of that will be lost. The Roses will lock Arya away and steal her memory again, and she'll forget about Hunter, about their love. I don't want that to happen. Quickly, a plan begins to form. And then Hunter is dropped through the hatch to land beside me. I hear footsteps above deck, and the boat's engine roars to life. Hunter, I whisper. His entire body jerks. Who's there? It's me, I say. Davida. Davida? I hear the surprise in his voice. What are you doing here? I slip off the bag covering his head. It's so dark down here that I barely glimpse his piercing blue eyes against the mass of black. Saving you, I reply. You have to get out of here, he says. They're going to kill me. They put me in quicksilver cuffs so I can't even move. Not if I have anything to do with it. I reach out for him, grabbing his T-shirt and pulling him to me so we're face to face. I can smell the sweat and rain on his skin. There are at least three men in this boat with us, I whisper. So don't make a sound and stay still. I watch his eyes as I feel for his hands, locked in the cuffs. Quietly, I curl the fingers on my right hand into a ball. Green energy begins to circle my wrist and spiral forward, slicing through the handcuffs. Davida, Hunter whispers, what are you? Shh, I say, then quickly switch a few pieces of identifying clothing. Thankfully, he's too weak from the quicksilver to protest. And then the real work begins. I think of Hunter, of his beautiful face, of how when he glimpses Arya, his entire body fills with joy and love and life. There were so many times I wished it was me he looked at that way, but he never did, and now he most certainly never will. I grasp his hand in mine and feel the familiar tingle of my energy taking over, my skin shifting to take on a new glamour. Not many mystics are gifted with this power. I used to think it was a curse. Now I realize it's going to save Hunter's life. A soft hum runs through my limbs, zipping through me and then evaporating. I glance down at my hands. They are Hunter's hands. I touch my face. Hunter's face. I squeeze Hunter's hand as I transfer my energy into him, as I turn him into me. I have never used my glamour to mask another person before, just myself. It had better work. I stare at him and gasp. Hunter stares at himself, at his new fingers, his new body. Davida, Hunter says. Only it is my voice that comes out of his lips. I stare at his eyes, no longer blue, but brown. My eyes. What have you done? They're going to come and take me, I say. Steering Hunter behind the boxes, I nearly tripped over. You will not say a word or make a sound. They will take me, and you will stay here until morning when it is safe. You will keep my glamour as long as you can. Only reveal yourself to Arya when the time is right, when she has unlocked her memories and is able to understand the truth. Do you hear me? Hunter groans. Don't do this. I lean down and kiss him gently on the lips. The only kiss I will ever get. It is already done. I pick up the broken handcuffs and seal them around my wrists. For a moment I feel my powers wane because of the quicksilver contact but I grit my teeth and place the bag over my head. And then the hatch opens, and I am yanked up roughly by my shoulders and tossed onto the deck. Stand up, mystic, a man says, kicking me in the stomach with his boot. The blow nearly makes me vomit, and I bring myself to my knees. I said, stand up, he yells again, pulling the back of my shirt into the air and ripping the bag off my head. I search for Arya and locate her on the street, her father standing next to her pointing a gun at her head. He says something to her that I can't hear, and then I feel metal at the back of my skull. You're about to die, mystic scum, the man behind me says. Any last words? Sure, I think. 
a million. I never gave much thought to dying. That seemed like what old people go through. But at seventeen years old, I haven't really lived. I served in the Rose household with the promise that when I came of age, I could leave and return to the depths to marry a hunter. That never happened. What did happen was that I saw firsthand the way people lived in the Aries, the inequality between rich and poor. I thought all along that simply feeding information to the rebels to my family was my role. But now I realize that this is the difference I can make, the ultimate sacrifice. This is the legacy that will make my parents proud of me. When they learn what I have done, they will realize I was with them, on their side, and that I did my part to help my people. I only wish I could say a proper goodbye to them. Aria, I say in a low, hushed voice, I am about to die. My body will fall into the canal and drift away. You must find it, and you must find my heart. When you do, it will open my reliquary. Follow the instructions I have left for you inside. They will help you and Hunter achieve your goals. Do not let much time pass before you find a sister. She will be the only one who can save you from certain death. Goodbye, Aria. The last thing I see is Johnny Rose raise his hand into the air. There is a flash of light and the report of a gun behind me. And then I see the most beautiful fireworks I have ever seen, outrageous bursts of vermilion and tangerine and turquoise and lavender and pink fill the sky, dancing wildly against the black night. Inside the sparks I can see Arya's face and Hunter's, and the faces of my mother and father. It looks like they are smiling down at me. My heart swells with love, and I feel like I'm falling, falling, falling. Part Two There are causes worth dying for, but none worth killing for. Albert Camus Chapter 12 When I wake up, my head is throbbing, and I don't know where I am. I see a desk and a white closet with a thick wooden door and a black doorknob. Then I feel something cold and wet on my forehead. Good morning, Rhea says. Oh, I say, sighing with relief. It's you. I blink and realize I'm back at the mystic hideout, in the room I share with Rhea and Shannon. I'm in bed, tucked underneath a clean-smelling white sheet and a green and pink striped blanket. I feel around my neck for my heart-shaped silver locket. It's there, thankfully. I grasp it in my palm and squeeze. Just me, Rhea says, sitting at my side. She wipes my forehead with a wet cloth, then dabs it on my cheeks and above my collarbone. How do you feel? Like I've been run over by a gondola, I say. Or like a huge piece of a building fell on my head. Well... Rhea says. Let's not think about things like that, okay? She seems better than the last time I saw her. She's wearing a neon pink cami and a long denim skirt that flows to the floor. There's more color in her cheeks, and the gauze over her left eye is gone, leaving a black eye patch covered in crushed crystal. Although she's healing slowly for a mystic, she is healing. She almost resembles her old self. I notice you're staring at my eye patch, Rhea says. Do you like it? I nod. It's shiny. Duh, she laughs. That's what I was going for. How's your eye? I ask. Gently, she touches the patch with two fingers. It's still there, for now at least. But enough about me and my gorgeous eye patch. She wrings out the washcloth over a metal bowl, then hangs it on the side. We've all been worried about you. Worried? I ask. Why? First off, she says, you've been asleep for two entire days. What? No. Yes, Rhea says emphatically. Two days. Do you remember what happened? There was an explosion, I say. Buildings falling. I remember trying to stop them by myself and everyone showing up to help. You collapsed on a rooftop with Hunter, Rhea says. He brought you back here and a nurse from the triage center stayed with you all of yesterday. She gulps. We weren't sure you were going to make it. Don't be silly, I say, pushing myself up on an elbow. My body cries out in pain. Everything aches. I'm fine. You're not fine, Rhea says. I should know. But at least you're alive. At least we're both alive. She leans down and picks up the bowl and washcloth. 
I'm going to let the others know you're awake. Everyone will be excited. The other skyscraper, I say. The eastern one, the second one hit. Did that fall too? Rhea grabs her cane and rises to her feet. Just get some rest, Aria. You'll be up and around in no time. She walks steadily toward the door frame, one foot in front of the other. I'm glad you're okay, she says over her shoulder. I'm glad you're okay, I reply. She smiles, then disappears from view. Two days, I think. I was asleep for two days. I can remember bits and pieces of what happened the night of the explosion. How I met Kiki, then went to see my parents. How two skyscrapers went up in flames, and I sent Turk away, then tried to stop the buildings from falling and killing all the people inside them. The memories start to crystallize. Hunter showing up and helping me. The building nearly falling on us. Hunter dropping us through a bridge. Saving me. I wonder how much damage was done in the Ares. How many people died? If Kiki and her family, Benny, Danny, even my parents are alive. And what about Shannon, Yarrick, Turk? I sent Turk off to be a hero, when all he wanted was to stay and take care of me. Did he get out of there alive? I remember seeing Davida on the bridge, or thinking I saw her, and then her memories of the night she was murdered come flooding back. She knew I would find her body and swallow her heart. She predicted the future, more or less. She knew that I would inherit her powers and use them. Then I remember the last thing she said, that I would need to find a sister or I'd die. I lift the blanket and stare at my hands. There's no more of my natural skin color left. Everything is green, like someone dipped my hand in a can of paint and let the color streak down. At my fingertips, where the discoloration began, the skin is a dark forest shade. It changes toward the middle of my hand to something slightly lighter, like an avocado or an artichoke. And then, at the wrist, it's lighter still. Someone put me in a white cotton T-shirt that smells clean, like vanilla laundry detergent. I lift the bottom and see that the green starburst in my chest has expanded, the spider-like veins creeping up toward my neck and down toward my stomach. It doesn't take a doctor to realize this can't be a good sign. I don't know why, exactly, but I start to cry. Not in a loud, wheezing way, but my vision gets blurry as I think about Davida dying for me and Hunter. How she never got to say goodbye to her family. How she put the greater good above her own personal happiness. She gave her life for me and Hunter to be together. She thought that with our love, we could give the mystics and Manhattan a new beginning. And look at us now. Hunter and I barely speak. We're not together. He told me he'll always love me. I remember that now. But he must have meant as a friend. Otherwise, why would he have kissed Shannon? In a way, we have succeeded in changing the city. But life is not better. The Ares and the Depths are at war, and we're about to be attacked by some foreign city. My parents are fleeing along with many others, and my misguided, hateful brother is in control. This isn't the Manhattan Davida envisioned when she made her sacrifice. I owe her more than this. I owe her the best city possible. Aria? Turk is leaning against the doorframe, his face etched with concern. Why are you crying? He steps into the room and sits down on my bed. His cheeks are freshly shaven, exposing his angular face and square jaw, his Adam's apple peeking out from just above the collar of his slightly wrinkled button-down shirt. The fuzz on his head has begun to thicken. It's darker than his hazel eyes and gives him a brooding, dangerous appearance. I failed her, I say. Failed who? My nose starts to run. Davida, I failed her. Turk stares into my eyes. You didn't fail her, he says. She loved you. The old me, I say. Look at me now. I show him my hands and the patch of green on my chest. Something's not right. I need to see Hunter. You need to see Lyrica, Turk says sternly. Like I told you days ago, the nurse who was here yesterday was concerned about you. We need to get you help. The sister, I say to Turk, remembering Davida's last words to me. I need to see a sister. It was in my dream. Well, not a dream, exactly, but, but it was Davida. I saw her the other night on the bridge. You saw her? Turk says in a surprised voice. I don't think it was really her, I say. More like a memory or a vision, but she said I needed to find a sister. 
I glance up at Turk. Can you help me? They're all dead, Turk says. All except one. I've been looking for her, but I've had no luck yet. Lyrica is our best hope to find her. Then take me to Lyrica, I tell him. And I need to speak to the people of Manhattan. Turk shakes his head. You need to get better. You need to heal. You don't need to hold a press conference, Arya. That's crazy talk. I feel fine, I say, attempting to get up. Really? I have to make up for what I did at the rally, how I stumbled. An image of the burning skyscrapers fills my head. I know what to say now. One step at a time, Turk says calmly. First Lyrica, then Hunter and the people, okay? He bores his eyes into mine, and I can't turn away. Okay. Good, he says. But you have to eat something. Get your strength back. Okay, I say again. Then I remember something. Turk, what about... I can't bring myself to say the names aloud. You mean Shannon and Yarrick? Turk smiles. They're all right. And Daria, he says, anticipating my next question. Your parents' building is fine. I smile back, relieved and suddenly very hungry. A few hours later, there is food in my stomach, and I'm feeling a little better. On my bedside table, I discover both touch-me's, Kiki's and mine. Mine survived the explosion. Hers burned to a crisp. I pocket the one that's working, then finish getting ready to leave the hideout. Turk and I use a loophole to travel to the depths, heading toward Columbus Avenue, outside the Magnificent Block, where I encountered Lyrica for the first time. Once we're on the street, Turk hails a gondolier. The man, an older man with a washed-out face and a long black beard, pulls his boat up to the side of the canal. Turk gets in first, then offers me his hand. You don't ever want to fall out of one of these, he says as we sit across from each other. Canal water? Nasty. I don't bother reminding him that I swam in the canal not too long ago when I was searching for Davida's heart. I feel my scalp and wonder whatever happened to the platinum blonde wig I wore back then. The motorized gondola moves quickly through the rippling water down the Broadway Canal. We pass a half-empty public water taxi and a slew of gondoliers, their boats tied to the docks. They're smoking cigarettes and glancing around nervously, as if biding their time until something awful happens. It's late afternoon, and the streets should be full of movement, but the west side is more like a ghost town, shutters closed, people hiding indoors. We pass dozens of empty stores, their windows broken, their signs faded. Those skyscrapers, Turk says, they killed thousands of people in the depths when they fell. I shudder at the word thousands. Did the second one fall too? Turk nods. Lots of people were injured. The triage centers are overflowing. People want out of the city, out of the depths, he says. Only now the bridges are all blocked. Kyle's men won't let anyone leave by boat. They're stuck. What about Hunter's plan? I ask. To get some of the mystics out through the East River, underwater. It might work, Turk says, scratching his chin. For a few people. But it's not a solution for the masses. We have to figure out something else. And quick. I direct the gondolier to turn left and head down a narrow waterway. The buildings here provide more shade and relief from the sun. I don't see any numbers, Turk says, squinting in the morning light at the old crusty buildings, the canal littered with garbage. The doorways we pass are blocked off from the public, the gates locked and rusted. Neither do I. Gross. Turk points at the mucky brown-yellow algae that clings to the buildings and floats lazily in the water. He reaches over and grips my hand. His touch is warm, comforting. He stares at me, and I can feel myself melting. There is no one in the world I would rather look at disgusting algae with than you. Thanks, I say. How sweet. We ride in silence for a few minutes, and then I locate a familiar-looking dock. There, I say, pointing to a rickety post. The gondolier mumbles something, then throws a rope over the post and pulls us to the canal's edge. Turk takes a couple of coins from his pocket and drops them into the man's hand, then stands up. Careful, I say. He laughs. Careful is my middle name. Or maybe it's John. I forget. With a jolt of energy, he hops onto the street and extends his hands to help me out of the boat. Thanks, I say. Every time we touch, it's like the first time. Turk makes me remember a younger version of myself. Back at Florence Academy, when I would text messages to Kiki about how much I wanted a boyfriend. Back then, I wanted so desperately to be in love. 
but I never imagined what it was really like and how different it would be than it is in the movies, first with Hunter and now. Turk bats his long lashes at me and motions in the direction we need to go. I loop my arm in his and we begin to walk. In this part of Manhattan, the brownstones are old and covered with grime, but they haven't been bombed to smithereens. Wow, I say to Turk. Look! Remnants of old campaign posters are visible on some of the buildings. One is torn in half, leaving just the letters Faust and Roe. A few blocks later, we see a poster of Violet Brooks, Hunter's mother. Turk steps up to it, running his fingers along the dirty paper. Violet Brooks stares out at us in a navy blue wrap dress, her blonde hair shiny and healthy looking. This is from when she was running for mayor against Garland Foster, Thomas's older brother, when she had a chance to win, when she was still alive. She was a good woman, Turk says. She practically raised me. I stand next to him. She was a great woman. Yeah, he says. She was. I scan the line of poster remnants. Most are covered with graffiti or soot or torn in half or ruined from the weather. Then something catches my eye. The words Philadelphia is coming on the corner of another old poster. What do you think this means? I say, pointing out the scribbles to Turk. He shrugs. People write weird stuff on posters all the time. Once I saw a poster of you and Hunter with devil horns and the words hellish love. He elbows me gently. Just kidding. I mean, I'm not actually kidding. I did see that, but... Rhea mentioned to me that someone in the triage center told her the rebels in Philadelphia had some sort of plan, I say, still staring at the old poster. Do you know anything about that? Turk shakes his head. But I don't have any connections there. We can ask Hunter the next time we see him. Come on. Together we step onto a major road, where a series of bridges crosses the wide canal circling the magnificent block, or what's left of it after the bombings last month. All of the bridges except one have fallen apart. I see a few tenement roofs peeking out behind a crumbling stone wall. To my left, outside the magnificent block, is a row of brownstones. Once upon a time, they might have been architectural gems. Oversized windows with ornamental carvings are positioned over the street, some of which have balconies that were once decorated with sculpted balustrades and iron latticework. Only now the balconies have crumbled, and any remaining fanciful details are mostly destroyed. The colored paint on the brownstones is mostly stripped, and the large cracks running through the facades make me wonder how sound these homes are structurally. Just like the rest of us, these buildings are struggling for survival. Where is it? Turk says, searching in vain for 481, the number of Lyrica's house. I did the exact same thing when I first came here, when the mystic Tabitha at Java River told me to follow the lights to find the answers to my memory loss. They led me to Lyrica. She helped me, guided me. Her house is invisible to the naked eye, much like the mystic hideout. Unlike the hideout, it appears only to those whom Lyrica chooses, mystic or not. Also, her house isn't tied down to one specific place. It moves. That's how she protects herself. Is she here now? As I've done twice before, I press my fingers to the space where 481 should be. The brick is rough beneath my hands. I draw an imaginary line with my index finger. I wait for the buildings in front of us to part, for a small brownstone with orange stucco walls and two large front windows to appear, for red candles to flicker in the windows, and for Lyrica to open the door and invite us inside. Aria, she'll say. What took you so long? Nothing happens. There is no orange house, no groan as the buildings draw apart to reveal their secret. Where is she? Turk taps his foot on the pavement. Something's off. This isn't good. I'll check the mailbox, I say, and go over to a cracked black mailbox the next house over while Turk searches in the opposite direction. The second time I visited Lyrica's home, she left instructions in this mailbox for where to find her, but it's empty now. I look around for anything, a sign, to point me in the right direction. Nothing here, Turk calls out. I glance back at where 481 should be. Something's wrong, I say. Something's wrong with Lyrica. Didn't you speak to her? A few days ago, Turk confirms, but not recently. Do you have her touch me number? I ask. Turk frowns. That's not how she communicates. She left word for me to come and find her. She should be here. There's a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Unless something happened to her, I reach into my pocket and take out my touch-me. 
I'm calling Rhea. Only before I do, I glance down at the screen and see another message waiting for me, again from a private number. Kyle is behind the bombings. There will be more. Save yourself. Kiki was telling the truth. I know she didn't send this because I have her touch me. Someone else is trying to warn me. But who? Chapter 13 Something wrong? Turk asks as he types a number into his phone. I'm trying to get a hold of Shannon. Maybe she can help. I look up and smile. Nope, I'm fine. Just worried about Lyrica. If I tell him that someone is sending me messages, he'll get worried. And I don't want to burden him with this. Besides, they're not threatening. They seem to be from someone who wants to help me. I'm certain the messages aren't from Kiki. But I'm no closer to finding out the source. Whoever it is knows that my brother instigated those Ares bombings. If that news got out, that my brother initiated an act that killed hundreds of his own people, Rose family stalwarts, and put thousands more at risk, surely he would lose many supporters. Which means that whoever is sending me these messages wants Kyle to lose support. Somebody close to him is ready to betray him and help our cause. Now I just have to find out who that person is and get him to join us. Turk is standing on the corner, chatting with Shannon and most likely telling her that we can't find Lyrica. As he does, I key Rhea's number into the Touch Me screen. She picks up immediately. Is everything okay? We need to find Lyrica. I hear Turk say to Shannon. Any ideas? Rhea tells me that she doesn't know where Lyrica is. I'm sorry, Arya, she says. Let me ask around. I'll be back in touch if I find out something. A moment later, Turk clicks off his phone. His eyes are hazy, his expression unreadable. Shannon doesn't know where she is, he says, but she thinks we should check the triage centers. There's one nearby. The thought of Lyrica in a triage center, fighting for her life, makes it hard to breathe. Okay, I say. I grab Turk's hand for strength, and also for comfort. Let's go. The triage center here makes the one I visited with Turk in Madison Square Park seem like a five-star hotel. There, numerous white tents had housed mystics and human poor alike, tended by doctors and nurses who never seemed to stop running. A bipartisan hospital, Turk had called it, a place where people in the depths could go to receive medical attention after most of the actual hospitals had been bombed out. It was a dismal place, that triage center, but there was still a sense of hope. The tone here is harsher, sadder. We find the center in a cave in Riverside Park, hidden from the view of the Rose soldiers posted by the water. It's the sort of place you wouldn't stumble upon. You'd have to know where it is, which, thankfully, Turk does. The entry is blocked by a few large dead bushes, the bare branches covered with empty soda cans, syringes, and other garbage. Careful now, Turk says, as we duck behind the bushes and through an opening in the rock that is almost like a tunnel. The stone scratches my forearms as I follow his lead. There's a bit of light coming from inside, where the tunnel opens up into a large circular space, almost like an outdoor amphitheater. Doctors in stained clothing rush in and out of flimsy-looking tents, a strange sight underground. Some of the patients simply rest on the ground, leaning against each other for support. A nutty, minerally smell fills the air, likely from all of the blood. There are no IV stands or medical instruments in sight. There is just chaos. Excuse me, I say to a nurse who pushes past me. Can you? She's gone before I can finish my question. Turk takes my hand and leads me to a small huddled group of men and women in ripped clothing with no shoes. They appear beaten and bruised. One woman's arm is in a makeshift sling, and a man's head is wrapped in bloody gauze, reminding me of Rhea's eye. Have any of you seen a woman named Lyrica? Turk asks. Only a couple respond, shaking their heads. We move on to a small tent with four sets of metal bunk beds. At least two people are sandwiched into each narrow bed. On the top bunk next to me, three young boys are piled in together, their faces dirty and sticky with dried blood. At the far end of the tent, a young man with a white mask over his mouth is tending to a patient in a bottom bunk. Doctor, Turk says, approaching him. The man notices us. Yes. We're looking for a woman named Lyrica. The doctor laughs and lowers his mask slightly. You think I know everyone's names? I'm just trying to keep them alive. Of course, Turk says. It's just that... 
I hold up one hand. It's okay, I tell him. I step forward, approaching the doctor so he can see who I am. Then I hold up my green hands, and he gasps. Even here, with people dying almost every minute, I am something new. My name is Aria Rose, I say. The doctor nods. I know who you are. The mystic we're looking for has long gray hair, and she's very powerful. If she's here, it's because she's in a bad way. He can't seem to take his eyes off my hands. Like I told your friend, he says, I don't know anyone by name. We're doing the best we can here, but... He glances at me, then at Turk. If your friend is here, she's likely in one of the tents. That's where the worst cases are. Thanks, I say, turning to leave. It's slightly cooler once we're outside. Part of me hopes Lyrica is here so that we can see her, but another larger part of me hopes she isn't. Because if she is here, surely it means that she can't heal herself. And for a mystic as powerful as she is, that's catastrophic news. Turk and I weave in and out of the remaining tents. It's a miserable scene, overflowing with badly injured people and not enough caretakers to go around. We help where we can, administering cups of water and bits of food to help patients keep up their strength. The nurses don't seem bothered by our presence. I think they're grateful for the extra hands. Turk shows me how to use our energy to heal superficial cuts and bruises. We work diligently together, side by side, in the heat, sweating through our shirts. Seeing him care for the injured makes my heart swell with pride. As a mystic healer, Turk must be miserable in not being able to do more. But we can't help everyone. With every bleeding human or mystic, especially the children, I curse my brother more. He must be stopped. We have to win this war. Lyrica is nowhere to be found in the first grouping of tents, all of which overflow with burn victims, people who lived in or near the skyscrapers that fell. I give silent thanks that apparently my parents were not among the victims. Even though they're terrible people, they're still my parents. I wouldn't have wanted them to perish like that. Of course, no one deserves to die in such a way. The people in this triage center are not just residents of the depths, people who, according to my brother, are too poor to matter. There are Ares dwellers here, too. I recognize some of the faces, the expensive clothing that is singed and torn into rags. That's the thing about money. It's not everlasting. In these tents, everyone is equal. Well, we're all the same, all in need of help. I wish my brother could see that. I feed apple slices to a woman who fell from the Ares and survived. A gondolier found her floating face up in one of the canals and brought her here. She tells me that she's well enough to leave tomorrow. And she's considered lucky. Eventually, we make our way through all of the tents with no sign of Lyrica. There's only one remaining. I open the flap and promise myself that if Lyrica isn't here, we'll go to another triage center and another until we find her. It's possible that she isn't in a triage center at all. Maybe she's left Manhattan or, the thought makes me shudder, simply doesn't want to see Turk and me. Or maybe she's one of many victims who haven't been found or identified. Aria, Turk says behind me. Look. His handsome face is sweaty and tired, but I can tell he's happy to be here working, helping, doing good. I see six people laid out on metal cots. The coiled springs squeak with every small movement. Standing off to the side is a nurse wearing latex gloves and a white mask, her hair tied back in a ponytail. We're looking for a woman named Lyrica, I say, a mystic. She has long gray hair, and she's old. I don't know how old, but we're worried she was hurt in the explosion. Is she here? The nurse points to the bed on the far left. Turk and I step over to it and stare down at the patient. I can't even tell if it's a man or a woman. The eyes are closed, and the skin is black, oozing with pus and covered with blisters. I can see a bit of where this person's lips used to be and the nostrils, which are stuffed with oxygen tubes. An IV stand, the first one I've seen, is next to the cot. I... I can't tell, I say to Turk. Can you? Turk shakes his head. I don't think we should wake up, whoever this is. Softly, I lean over the figure. Lerica? I say gently. Is that you? There's no response. It can't be her. I grasp for Turk's hand. It just can't be. Turk frowns at the nurse. This isn't our friend, he says, but thanks. 
The nurse stares at the burn victim and lifts her mask. She didn't come in with the others from the explosion, poor thing. Her apartment was set on fire. They found her crawling in the streets. I'm not sure she'll make it through the night. How awful, Turk says, turning to lead me out of the tent. But something about this person makes me want to stay. Lyrica, I repeat. Is that you? It's me, Aria. Still no response. Turk studies me sadly. I know you want to find her. We'll keep looking. I nod in agreement, not saying anything. The thought of this being what is left of Lyrica makes my stomach churn. I'm about to leave when I hear the faintest sound. I watch as the eyes flutter open. I recognize those eyes. Aria. Lyrica croaks, her voice so faint and raspy it sounds like it's been mixed with gravel. I gasp. I have been waiting for you, she whispers. Chapter 14 Lyrica I drop to my knees at her bedside and scan her features. Her toffee-colored skin is burned beyond recognition, covered with ugly swirls of tomato red and bright orange and ebony. Parts of her are simply charred. Her long gray hair is mostly gone, singed off. This inert body bears no similarity to the mystic who welcomed me into her home, who helped me rediscover my lost memories, who helped me fight against my family. I would grab her hand if I didn't think it would hurt her. Are you in pain? I ask. Lyrica looks far worse than Rhea ever did. Turk moves toward the far end of the tent where the nurse is and whispers something to her I can't make out. Yes. Lyrica's voice is so faint I can barely hear it. I bring my face as close to hers as possible. I am so sorry this happened to you. She attempts to speak again, but produces only a gurgling sound, like she's choking. Turk reapproaches the bed with masks and gloves for us. They had dressings on her before, but they've left her skin open to expose it to the air. The nurse says her skin will form a scab that, if she survives, will fall off in two or three weeks. In that case, the skin underneath should be minimally scarred. A key phrase stands out to me. If she survives. There must be something more we can do for her, I say. What if we bring her back to the hideout? I don't think she could endure the transfer, Turk says softly. Why don't you talk to her? Ask her how she's feeling. She can barely speak, I say. The idea of Lyrica just lying here, slowly dying, is too much to handle. Stay calm, I tell myself. Freaking out isn't going to help anyone. I'm sure that's because of the morphine, Turk says. Nurse, I call. Is everything possible being done for this patient? This time, the nurse doesn't lift her mask. The patient is being cared for, she says in a monotone, just like everyone else. We're doing the best we can, Ms. Rose. I'm sure you are, I say. I didn't mean to imply... The nurse has already stepped away to tend to another patient. I wonder if she blames me for all of this death and destruction. I turn back to Lyrica, speechless. Talk to her, Turk repeats. Even if she can't talk back? He places a hand on my shoulder. It's probably a comfort to hear your voice. I crouch next to Lyrica and rest my gloved hand on the edge of her cot. Lyrica? I whisper. Can you hear me? There's no response. I recall the first time I met Lyrica, when she let me inside her townhouse and I took in the rich smell of cinnamon, the oriental tapestries that covered the walls, the charcoal hieroglyphics she must have drawn herself. How she raised her thick eyebrows at me and said, How does one lose one's memories, child? That day, many weeks ago, I told her I had no recollection of my affair with Thomas Foster, I told her about the dream I'd been having about the boy whose face I couldn't see, about the love letters. I thought I was there for Lyrica to help me remember Thomas. Instead, she helped me uncover what my parents had done to me and recall how Hunter was the one I was truly in love with. And now she's here. I wish I could do something to help you, I say. Still, there is no movement from Lyrica, no further sounds. I look up at Turk, who squeezes my shoulder in support. Then... Unexpectedly, I see one of Lyrica's fingers twitch. The tawny-colored skin on her pointer finger is mostly unharmed. 
She bends it at the knuckle, then straightens it. Did you see that? I say to Turk. See what? She just moved her finger. She's in there somewhere, I think. She recognized me, and now she's moving. That's a good sign, right? Sure. Turk's voice is careful. But don't get your hopes up, Arya. It could just be a twitch, something she has no control over. Turk continues speaking, but his voice seems to fade away. I watch Lyrica's pointer finger, which bends for a second time, and straightens, almost like she's waving at me. She makes another gurgling noise. I think back again to our first meeting at her home. May I touch you? she asked me. That is how I work best. I glance up and see that the nurse's back is to us. She's leaning over a patient at the far end of the small tent. It's incredibly warm in here. I wish I had a cooling patch. Tentatively, I pull on the latex tip of my glove until I puncture a hole, exposing my own skin. Don't touch her, Turk whispers harshly. Her skin is too sensitive. She wants me to. How do you know what she wants? She can't speak. Shh, I say furiously. He rolls his eyes at me. Fine, do whatever you want. But if something bad happens, don't say I didn't warn you. I'm going outside for some water. I watch Turk leave and turn my attention back to Lyrica. Then I reach over and press my finger to hers, letting our skin touch. As soon as it does, a surge of energy passes through my body, shooting up my arm and into my chest. Aria, she says. Lyrica? On the bed, she remains the same. Still. Her eyes are closed, and her lips are pinched together. The oxygen machine next to her makes a soft whirring sound. The brief beeps of her heart monitor remind me that she's still alive, still fighting for her life. They came for me, Lyrica says in a rich, smooth voice, though there's no movement from her lips. I was protecting her, and they came for me. Protecting who, I wonder. The burst of energy has dulled to a warm glow. I study the way our fingers meet. Are you? Yes, she says to me, speaking to you in your mind. I look around, but the nurse has moved on to another patient. No one is paying the two of us any heed. Our energies have connected, Lyrica says. They are compatible. Or should I say, Davida's energy is compatible with mine. Even though Lyrica isn't making eye contact with me, I feel embarrassed. With one simple touch, she knows what I've done, that I've ingested Davida's heart, that I possess her mystic powers. There are no secrets from Lyrica, even now. I am not well, child, Lyrica says to me. You'll get better, I say out loud. They came for me, Lyrica says again in my mind. Who came for you? And I was weak. You are not safe. A small bubbling sound emanates from Lyrica's lips, like she's trying to speak out loud. I wonder again what she meant when she said she was protecting someone. Of course I'm not safe, I whisper to Lyrica. There's a war about to erupt. You are not safe, Lyrica repeats. The heart, what you have done, you must undo. Undo? I can't. I already swallowed it. I say in a low voice, You are sick, no? I think about the pounding headaches I've been having, how whenever I use Davida's powers I grow weak or even pass out. I study the green tip of my finger. Lyrica is right. Something is terribly wrong with me. It is the heart, Lyrica says. It is too much for one person. It is killing you. I may be getting sick, but dying? How can that be? But Davida told me to eat it. She wouldn't have done that if she knew it was going to hurt me. Davida was wise, but she was young, Lyrica says. And I remember that the last time I saw her, she told me my responsibility was to return the heart to Davida's family. She lived much of her life in the Aries. There were things she simply did not know. The heart comes with great power, but that power is poison. You must remove the heart, Arya, before it is too late. I don't respond. If I remove the heart, even assuming I can find out how, I'll no longer be a mystic. Do I really want to give that up? 
I think about how I was able to harness my energy to save lives in the Aries when those buildings began to fall. And Kiki told me that my brother is using stick again, that he practically has powers of his own. If I get rid of my powers, how can I ever help beat him? I need to find him and discover what he's planning, then either convince him to stop or make him stop by sheer force. And the memories, David has passed. I would lose those, too. I can't, I find myself saying to Lyrica. My brother is behind the mystic shield over the Ares. I need to stop him. I can't remove Davida's heart until I've done that. If you wait much longer, Lyrica replies, the heart will have been absorbed completely, and there will be no turning back. Now is the time, my child. Even if I wanted to remove the heart, I say, how would that be possible? The sister, Lyrica says. You must find her. How? I ask. The sister. She is your only hope, she tells me. Watch. The view before me shifts. I see a quick succession of images. A long, sharp knife with a bronze handle. A glass tube full of silvery liquid mercury. A large metal chair with leather straps at the arms and neck. Spinning tendrils of green mystic energy. The pictures are there and gone in milliseconds. I try to slow my mind, to reach out and grab an image so I can examine it, but it all moves too swiftly. A girl with long white hair that billows behind her, a bloody mystic heart beating in the palm of my hand. Davida. Hunter. Turk. I see myself in a room bathed in white, pure white marble that covers the floors and walls and the ceilings. I see Turk's handsome face as he kisses my lips, the flash of a knife, and blood. Lyrica's voice echoes in my mind. You must die to live, she says. And the images fade into nothing, like water on a hot sidewalk. They fizzle into steam and mix with the air, and they are gone. And I am here, in this tent, staring at Lyrica. You must die to live, I hear her say again. What can I do to help you? I ask Lyrica. How can I make things better? You can't, child. This is my penance for what I have done. I stare at the woman in front of me, who is so full of goodness. What could she possibly have done to deserve death? What are you talking about? I ask. I don't understand what she's saying about penance, or that I must die to live. Lyrica is suddenly overtaken by a coughing fit. The nurse rushes over, and I withdraw my hand from the cot, hiding it behind my back. I'm sorry, but you'll need to move, the nurse tells me. I stand up and watch as she huddles over Lyrica, adjusting the oxygen machine. Lyrica's entire body convulses, then goes still. From the corner of my eye, I see Turk enter the tent with two paper cups full of water. He spots me and comes to my side as the sounds of the heart monitor change. Instead of many small beeps, there is one long one. The nurse walks around the cot over to the machine. What's going on? I ask. Is Lyrica okay? I wanted to speak to her, Turk says anxiously. I wanted to. He's drowned out by the blaring noise from the machine. He grabs my gloved hand in his. The nurse's back is to us. I watch as she reaches over to the monitor and turns it off, silencing the long beep. Then the woman turns to us and, in a sad voice, says, Lyrica is no longer with us. Outside the tent, there is chatter and movement, people rushing to and fro. There is life. But Lyrica is gone. It happened so fast, I say to Turk. We discard our latex gloves and masks and make our way out of the triage center. One second we were talking, and then... Talking? Turk blinks at me, shielding his eyes from the sun with one hand. What do you mean you two were talking? I can't explain it, really, I say. We touched, and I could hear her, like she was speaking to me inside my head. She said that she deserved to die. What do you think she meant? Turk looks puzzled. I have no idea, but it was probably the morphine and whatever else they were giving her. He sighs. Lyrica was the last of her kind, a truly powerful mystic. She will be missed. Will they do a ceremony? I ask. With her heart? When a mystic dies, to honor him or her... Loved ones each ingest a piece of that person's heart in some sort of religious circle. I'm not sure of all the details. 
It is the ceremony that I denied Davida at her request, though I still feel guilty about it. I'm not sure, Turk says. The way things are right now, will you make sure, I say, that there is a ceremony? Please, it's important to me. Turk doesn't hesitate. Yes, he says. Of course. We're now in the fringe of Riverside Park, which is less of a traditional park full of greenery and shrubs, and more of a thin stretch of open land, the sun-scorched earth making everything appear yellowy and tan. Kyle's soldiers are still positioned along the Hudson River. Even from where I'm standing, I can make out the shimmering red insignias of our family crest on the black uniforms. Where are we heading now? I ask. Another rally, Turk says. You want to speak, right? Yes. I need to redeem myself after the last one. No one would blame you if you want to go back to the hideout for a while, Turk says. You just lost someone you cared for. I'm fine, I say. I mean, I'm not fine, but I need to go to the rally. Lyrica's death can't be in vain. I understand, Turk says, and I can tell he truly does. Not wanting to call attention to ourselves, we sneak out of the park the opposite way from where the soldiers are, skipping over a thin bridge and heading toward the main canal. So, are you going to tell me what you and Lyrica talked about? Turk asks. She wants me to remove Davida's heart, I say. I don't tell him the rest of it, that I need to die before I can live, whatever that even means. He'd freak out. I already told you that, Turk says. The heart is dangerous. She said I have to find a sister. As I say this, I can sense something come over Turk. I don't know what it is exactly, but his mood shifts. He seems uncomfortable. What? I say. He stares at me strangely. What do you mean, what? Are you keeping something from me? I say to him. About the sister? Together, we approach the West End Canal, and Turk places two fingers in his mouth and lets out a piercing whistle. It catches the attention of a gondolier up ahead, standing in his boat and smoking a cigarette. He nods to us and begins to untangle his rope from the dock. It's just that I tried contacting the last sister already, Turk says. I told you that. Lyrica was the one who helped me send word out, and no one ever responded. I asked her to come to Manhattan and help you. She never came, though. Turk's face is full of frustration. I can see the anguish in his dark eyes, how he believes he's failed me. His lips pinch together in a sour frown. Never replied. Nothing. Lyrica knew that. So if the only way to help you is to find a sister? He trails off, but I know what he's thinking. The last sister could already be gone which means that Davida's heart will stay inside me. And, according to Lyrica, I will most certainly die. Chapter 15 We are here for peace, I tell the crowd of hundreds, and those are only the people I can see. I am standing at a podium in Liberty Park Plaza, a small open space in the financial district that's packed with men, women, and children, Mystics and humans both mingled together. Despite the heat, they have gathered to hear me speak and address the city about our future. I'm grateful for the second chance. My brother has positioned soldiers around the city, closing off the piers on the west side and the docks on the East River. As inhabitants of the depths, you know these are the city's largest entry and exit points. Behind me, Turk and Yarrick and a few other mystics watch over the crowd. I can't help but wonder where Hunter is, whether he'll show up. There are other rebels posted around the square, in case my brother tries something funny. I can make out a crew of cameramen, and I try not to look at my face on the nearby Jumbotron. There is no telling what he will do next, or what he is planning to do. I glance up and see the force field. From here it's obvious what's happening. The green mystic energy is covering the Aries from the top and sides, then flowing around the skyscrapers and under the light rail system and the silvery bridges, slicing across the sky like a treacherous knife. It is a dark, noxious green that reminds me of bile, of dead grass and what was formerly the magnificent block. It hasn't completely sealed off the Aries, but that is clearly my brother's plan. Once it does, what happens next? I urge you all not to panic, I say. Remember why we are here and what we are fighting for. Freedom, equality, peace. For all, not just the rich. I sweep my arms out in front of me. 
We are fighting for goodness. And that makes us better than my brother, than the people in the Aries who are fleeing Manhattan by helicopter. We cannot afford to be afraid, I say, because if we are, then we will lose this city. This is Manhattan, and I want to live here forever. I lean into the microphone. Don't you? A swell of cheers erupts from the crowd. Even in the suffocating heat, they are here, and they believe in what I have to say. The jumbotron shows people smiling and yelling their support. I wonder what the folks watching this at home are thinking. The jumbotron cuts back to me, and I continue. And now, I say, I will answer any questions you may have. Suddenly, I no longer see my face on the jumbotron. Instead, I see Kyle, dressed neatly in a dark suit and light blue shirt. His thick blonde hair is neatly combed, his skin smooth. He looks the picture of health, carefree. He is standing in front of a brick wall, and there are no windows behind him, so it's impossible to tell where he is. Hello, he says. I am sorry to interrupt you, but I have an important announcement to make. I can't help but snort. He knew I was speaking at a rally. That's why he chose this moment to make his announcement. I must inform you all that every exit to the city has been blocked. The camera pans out, and I see Benny standing next to Kyle. Her blonde hair is up in a chignon, and she's wearing an elegant silk dress the color of bright peaches and strappy heels. At her throat is a stunning necklace of perfectly matched natural pearls. She's gorgeous, but it's nearly impossible to find the glimmer that was always in the eyes of my former friend. I can see the crowd in the square react in fear. We're trapped, someone shouts. Please, I say into the microphone. Everyone must remain calm. This is for our own protection. Kyle says. The entire perimeter is now enclosed, which means my sister and the rebel mystics have nowhere to flee. We will capture them and make them pay for the destruction and devastation they have caused. Kyle's image shifts to the left of the giant screen. On the right, there is footage of me trying to save the falling skyscrapers in the Aries. The bright green energy surging from my fingertips is clear as day but the way the footage has been edited makes it seem as if I am causing the damage. It is my energy looped around those buildings, pulling and pushing them like toys. What he doesn't show are the bombs he set off that caused the buildings to crumble. The people in the square have fallen silent, watching. My sister says she is helping, Kyle says. But what is she really doing? Destroying everything we hold dear in the city. It's not true, I say into the microphone. What are you saying? It's not... That, Kyle says, flashing his white, white smile, is why I am happy to announce a meeting between myself and Reginald Cotter, the mayor of Philadelphia. Our two cities will be joining together, sharing our beliefs and goals. The camera zooms in on my brother so that no one else, not even Benny, is in view. His face takes up the entire screen. Mayor Cotter has agreed to help me rebuild Manhattan into the city it once was to regain our former splendor and position in the world. This is news to me. I've heard that we might be invaded, first from Thomas Foster, then from Rhea. Rumors are flying everywhere. But I wouldn't have guessed that Kyle would openly partner with another city. I would have thought him too proud, too eager to impress my father. But my father is leaving, is probably already gone, and the Aries are Kyle's to control. His toy until he breaks it, my father said. My touch-me, positioned just above my notes on the podium, lights up with a text. I glance down. The sender is private. The message says, Do not trust your brother. Carter will kill. The first part isn't exactly news, but the second part is, Is this man from Philadelphia, Reginald Cotter, coming to help our city or to destroy it? Whoever is sending me these messages must somehow have access to Kyle or to his intelligence— is it one of his personal bodyguards? Danny, his best friend? Our old servant, Magdalena? And, perhaps more important at the moment, who do I believe? A random person whose identity I don't even know? Or my own brother? Admittedly, a brother has done everything but announce his intention to kill me. Aria, it's over, my brother says now. We are victorious. In a matter of days, our Philadelphia colleagues will be entering our fair city to begin the process of rebuilding. 
Those of you who support us will be rewarded. This must be what the force field is about. It was never meant to protect Manhattan from invaders. Rather, it will cover the Ares, protecting the rich inside a mystic bubble so the soldiers from Philadelphia can come into the depths and do whatever they want. Bomb, raid, steal, destroy, kill. Give up, Arya, Kyle says. You have lost. Soon we will reflect upon this day as a new beginning for our city, a day of rebirth. I don't know what comes over me but I swiftly extend my arms toward the Jumbotron, uncurling my fingers and letting loose ten rays of explosive green energy that launch like missiles, spiraling directly toward my brother's face. And then Kyle's face explodes. The Jumbotron roars into flames, sparks of yellow and orange dancing in the air and bathing the square in a reddish glow. They shoot across the square like the aftermath of fireworks. I feel the blood inside me rushing and swirling and coming to a boil. I will not allow my brother to do this. I will not let him win. I breathe a sigh of relief and will myself to cool down. The energy that emanates from my body begins to fade, like water from a hose that has just been shut off. The flames subside, leaving the jumbotron black and cooked and hissing. The tension in the square is palpable. People don't know what to make of my demonstration whether to be encouraged or frightened. I glance back at Turk, who is grinning from ear to ear. That, I say calmly into the microphone, is what I think of that plan. It takes a second, but the crowd erupts into applause. The faces before me brighten and fill with a tangible, excited energy. I suddenly remember when Violet Brooks spoke to a crowd of mystics and humans about her plans if she was elected the first mystic mayor of Manhattan. That never happened, but maybe I can live up to her legacy. This is what my brother will do, I say, motioning to the destroyed Jumbotron. Kill us all in a quest for power. He hasn't enlisted Philadelphia to help us. His plan is to bend us to his will or make us disappear. Well, we can't let him. Am I right? The crowd echoes its response. Right! Now, I say, letting myself breathe. My head is beginning to hurt, but I feel confident, in control. Who has questions? An hour later, most of the crowd has dispersed. The rally was a success, and Turk slips his hand into mine as we look around. That one will, he says. I know. How do you feel? I feel good, I say. The sun washes Turk's features with light, making his silvery piercings glint. I lean into his shoulder feeling his skin press against mine. His eyes seem to glow. I'm about to kiss him when I hear the sound of someone clearing his throat, and I spin around. It's Hunter. I register the surprise in his eyes, the blue of his iris is cold as ice. He isn't in gear of any sort, just a loose-fitting white T-shirt with a low V, exposing the tan skin of his chest, and a pair of grayish-white jeans, frayed and dirty at the hem. Hunter is scrappier than Turk. He always has been. Where Turk has bulging muscles, Hunter's is sinewy and coiled. Instinctively, I yank my hand away from Turk's. I see shock register on Turk's face, but he doesn't step away. Two best friends, and me in the middle. Can I talk to you for a second? Hunter says to me. Was he at the rally, somewhere I didn't notice him? Did he see what I did to the Jumbotron? Turk cocks his head. Is there something I can't know? No, Hunter says. I just... Just behind him, I spot Yarrick and Shannon chatting with two other rebels dressed in black fighting gear. When did Shannon get here? Did she arrive with Hunter? Fine, Hunter says, flashing his blue eyes at me. For a second, I remember what it felt like to be wanted by him, to be loved. How he used to stare at me like I was perfect. Is that how he looks at Shannon now? Shannon and I managed to get some mystics out of the city. Hunter looks around at the semi-deserted square. His cheeks are rough with blonde stubble, and his lips are chapped. Some children and drained women. A few boats. We sent them across the Hudson to New Jersey, where there were mystics waiting for them. That's good, right? I say. You got some of the children out. It's good you were able to get them past my brother's men. Hunter nods, but his face is full of concern. Except, he says, they never arrived. Turk's jaw drops. He's shocked. What do you mean? We should have heard from them by now, he says. 
that the boats we sent off never arrived in New Jersey, which means they were intercepted, I say, finishing his sentence. Now I understand the fear on his face. Together we stare up into the Ares at the mystic shield. It has reached the Ares bridges and seems to be flowing underneath them. Once it does, it could easily cut across the city, dividing Manhattan in half. High and low, Ares and depths, rich and poor, alive and dead. Philadelphia, I say, almost breathlessly. Hunter squints. What? My brother is joining forces with the mayor of Philadelphia, Reginald Cotter. Did you see Carl's announcement on the Jumbotron? When Hunter shakes his head, I ask, What do you know about him? Nothing, really. Hunter shrugs. I suppose he's another corrupt politician. What else is there to know? I think he's teamed up in some sort of plot against us. Maybe he's the one who intercepted the boats. I saw graffiti in the depths that said, Philadelphia is coming. Rhea told me that the mystics there were getting ready for some kind of attack. What if it's Cotter instead? I glance between Turk and Hunter, watching as they digest this suggestion. Could soldiers from Philadelphia be waiting in the river? holding off their attack until the force field is complete. I wouldn't put it past my brother to think of such a plan. We need to find out where Kyle is and how he's getting the energy for this force field, Hunter says. I checked into it, and whatever mystic reserves the city had are mostly used up. Look around. He points to a few empty light posts in the distance. The tall spires used to swirl with yellow-green energy. Now all I see is dusty glass. Since mystics haven't been submitting themselves to regular drainings, Manhattan has been relying on stored energy. I don't think there's enough to run the city and create this force field. Which means, he continues emphatically, that your brother is creating it with some other source of energy. So what should we do? Turk asks tensely. I can picture the wheels spinning in Hunter's mind. Arya, find out what you can. Any friends you have left in the Ares, go to them. I tried Kiki already, I say. But I'll see what I can do. And we need to discover everything we can about Cotter, Hunter says. We have to figure out what he and Kyle really have planned. Keep your touch me's by your side. I'll call when I've got something. How many people do you have? I ask, thinking about all of the rebel mystics Hunter has been organizing ever since his mother died. Just under five hundred, he says. That's good, Turk says, but it's not enough. I'm only getting started. Hunter says, a rise in his voice. He glares at Turk, like he wishes his friend weren't part of this conversation. How many people do you think my brother has? I ask. I don't know, Hunter says. It could be in the thousands. Why? If we start fighting now, before the force field is sealed, if we declare war on my brother and the Ares, could we win? I can tell by Hunter's expression that he's surprised at my suggestion, and I can't blame him. When we broke up, I told him he was too eager to fight, too caught up in taking down the Ares to see that there were other ways to win a battle, peaceful ways that could save lives. Only now I'm not so sure. My brother has us surrounded, and who knows what his allies have in store for us. At that moment, Yarrick and Shannon stepped toward us, infiltrating our tiny circle. What's going on? Yarrick asks. What are you guys talking about? I repeat my question to Hunter. He considers it. We'll be able to fight back, but not for long. Especially with Philadelphia on his side, Kyle would slaughter us. I realize how difficult this must be for Hunter to admit. I want to win, he says, but winning the war isn't worth sacrificing the lives of all the people who live here. His eyes sweep across the square. We need to save these people, Arya, the mystics and the non-mystics. We're in this together. I smile because I've been waiting for him to say those words for what feels like a very long time. You and me, I say. Together? We can do it. Um, excuse me, Shannon says. We're all in this together. Yeah, Turk says. All. Together. I know that, I say, leaning into Turk's shoulder. I watch as Hunter blushes and turns away. We're a team. I stare at this ragtag group, my makeshift family, a combination of many outspoken personalities. We fight, we love, we try to survive. I hope you're right, Arya, Hunter says, because otherwise. He doesn't finish his sentence. He doesn't have to. I know in my heart what he's about to say. Otherwise, we're all going to die. 
Chapter 16 I feel swindled. I watch as Hunter sets off to gather information about the invaders from Philadelphia. I watch as Shannon and Yarrick head back with the other mystics to help protect the depths from invaders, from Kyle. I want to do more than speak at rallies. I want to get back at my brother for blaming me for the explosions, for pinning his wrongdoing on my back. Kyle wasn't always bad. I know because I grew up with him. Something warped him, twisted him into a deranged, power-hungry maniac. He used to hate my father, and now he's become a carbon copy of Johnny Rose. Does he realize this, or is he too far gone to see the truth? I pull out my Touch Me and bring up this series of anonymous texts. It's a shot in the dark, but what options do I have for reaching Kyle? What is my brother planning? I type in. I need information. Plenty for your thoughts, Turk says. I didn't even notice him come up behind me. I click off my Touch Me and return it to my back pocket. If I agreed to that, you would be very, very rich. He approaches me, lifting my chin so we're eye to eye. Then he leans in and kisses me. I pull away. Turk, what if people see? Who cares? He shrugs. I want people to see. Again, he presses his lips to mine. Something crackles through my skin like a surge of energy. Are my feelings for Turk that intense? Or is it our mingling mystic energy, like when I first touched Hunter, though I wasn't a mystic then? My head begins to throb, and I push Turk away. Is something wrong? No, I say. I just don't feel great. It's the heart. He presses his palm lightly to my chest, above the green patch. Isn't it? The truth? I say. I don't know. Turk pulls me toward a concrete bench on the side of the square. The sun is still blazing, but everything looks like it's been filtered through a green lens. The sky is grayish-green, as is the water in the canal just behind us. What's on your mind? He says. Everything. He laughs. Start with a small piece. I'm so mad at Kyle I could scream, I say, clenching my fists. The throbbing in my skull has worsened. I rub my temples, hoping it will ease the pain. There are some things that are out of our control, like whatever your brother is up to, Turk says in a zen tone. The best we can do is be prepared to react. But I don't want to react, I say. I want to act, to stop Kyle. Davida gave me this gift, and I want to use my powers, her powers, to help. I watch as Turk absentmindedly plays with the silver chain around his neck. That's not a gift if it's killing you. I feel like I've been singed with a fire poker. Killing me? Isn't it obvious? Turk's shoulders slump, and he arches his eyebrows, making his eyes seem wider, more vulnerable somehow. You don't feel good. Your skin is turning color. That's what Lyrica told you, isn't it? That you're dying? He doesn't wait for me to respond. That's why she wants you to find the sister. But the sister's not here, are you? I can't find the right words. Well, we can find her. We can reach out. There's no one left to reach out to, Turk says, standing and rubbing his head. If he still had a mohawk, I'm sure he'd be pulling his hair out. He kicks at the ground, sending a chunk of dirt flying into the canal. Why are you getting angry with me? Because, Turk says, spinning around and stuffing his hands into his pockets. He peers down. I love you. All the breath is sucked out of me. For all that we've been kissing and holding hands and playing at being a couple, for all that seems so right with us together, I haven't thought about that one little word. Love. A word that can be completely wonderful or completely tragic. Sometimes both. Turk loves me? That was fast, I say. Don't you think? He shakes his head. Slowly, he lifts his gaze until we're staring at each other. The flecks of green in his hazel eyes stand out in the sunlight, and he's pursing his lips, which accentuates his cheekbones and sharp jaw. Turk is handsome, there's no doubt about that. No, handsome isn't the right word. At first glance, he seems devilish, wicked. His smile dances, and his tough guy attitude fools you into thinking he's dangerous, when really he's just a guy with a sweet heart. The tattoos on his arms seem to flicker and move with him. The color's bright and exotic and breathtaking. I notice one just inside his elbow. Seven tiny yellow stars outlined in blue in a small circle. It reminds me of the sketches on the top of Davida's reliquary 
and the paintings back at the mystic farmhouse of the sisters' lore. Seven women with powers, the creators of the mystic race. Now likely all of them gone. I gaze at the tattoos and realize there is so much I don't know about Turk. So much he hasn't told me. So much I want to know. I wanted you the first time I saw you, he says. You did? We were underground. You and Hunter were together in his old place, listening to music. You'd used the loophole to get there. I had no idea he wasn't alone, otherwise I never would have crashed your party. I remember hopping inside the subway car and seeing you there, with him. With him. He told me about you, that you were like no one he'd ever met. And I'd seen you in the news, but in person? He pulls me toward him. I press my cheek to his chest and feel his heart beating. My head hurts, but I feel safe here in Turk's arms. You were beyond stunning, he says, and kisses the top of my head. But you were Hunter's girl. You belong to him. I pull away. I don't belong to anyone, I say. I'm my own person. He presses his palm to his forehead. I know that, he says. I just mean you were Hunter's girlfriend. You guys were together and I was on the outside. And I watched, and I waited, and now it seems like maybe, finally, we have a chance. And I want you to stick around for that. I want to be with you, Aria, for real. A real couple, out in the open. He swallows. Do you want that, too? I think about what Turk has just told me. For most of the time that I've known him, I never thought of him as anything but a friend. I think about how he rode his motorcycle out of Thomas Foster's painting to save me, and when we both shaved our heads at the triage center, Turk didn't do those things as a favor to me or to Hunter. He did them because he wanted to. The pain in my head is worse. I think I want to be with Turk. I certainly could love him. I'm attracted to him. Our chemistry is incredible. But is now really the time to have a boyfriend? There are so many more important things to focus on. Aria, Turk says, did you hear what I said? I can't answer because I feel as though my cranium is about to explode. I press both of my hands to my face and breathe in, rocking gently back and forth. Aria. I can see Turk kneeling in front of me, but it's like a white gauze has been dropped over everything. And then there's a flash of memory. Kyle? I stand outside his bedroom door, a tray in my hands. I call out for him, but he doesn't answer. Kyle, I have your lunch. I know he's in there because Danny came over this morning and left just a little while ago. Kyle's girlfriend, Benny, is away for a few days with her parents. I imagine he's upset that she's gone and is moping in his bedroom. I step forward and press my hand to the touchpad on the wall. Silently, the bedroom door slides open, and I peer inside. There is Kyle, in an undershirt and gym shorts. He's sitting on the edge of his bed, elbows on his knees, leaning forward over a small glass and metal table, his nightstand, his shoulders heaving. I'm about to say something when he shifts his position and presses a small silver cylinder to his nostril. That's when I see the line of green powder on his nightstand. Stick. Kyle moves the cylinder down the line and the powder disappears inside his nose. I must make some sort of sound, because he jerks upright and stares at me, tracks of tears faintly visible on his cheeks. Get out of here, Davida, he says to me. Or I'll have you fired. Kyle, I'm sorry. He shoots up off the bed. Now! Without a moment of hesitation, he picks up the nightstand and lifts it into the air. His chest bulges as he pulls the table apart. The glass cracks and the aluminum legs snap off like twigs. Kyle's handsome face is red, distorted, angry. I rush out of his room and don't look back. Aria, can you hear me? I shake myself out of Davida's memory. Turk squints at me, worried. A mass of clouds darkens above us, casting shadows on his handsome face. Yes, I say. Around us, the square is mostly empty. What's going on? Turk asks. It's Davida, I say. Turk looks confused. Davida? She's... Her memories, I clarify. I can see them. She's showing me something. I, I just don't know what. Just then... Another sharp pain forces its way down my neck. My head snaps back involuntarily, and I shoot up my arms for balance. I feel Turk take my hands in his, and then I see... The upstairs wing of the Rose apartment. 
I am almost finished with my morning chores, making up Aria's and Kyle's bedrooms, the top sheet folded over the comforter just so, the pillows arranged perfectly. I take away the dirty laundry to be washed and clean the bathrooms, the library, and the downstairs living area and foyer. Magdalena, who has been with the Roses for decades, is in charge of Johnny and Melinda's bedroom and bathroom, as well as the kitchen. There were tiny droplets of blood on Kyle's pillowcases, like red spattered paint, signs he's been using stick. I saw him ingest it once the other day, and he has been avoiding me ever since. I noticed this morning that he has a new night table of inlaid dark wood, as if the other one never existed. I want to tell Aria, but I don't want to worry her, especially with everything else she has to deal with, the memory loss, her engagement. I will tell her once the time is right. I don't know what to make of Kyle. He used to be such a nice boy, considerate, quiet, more or less a loner. Even now he doesn't have a lot of friends, only Danny, really, and Benny, his girlfriend, Aria's friend. If he has other friends at college, he doesn't talk about them. I enjoy days like this, when the house is mostly empty and I can admire all of the beautiful things inside it. My own parents spend their lives in hiding because they refuse to have their powers drained and live like automatons. Before they sent me to live in the Aries, my parents and I shared an abandoned subway car with another mystic family. There was hardly enough room for all of us. We certainly didn't live like this. Three levels of an apartment building, all to one family. Entire rooms devoted to books and art and music. A grand piano that I dust every day but has only been played once. Pillows crafted from imported fabrics, tufted leather couches, wooden desks with mother-of-pearl inlays, curtains that rise and fall with the push of a button, doors with sensors that let them open when someone approaches. I walk softly across the upstairs landing, trailing my gloved hand along the mahogany railing overlooking the curved staircase and reception area, past Kyle's bedroom, then Aria's, toward the library, Mr. Rose's private sanctuary. The first sign of something amiss is that the door is open. Perhaps Magdalena went in to clean? It's unlikely, but possible. I'm about to peer inside when I hear a noise, a rustle. I press my back against the wall, wishing I were invisible, and wait. Silence. After a few seconds, I peer inside the library. There, in the middle of the room, is Kyle. Even in profile, he seems exhausted, with dark circles underneath his eyes. Like most stick addicts, he's thin, too thin. He is staring at the wall, ignoring the row of windows that look out onto the Aries, the skyscrapers glistening in the sun like fat, sparkly needles. Kyle's gaze is fixed on one of Mr. Rose's paintings, a large oil depicting a little girl running through a field thick with yellow dandelions that tower over her, their petals larger than her head. The sky is a dark swirl of blue. The colors jump out at you. The dandelions practically move as though a gentle breeze fills the canvas, and the little girl actually seems to be running. I know this is because the painting is made with mystic dye. There is magic in it, making it a true collector's piece, something only the wealthiest can afford. I have only seen the painting on the rare occasions when Mr. Rose has called me into his library. It takes up nearly an entire wall, and it is not hung, which I've always found rather odd. Rather, it simply rests against the wall like a ladder or a large piece of furniture. There is something foreboding about it that makes me uncomfortable, as if the painting itself feels sad. The little girl seems lost, with no one to save her, trapped inside a field of something deceptively pretty, something deadly. I study Kyle, who is still lost in the painting. I notice that his right hand is twitching, and so is his leg. I wonder how much stick he has ingested. I glance back at the painting, which seems to be coming to life right before my eyes, the colors swirling together and becoming almost three-dimensional. Kyle reaches out his hand, pressing the tip of his finger to the canvas. The grass in the painting emits a soft green glow that intensifies as Kyle touches it. There's a shimmer in the air, and it is clear that magic is about. And then I watch as Kyle's hand falls right through the painting and disappears. He gasps. This must be the first time he has ever dared to try this. There are so many things I could do. Call out to him, rush over and yank his hand out of the painting. But I remain still, curious what he will do next. A buzz fills the room, and Kyle's skin begins to glow in the same gauzy green light as the painting. 
An entire scene seems to liquefy, changing into a blur of colors and light. Then Kyle pushes his whole arm through the painting. He stays like this for a moment, smiling the first real smile I've seen on his face in days. Then he takes a deep breath and walks directly into the painting. There's a flash of green light, and he's gone. Turk, I call out, opening my eyes. The two of us are sitting on the concrete bench in the square, still holding hands. I don't know how much time has passed, hours, minutes, but I'm glad he's still with me. I'm here, he says. You were mumbling something about a painting? Do you remember when you saved me? I ask. He narrows his eyes and smiles. Which time? When Thomas kidnapped me, I say, recalling the evening that his army attacked the farmhouse, killing dozens of people to capture me, bring me back to the Ares, and hold me prisoner. Just as he was about to rob me of my memories once more, one of the mystic paintings on the wall opened up like a portal. Turk came through it on his motorcycle and saved me, bringing me to the rebel hideout and introducing me to Rhea and the others. That painting was a portal, I say. What about it? asks Turk, not asking which painting I mean. You told me back then that mystic paintings were used to spy on people in the Ares. Yeah, he says. That's true. It was one way the rebels got information. All the rich people displaying the paintings on their walls like trophies. He lets out a small laugh. <laughs> Little did they know. Davida's memory just showed me a painting in my old apartment that was a portal. I never knew it existed. And? But Kyle did, I say. And I watched him use it. He walked right inside it and went somewhere. The painting was in my father's library. I can only assume it was there for a reason. You think your father used a mystic loophole? Turk asks. I'm not sure, I answer. It doesn't seem like something my father would do, though perhaps he used the portal to connect him with someone who worked for him. Or maybe more likely, Kyle discovered the painting's properties on his own. Even if he didn't, I need to figure out where it leads. Do you know? Turk shakes his head. We'd have to use it to find out. So let's do that, I say. Turk sighs. You're getting sicker, Aria. We can't just stay here and wait for these memories to come to you. You need help now. Don't you see what this means? I ask him. My father told me that Kyle always liked his paintings. Kyle must have figured out that the painting was a way to get to another place. We have to find where that other place is. I stand up and all the blood rushes to my head so I immediately plop back down onto the bench. I bet you anything it's where my brother is working from. Aria, Turk says in a stern voice. You can barely walk. You think it's wise to go traipsing off who knows where? Your brother is dangerous. I know, I say, which is exactly why we have to find him. I think about my conversation with Hunter, how I told him I would reach out to some of my old contacts to try to find my brother. Well... My anonymous touch-me friend hasn't responded, and Davida's memory of my brother using the painting is the best lead I have right now to find him. There's no way I can pass this up. Turk, I say, staring straight into his warm hazel eyes. Lyrica is gone. We don't know where the sister is. We have to look for her, Turk says. To help you, listen to me, I say. I know I'm sick. I can't last like this forever, but I need to stop my brother. I can hear my own voice filling with emotion. This is something I have to do, and if you love me, you'll understand. It's not a choice. I look to Turk for some sign of understanding. He is now standing before me, incredibly strong, incredibly still, his hands clenched into fists. He wants to help me. I watch as his fists relax, his eyes soften. If you help me, I say to him, I promise I will see whatever doctor or mystic you think might help. I hold out my hand. Do we have a deal? Turk is clearly unhappy, but he sighs and shakes my hand. Deal. I stand up and plant a huge kiss on his lips. He grins. So what's the plan now? He asks. How are we going to find your brother? Easy, I say, smiling. We break into my parents' apartment. Chapter 17 You want to what? Hunter says to us. He glances at Turk, who holds up his hands. It wasn't my idea, believe me. We're back uptown, at the Mystic Hideout, standing together in the library. It's important, I say. 
Hunter is at one end of the long wooden table. Turk is at the other. I am standing between them, which feels all too much like a metaphor. Behind Hunter, the leather-bound books seem to spill off the shelves. A few are open on the table itself, as are a large map of Philadelphia and one of Manhattan. I think about the old sailor Donaldio, who helped me locate Davida's heart. I wish we had him now to help us. I've been gathering information on Philadelphia and Mayor Cotter, Hunter says, changing the subject. His blue eyes seem eager, full of anger and drive and emotion. He pushes the map toward me. I've reached out to the rebels in Philadelphia, some of whom knew my mother. I'm still waiting to hear back. Meanwhile, he says, pointing to a spot on the map, I've sent some of the rebels to find out what's lurking in the Hudson River west of Manhattan. As soon as I hear from them, I'll let you know. My guess is that there are at least twenty ships, maybe more. Large ones, too. I forgot how commanding Hunter can be. How easily he can shift from being tender and concerned to vengeful and warlike. It's one of the reasons I broke up with him. But now his sense of purpose is comforting. He presses a touchpad and the screen descends from the ceiling. He walks over to it and brings up an image of Reginald Cotter. Cotter is a black man in his late fifties or early sixties. He has a handsome, open face, with a few wrinkles across his forehead and around his lips. He looks fit, strong, and serious. His lips are pressed together, and a smile seems out of the question. In many ways, he reminds me of my father, which is not a good thing. Before Hunter has a chance to tell me about the mayor, I make another plea for him to help us access my parents' apartment building. It's just that I believe I know where my brother is hiding, I say, feeling foolish. And to find out if I'm right, we have to get to the painting in my father's library. I was just there the other night. The painting was so close I could have touched it, but I didn't know what it was then. Aria, that painting could lead anywhere, Hunter says. And if you are right, it will lead us into Kyle's base of operations. How many Rose soldiers do you think he has protecting him? Dozens, I'm sure, I say. So what? So we need to be prepared. Hunter looks at Turk. There's three of us. How can we possibly overtake all the soldiers and get to Kyle before he escapes? Suddenly, the door slides open, and Shannon and Yarrick stumble in, with Rhea right behind them, walking slowly but deliberately. She's not using her cane. Her face has most of its color back, and she has re-dyed her short hair a playful pink. The color reminds me of a satin dress I wore for my tenth birthday party, when Kiki and I were obsessed with princesses. Her injured eye is covered with a sleek black patch. Did someone say escapes? Shannon asks, pulling back her long red hair and looking in Hunter's direction. A smattering of freckles dots her cheeks and the bridge of her nose, and she tilts her head at my ex-boyfriend. An unspoken exchange I can't read passes between them. What are we talking about? Kyle, Hunter says. Who else would we be talking about? Yarrick says, sliding into a chair. He puts a tray of burgers on the table and I realize that once again he's anticipated the fact that we've all been too busy to eat. He sits back and raises his eyebrows, looking at us intensely. We need to get him. I want to help. That's great, Hunter says with a hint of sarcasm. I appreciate that, but that isn't the task at hand. It's not, I say, taken aback. Rhea points at the television screen. Who's that? This, Hunter says, zooming in on Cotter's face is Reginald Cotter, the mayor of Philadelphia, Kyle Rose's new partner in crime. We know that the two of them are up to no good. Duh, Yarrick interjects, but we don't know exactly what they're up to. Hunter reminds us of how he and Shannon helped some mystic women and children escape the depths, but it turns out their boat is still missing. We believe they were intercepted by the Philadelphians, who are in position outside Manhattan, awaiting orders to attack. Awaiting whose orders? Shannon asks, placing her hands on the edge of the long table and looking at Hunter. Kyle's, I say. Shannon snaps her head in my direction and frowns, which is why we need to find him and convince him to call off this plan. No offense, Arya, Shannon says to me, but I don't think you're going to be able to convince Kyle to do anything. How many times has he tried to kill you? Two? Three? I'm losing count. My brother may not care about what I have to say, I tell everyone taking a deep breath. But there is someone he'll listen to. Turk gives me an encouraging nod. My father. There's a moment of silence as everyone looks around, confused. 
Then Rhea says, Your father's gone, Arya. He already left town. She exchanges a glance with Yarrick as if to say, Has Arya completely lost it? I have Davida's heart, I say, which means I have her powers. I can take on another person's glamour. I step in front of the screen, blocking the image of Cotter. Help me find Kyle. I'll take on my father's glamour and convince him to stop what he's putting into motion. It's not too late. I hear the pleading in my own voice, and I know the others do too. I don't want to do this alone. You're not alone, Arya, Turk says. You have us. White guys? They all stare at each other. But Arya, Yarrick says, even if you do get into your brother's hideout disguised as your father, what makes you so sure he's going to listen to you? He could kill you. Kyle respects my father, I say. There may not be a lot of love there, but he'll listen to what he has to say. What happens after that? It's anyone's guess. But isn't it worth a try? No one responds at first, because they all know how dangerous this could be. My brother could murder me on the spot. But what choice do we have? The clock is ticking, the force field is nearly complete, and we're about to be attacked by Philadelphia. Shannon has a curious expression on her face. I'm game, she says. If Arya's willing to risk her life, so be it. So you wanted to die? Turk says, growing angry. Is that what you're saying? Lyrica's voice echoes in my head. You must die to live. You must die to live. Rhea speaks up. I'm sure that's not what she meant. I'm sure it is, Turk says. We may not have another choice, Shannon, but you don't have to wish her dead. Guys, Hunter says, holding out his hands. Enough. Stop. He looks directly at me. I can access the loophole that will let us out onto your old balcony. I can get you inside your parents' apartment. That's all I need, I tell him. I lock eyes with Turk, having assumed he would be the one to bring me there. Only I think... Once we're there, Hunter says rapidly, you're on your own. The soldiers may let Johnny Rose into the hideout, but if they recognize us, they will kill us on sight. There's too much left here to do. He motions to Cotter's picture. We have to be ready to anticipate Philadelphia's next move. Once the Ares is sealed off, there will be no stopping your brother. Of course, I say. I wouldn't want it any other way. Are you sure you want to do this, Arya? Turk says. We could figure something else out. I know I said I would help you, but... I shake my head. I have to do this, Turk. We're coming with you, Yarrick says, as far as we can. I can't help but smile. Thank you. Me too, Rhea says. I'm not back to my regular self just yet, but I make a hell of a lookout. Unexpectedly, I find myself overwhelmed with gratitude. A few weeks ago, I didn't even know who most of these people were. They're all orphans, and now, in a way, I am too. Who knows where my parents are, or if they're ever coming back. We may have lost Landon. We may be up against our greatest enemy yet, worse than my parents, or Alyssa Genevieve, or Thomas Foster. But we're in this together. Come on, Shannon says. Let's go suit up. As we all make our way downstairs to the armory, Turk pulls me aside. Arya, he says. I'm not coming with you. This surprises me. What? Don't be upset with me. I said I would help, and I did. I brought you here. But I'm going to find the sister. The sister? I say, shocked. But she's probably dead. And if she's not, we have no reason to believe she's in New York. Even if you convince Kyle to do the right thing, there's still poison inside you, eating away at you, he says. And I could never live with myself if I didn't do everything I can to help you. I'm a healer, remember? Please reconsider and come with me. His voice is filled with urgency. Turk truly cares about me. He loves me, and he wants me to live more than anything else in the world. I can't tell you how much your concern means to me, I say, but I have to find Kyle. You might die, Turk says, and I realize he's blinking back tears. If I don't try this, thousands of people will die. My own life isn't worth that much. Turk takes one of my hands and presses it to his chest. It is to me. I tilt my head up to meet him. His lips fit mine in a way I never thought possible. I feel safe in his arms, invigorated, and we kiss as though it's the last time we will ever be together. We only part at the sound of someone coughing. 
I turn and see Hunter standing in the doorframe, watching us. This is the second time he's caught us. Be careful, I tell Turk, pressing my hand to his chest. He slips his hand over mine. You too. I turn to walk away, leaving Turk behind. Silently, I pray that I make it through all of this alive. Not for myself, but for him. In the armory, I suit up in black leggings with a silver stripe up the side, gray sneakers, and a black short sleeve top. The Mystic Enhanced Material has automatic temperature control and flexible ultra-thin bulletproofing. I tuck my locket inside my shirt. The seamless heart has saved my life once before. I may need to rely on it to save me again. Hunter didn't speak to me on the way downstairs. Already in his fighting gear, he simply peeled off at the bottom of the steps and went to wait outside. I don't feel like I'm cheating on him, which makes me feel... strange. He and I had such an intense relationship, one that came at a high cost for so many people. Davida gave her life for us, but now it's over. Whatever I, or for that matter Hunter, may feel about that, he's with Shannon now, and I'm with Turk, and it feels right. At least, I think it does. I check my touch me for a response to my message. Nothing. I wonder if something has happened to whoever has been reaching out to me. Aria, Shannon says, handing me a leather sheath. I pull out the knife, Damascus steel, the strongest material in the world, and hold it up to the light. The blade practically dances. We need to talk. I sheath the knife and strap it to my leg. About? Shannon averts her eyes, so I assume she means Hunter. I already know, I tell her. She blushes. How? Now it's my turn to blush. I tell her about how I was in the depths and accidentally stumbled upon Hunter. How I decided to try out Davida's glamour and Hunter kissed me, thinking I was Shannon. I'm sorry. He doesn't know. I'm the one who's sorry, she says, pulling back her hair and tying her sneakers. She takes a few weapons off the shelves, including a folding machete. I just really like him. Well, like isn't the right word. It's more... She doesn't finish her sentence, but I know what she wants to say. Her features soften as she talks about Hunter, and she's just a girl who loves a boy who happens to be my ex-boyfriend. You probably hate me, she says. No. I take her hand, and I can tell she's surprised. I've had these feelings for him for a while, Shannon says, before I ever met you. That's probably why I was so hard on you during our training back at the farmhouse. Why I haven't exactly been nice. No, I tell her. You've been... Yeah, you haven't been very nice. She chuckles. I never thought I had a chance with him, so I put it out of my mind. Or I tried to, anyway. But then when you guys broke up, I just... Shannon starts to choke up. I can see her fighting back tears, which shocks me. I can't even imagine her crying, especially over a boy... And not just any boy. Hunter. Honestly, I tell her, I just want him to be happy. You too. I know what it feels like to be in love. It was that way with me and Hunter for a while. And now... It's like that with you and Turk? Shannon asks. There's no malice in her voice, only curiosity. I think about her question. About what it felt like to say goodbye to Turk just now, and not know if I'll ever see him again. How much he cares for me. I think of how good he makes me feel, how I light up when he enters a room, how being around him gives me the strength and courage to do what I know is right, even if it's dangerous. If that's not love, what is? Yes, I say, realizing not only that Turk loves me, but that I love him. Before I know it, Shannon has pulled me into a hug. I can feel her heart racing. Then, almost as if she's changed her mind about letting her guard down, she drops her arms and leans toward me. You'll need these. She grabs a pair of sleek black sneakers. They're waterproof. They'll help keep the sludge out. Are we going swimming? I ask, half joking, realizing she's wearing a similar pair. You'll see. She tosses me the sneakers. Come on, then. Let's get these, mothers. Chapter 18 I forgot how filthy the underground is. Even with my parents' apartment empty, there's no way we'll be able to enter through the front door. First, we have to find the starting point of the loophole, which was in the ancient subway car that Hunter converted into his apartment. 
Then we can travel through the loophole to the balcony outside my old bedroom in the Aries. The only problem is, after the fight that broke out underground when Violet Brooks was killed, most of the passageways were flooded. The rebels no longer live in the subway tunnels. It's too dangerous. So naturally, that's exactly where we've headed. Remind me why we agreed to do this, Rhea mutters to me. I was surprised she was coming, but she moves along so naturally now that it's almost as if she was never hurt. Together we all travel by Mystic Loophole, then Gondola, to the lower tip of Manhattan, around South Street Seaport, near where Hunter used to live. Outside, the night is dark and quiet. The surrounding streets and dingy buildings are washed in a greenish sheen. Above us, the mystic shield cuts across the skyscrapers part way up. There's only a small circle beneath the Aries left to be enclosed, and then it will be completely impenetrable. This way, Hunter says, leading the group with Shannon by his side. Behind Rhea and me, Yarrick makes sure no one is following us. We pass through the sealed entrance to the subway tunnels. It's dark at first, but then there's a gentle buzzing sound as Hunter's hands begin to glow with energy, and we can see where we're going. We stop, and I'm aghast. The station is completely underwater. We're standing on a narrow metal walkway that used to be high above the bottom of the tunnels, but now the water comes to our waists. We slosh through the cold, ink-black sludge as best we can, pulling ourselves forward with what is left of the railings. Despite Hunter's light, it's so dark I can barely see. I'm too afraid we'll be spotted to make any light of my own. Plus, I need to concentrate on taking each step. My goggles are strapped tightly around my head, pinching my skin and making me wish I could yank them off. There used to be lights embedded in the walls, but they don't work anymore. It feels like we've been walking for hours. It's just a little farther, Hunter says. Behind me, I can hear Rhea's teeth chattering. A few feet ahead, the tunnel curves to the right and slopes downward, so the water becomes deeper. Hunter stops and turns to us. Here, he says. Here? Yarrick repeats. What do you mean, here? Hunter flexes his hands, and the curls of energy from his fingertips lengthen, emitting a bright green glow. Down there is the station where my old subway car used to be. Everyone glances in the direction Hunter is pointing, but all we can see is black water. We're in a cave, Hunter, Rhea says, up to our belly buttons in grime and mucky water. Now you're telling us we have to swim down into an abandoned station to find the loophole? What if it's not there anymore? It's there, Hunter says confidently. What if we can't find it? Yarrick asks. And we need to, you know, breathe. I lock eyes with Hunter. Now that we're here, this does seem like a terrible idea. I'm wet and cold, but at least I can swim. Can Rhea? I'll go last, Hunter says. I'll make sure the area is lit properly, and I'll help anyone who's struggling. He nods to Shannon. The subway car will be underwater, he adds. You'll need to kick in the glass window and swim inside. Use your energy to light the area. Look carefully. You'll see the faint outline of the loophole around the center of the car. Once you swim inside, you'll be transported to Arya's balcony, okay? His instructions are crystal clear, but the task ahead is anything but simple. Okay, he repeats. And we all respond, okay. Shannon, Hunter says, you're first. Shannon turns around. Let's go, she says. A moment later, I see a green glow underwater, lines of mystic energy that point down into the cavern of the old subway station. There's a ripple in the water, and Shannon is gone. I see the glow of her energy move farther and farther away until I can no longer make it out. Arya, Hunter says, you're next, then Yarrick. Rhea, you come with me. Rhea nods, standing next to Hunter. Good luck, Arya, she says. See you on the other side. I can't tell because of the poor lighting, but I think I see Hunter wink at me. You'll be great, he says. Now go. I take a deep breath, then dunk my head under the surface. I press my fingers together tightly and feel the now familiar buzz as green filaments of light jet out ahead of me, helping to light the way as I dive into the darkness. Because I'm not using my arms to swim, I kick as hard as I can. I have no idea where I'm going. Even with my green rays, it's just black, black, black ahead of me. How long can I hold my breath? Through my goggles, I see a tiny green ball of light. Shannon. I head in that direction, 
and then, as quickly as I saw it, the light disappears. That can only mean one thing. Shannon has found the loophole. I flutter my legs until there it is, the old subway car, completely submerged like a toy in a child's bathtub. I shine the light from my hands along the wall, spotting an open window. I head toward it, then squeeze into the car. I look around, but don't see any ring of light that would indicate a loophole. I swim to the far end of the car and feel myself getting lightheaded. I don't know how much longer I can hold my breath. I sweep my arms out in front of me, shining green rays on the cracks and crevices of the old car that Hunter used to call home. I'm desperate to take a breath when I see it, a faint oval of green light shimmering in the water up ahead. I swim toward it and reach my hand inside and... There you go! Shannon pats my back as I cough up water onto the balcony outside my old bedroom. Get it all out! I heave until there's nothing left, then roll over and stare at the sky. My clothes are sopping wet and cling to my body like a second skin. For once, the sweltering heat feels good. I snap off my goggles and massage under my eyes. The force field is remarkable from up here. The sky is dark green. The stars are all blacked out, and even the smog is difficult to see. Everywhere I look, it's just green. I push myself up to a seated position. Now that my eyes are adjusting, I can see that the mystic shield covers the entire sky, spreading out over our heads and curving down around the Aries like a sheet of deadly glass. A few hours at most, Shannon says. Huh? Look! She points below us, toward the bottom of the Aries. The shield is coming together like a bubble. From up here, I can see the spot at the bottom of the Aries that has yet to be sealed. It looks incredibly small, less than a few city blocks wide. Since the skyscrapers extend from the depths up into the Aries, the green mystic energy cuts them off in the middle, creating an impenetrable green floor that runs below the Aries bridges. It's like a snow globe, I find myself saying. Shannon studies me strangely. What? My father used to bring me back snow globes from his trips when I was little, I tell her. There is no snow anymore, but a long time ago, some places were still cold enough to produce snow that would fall from the sky. It sounded like something out of a fairy tale to me. Maybe that's why snow globes exist, as a way of preserving our past. There are these little self-contained bubbles, miniature worlds. The only way inside is to break it open. Shannon studies the mystic shield with hesitation. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any way of breaking this thing open, unless we find the source and stop it. Just then, Yarrick falls onto the balcony, like he's been shot from an invisible cannon. He groans. That, he says, getting to his feet and pushing back his wet hair, was seriously intense. Intense in a way I don't ever want to feel again. Yeah, I tell him. We know. My clothes are practically dry now. And Shanna was right. The sneakers were waterproof. My toes are warm and happy. I watch as she wrings her hair out over the railing, and I find myself thankful I don't have to deal with that. A few seconds later, Rhea appears on the balcony, sputtering and whipping off her goggles. I can't breathe, she wheezes. Shannon pats her back. You're okay. I glance up at the tiny green outline of the loophole and wait for Hunter. Where is he? I don't know what happened to Hunter, Rhea says between breaths. He should have been right behind me. I catch Yarrick searching for him. He shrugs at me, and I can tell he's trying not to seem worried. Shannon, too, seems preoccupied, scanning the rooftop for signs of Hunter. I'm sure he's okay, I say to the group. Shannon turns to me, and immediately Hunter appears, wet and coughing and beautiful. Dude, Yarrick says, thank the sister. My heart is confused. The thought of something happening to Hunter is, well, unthinkable. Does that mean I still have feelings for him? Hunter smiles at me as water drips down his chin. His fighting gear resembles a wetsuit, the tight black material clinging to his body and accentuating every muscle. All right, Hunter says, rubbing his hands together. He motions to the balcony door. Arya, want to do the honors? There is no touchpad on the balcony. Because my family lives so high in the Eries, there's never a security threat in leaving the sliding door unlocked, which is why it's the one way Hunter could visit me. Only now, after all that has happened, I wonder if my parents connected this entryway to the alarm system. I press my hand to the latch. 
the moment of truth, I say, wondering if a siren is about to sound, alerting my brother to our presence. I pull it down, and the door slides open. We collectively hold our breath and wait for the worst, but it doesn't come. There is no alarm. I glance back to four smiling faces. We're in. My bedroom is more or less the same as I left it. It almost feels like a museum. My desk, my bed, my closet and bathroom. I sit on the duvet, which is pale lavender with a trail of English roses along the border. My head is throbbing, and my arms and legs ache. There's an odd smell in the air, perhaps because the room's been empty for so many weeks. It reminds me of the old books in the Mystic Hideout's library, slightly musty, like pressed flowers. Which way is the library? Yarrick asks. Keep your voice down, Rhea says. Why? Yarrick responds. Nobody's here. Still, Rhea says, there could be someone, I don't know, lurking? Yarrick sighs. Trust me, they're long gone by now. He's probably right, I decide. I don't think my parents will ever return to Manhattan. The two of them exit into the hallway, with Shannon close behind. Hunter remains in my bedroom. He pushes back his hair, which is tangled and damp, and peers around my room. It's difficult to read his expression. He almost looks startled, like he stumbled upon a place he never expected to find. What? I say, perching on the edge of my bed. Nothing. He cocks his head and gives me a tight smile. Just a lot of memories. I know what you mean. Being in this room is like stepping back in time. Everywhere I look, there is a ghost. Me dressing for my engagement party, Davida removing her gloves and telling me she's a mystic. My father rushing in and shooting at Hunter just as we dropped through the floor. My parents handcuffing me to my bed, Hunter in Davida's glamour kissing me. Me swallowing the mysterious locket I found in my clutch and releasing all of my stolen memories, remembering Hunter and our love. And now here I am with Hunter again, but life is different. The future is darker than ever before. If Lyrica is right, I'm dying, and my brother is about to sell out our city to Reginald Cotter in Philadelphia. A jolt of pain rushes through my head, and I clench my fists, crying out. Aria! Hunter rushes over to me, grabbing my shoulders. I open my eyes. I'm fine. I manage to get out, but I can tell he doesn't believe me. What's going on? He leans in closer, and our noses practically touch. A lock of his hair falls forward onto his forehead, and a bead of water drips onto my cheek, just below my eye, like a single tear. Sometimes after I use my powers, I say, I'm just weak. Hunter's gaze is full of concern, and I realize how out of the loop he's been kept. Does he know that Lyrica is dead? The Turk has contacted the last remaining sister. Does he know what will happen to me if I keep Davida's heart? I am about to tell him all of these things when I hear a familiar voice in the hallway. We both look up and see Shannon, watching us. There you are. Hunter jerks back, like a child caught with his hand in the candy jar. I slowly get to my feet. Come on, Shannon says. There's no time to waste. Yarrick and Hunter check the rest of the apartment and make sure none of my father's employees are around. My headache worsens as Shannon, Rhea, and I slip into my parents' old bedroom. Pretty room, Rhea says softly. I look around and have to agree. It's more or less the way it has always been. White oak floors, white walls, white bedding. The king-sized bed was given to them as a wedding present, with their names, Johnny and Melinda, woven into the bronze headboard, the railings like rose stems climbing toward the sky. The linen seemed freshly washed, the pillows perfectly placed. If I didn't know any better, I'd say my parents had never left. But they are definitely gone. The closets are practically empty, save for a few blouses my mother must have decided were unworthy, and a handful of my father's shirts. Here. Shannon says, pulling out a striped yellow shirt with white cuffs, a pair of navy blue trousers, and a matching jacket. On the floor, I spot an old pair of brown leather dress shoes. These'll have to do. Just be careful, Rhea says. Success is in the details. The littlest thing could tip your brother off that something is wrong, and you have to make it out of there alive. We won't be there to help. I give Rhea's arm a gentle squeeze. 
I'll be fine. I promise. I take off the clothes I'm wearing and put on my father's pants, then his shirt. I'm practically swimming in them, but that will change soon. I slip on the shoes and tie up the laces, then stare at Rhea and Shannon. Well, Shannon says. I turn to the full-length mirror on the wall. I look like a little girl playing dress-up. I picture my father, with his hair slicked back and his eyes full of mischief. Johnny Rose is a powerful man, a man you do not want to cross, but he is also my father. I remember how, when I was a little girl, he would keep me on his lap while he held important meetings in his study. I was his special thing, his treasure. He loved me. All that changed when I got older. He was hardly ever home. I learned how vicious he could be when he was crossed, how fond he was of power. When I fell in love with Hunter, he didn't understand me, and worse, he didn't want to. He wanted me to always be his little girl, to follow in his footsteps. We're alike, you and me, he told me. I didn't believe him at the time, but I suppose there is some truth to what he said. But my father took his wealth and ran away, and I'm staying to fight alongside his enemies. My skin begins to prickle and buzz, and I can feel Davida's energy overtaking me, pulling and twisting my bones, rushing through my blood as I grow and thicken and begin to sprout hair in places I don't even want to think about. My body feels like a giant pincushion. My heart beats like a drum. I can't hear or see anything, and then it's over. I open my eyes and stare into the mirror. I see my father's eyes gazing back at me so brown and nearly black. I see my father's face, the hard lines around his eyes and mouth. I glance down at my father's hands, his neatly trimmed nails. Well, Shannon says, repeating herself in a completely different tone. Rhea blinks and reaches out to touch me, as if I'm a mirage. This is seriously creepy. I know. I glance at myself again in the mirror. I feel ready. There's no way Kyle won't believe I am our father. The resemblance is perfect. Come on, let's show the boys. Yarrick lets out a whistle as we enter my father's library. He and Hunter have closed the curtains, locking off the city view, and they're both staring at the painting. Or at least they were until I walked in. Freaky, Yarrick says. You completely look like your father, Hunter says and I can tell by his wide, eager eyes that this plan of ours might actually work. Weird. Like, very weird. I know, I say. Be careful, Rhea says, almost pleading. Just please be careful. Weird, Hunter repeats. Super, super weird. I turn and stare at the painting. It's more alive than ever before, practically calling to me. Hunter runs his finger along the top of the canvas, and I watch as the colors flicker and pulse, beginning to melt together. You'll likely come out of another painting on the other side, Hunter says to me. Remember to act like nothing strange is happening. You are Johnny Rose, and you want to say goodbye to your son before you leave Manhattan. Hunter motions to my leg. You still have your knife, right? I feel the inside of my thigh, making sure it's still there. Yes. Good. Don't be afraid to use it if anything goes south. If someone suspects that anything is even the slightest bit off, Hunter says, run. Book it back to the painting and get out of there. We'll be here, waiting. We're not going to leave until you return. If you're not back in one hour, he motions to a large grandfather clock in the corner of the room. We're coming in after you. Yarrick steps up to me and pats me on the shoulder. You can do this. Thanks, guys, I say. I'm going to be fine. I turn back to the painting, reaching out my hand. A soft hum fills the room, the sound of crackling energy. I press my finger to the top of the painting. A sharp pain explodes inside my brain, and I feel myself falling. It is only because Johnny Rose asks me to retrieve his watch that I discover Kyle's secret. Aria is out with Kiki, shopping at the Circle, and Melinda Rose is downtown for a charity event. Johnny has come home early to change into a casual suit for a business dinner. He is in his bedroom, and Stigson is guarding the door. Kyle is supposed to go to the dinner with him, but he's nowhere to be found. Get Mr. Rose's watch from his library, Stigson tells me. It's an order, not a request. The Platinum Rolex. It's on his desk. 
Downstairs, Magdalena is beginning dinner prep. I rush to his library, press the touchpad, and wait as the door retracts. If I had been a second earlier or a moment later, I would not have seen Kyle emerge from the mystic painting propped up against the wall. The smile on his face slips when he sees me staring at him. Davida, he says. I pretend I don't see him. I know his rage, and I do not want to be a victim of it. I hurry across the carpet toward Mr. Rose's desk. Stop, Kyle says. He bites his bottom lip, and his chin is practically quivering. I realize that he is not angry. He's worried. Kyle rushes over to the doorframe and presses the door closed. Don't tell my father where I was. I rest one hand on the desk, searching for the watch. I don't know where you were, Kyle, so I can't tell him. You know what I mean. He takes a step closer to me, and I wonder if he's on stick. It wouldn't surprise me. If he is, he could fly into a rage at any moment, and I wouldn't be able to protect myself without exposing my own powers, which I do not want to do. Kyle rushes around the room. Is he looking for me? I nod, spotting the watch. I pick it up, then look back at Kyle. He's right at the desk, mere inches away. What do you want, Kyle? I say. It's forward of me to speak to him this way, but I don't care. I don't want to be here. I remember him breaking apart his nightstand in front of me, snorting stick up his nostrils. I need to get this to your father. Aren't you going to ask where I was? He glares at me like he's daring me to, like it's a game. If it is, it's a game I don't want to play. No, I say. He steps closer. Go ahead. Ask me. His lips are trembling slightly. You and Ari are close. You keep her secrets. I'm not sure what he means by this. Could he possibly know about Ari and Hunter? I don't think so. I'm her servant, I say, if that is what you mean by close. No, Kyle says, sounding angry. He wipes his nose with the back of his hand. You're friends. You know things about her, and you keep them from my father. I don't have anyone to keep my secrets. I'm sure what he's talking about. I begin to back away. Suddenly, the hard exterior that Kyle has been carrying around vanishes right before my eyes. I have a secret, Kyle says. He says this out of nowhere. His pale eyes are full of fear. I was with him. I don't need to know that, I say. I move to the side and attempt to leave, but he stops me, his hands on my shoulders. I was with him, he repeats. Danny. He looks right at me, but it's almost like he's looking through me. I'm sure he's on drugs. His eyes are glassy and his pupils are dilated. He's rocking back and forth. And then he begins to cry. It's been so long since I've seen Kyle display any emotion other than rage that it takes me by surprise. His grip softens and he drops his head. Then he pulls me into a hug and he is weeping into my shoulder. Slowly, I raise my arms from my sides and hug him back. I don't know what the proper response is, but I have never been more aware of my position in this household. I am a servant, vulnerable to the whims of my employers. I was with him, Kyle keeps repeating. Don't tell my father. Don't tell Aria. Don't tell anyone, please. Part 3 Each night, when I go to sleep, I die. And the next morning, when I wake up, I am reborn. Mahatma Gandhi Chapter 19 I wake up from Davida's latest dream in a room I do not recognize, in an apartment I have never seen before. The first thing I think is, there is something terribly wrong with me. It's nearly pitch black. I can just make out a wall to my left and a carpet that's soft to the touch. My mouth feels like it's been glued closed. There's a sour taste in my tongue, and my head hurts so badly I can barely open my eyes. It feels like my brain has been hammered to bits. I don't know how long I've been out. Since Hunter and the others are nowhere in sight, I assume my hour isn't up yet. I open my mouth and my jaw cracks. My back feels stiff against the floor. Trying not to make any quick movements, I push myself up to rest against the wall, breathing as deeply as I can. My body feels too big, too heavy. I remember, this is not my body. It is my father's. I try not to think about this. 
I fight through the headache. Then I stand up. Even in this air-conditioned room, sweat drips down my neck. My skin is clammy, red-hot like I have a fever. I take a few steps forward and search for a touchpad on the wall, feeling like I could collapse at any moment. After a second or two, my fingers touch metal and the overhead lights blink on. I'm forced to close my eyes. It's nearly blinding in here. A few seconds pass, then I open them. I am in an office. It's not unlike my father's library, with a bright yellow tufted sofa and mirrored side tables. The walls are a deep blue, and the trim is a crisp white. There are built-in bookshelves along one wall, and a desk in the middle of the room, facing two oversized windows with the curtains drawn. I open the door and step into a long hallway, which in turn opens into a large family room. A bit of yellowish light pokes through the closed curtains, and I can see an expensive almond-colored sectional that faces a large touch-me screen. To my left is a long oval fish tank, the glass completely opaque with mold and algae. Next to the television is a tall vase that reaches my waist, Venetian glass with vibrant threads of red and blue and yellow. An all-black amuse-me system is positioned just under the TV screen, with bright silver knobs and mahogany wooden speakers on either side. Art of all kinds adorns the walls, small colorful paintings on paper, and canvases of abstract spirals and swirls, each of which must have cost a fortune. Next to the foyer is a tall, narrow display cabinet filled with glistening trinkets. We're clearly in the Aries, and what little I can see of the apartment tells me it belongs to someone rich. But the big question is, is Kyle here? I listen carefully, but all I hear is silence. This is not what I would have expected from Kyle's base of operations. At first glance, the apartment seems to be abandoned, but it's mostly in pristine condition. I step forward and peer over the sofa. The carpet, a beautiful salmon pink, is stained with two large reddish-brown patches, each one easily the size of my head, and many smaller stains of the same color. I glance up at the walls and see droplets of the same reddish-brown shade. I crouch down and press my fingers to the patches, which are dried and crusty. I lift my fingers to my nostrils and smell the same metallic scent that soaked the air in the triage center. I place one hand over my mouth, feeling like I'm about to throw up. This is dried blood. I follow the trail through the dining room and into the kitchen. Broken plates and glasses are everywhere, in the sink, on the floor, and there is more blood streaked across the marble countertops. There is a window over the sink with the curtains drawn. Whoever lived here must have been attacked and put up a good fight. But what happened? Just like my parents' apartment, the kitchen here has a keyed service elevator, which likely goes down into the basement, where a back exit leads to the Aries Bridges. In some buildings, the service elevator will even take you all the way into the depths if you have the right passcode. I examine the stainless steel elevator door, which is smudged with fingerprints. This is where the blood trail stops, which makes sense. It would be the only way to get rid of a body without bringing it into the lobby of the apartment building, where it would surely be noticed. Nervously, I make my way back through to the living area and down the hallway, back into the office where I arrived. My father's body is difficult to control. This must be what a baby feels like when it first tries to stand. Against the wall is a large mystic painting, the one I must have come through. Like the painting in my father's library, this one rests against the wall. It's a still life of a handful of peaches in a large wooden bowl in the middle of a round kitchen table. It reminds me of something from another life, far from here, out of place in a New York City apartment that has been ransacked and, apparently covered in blood. I shudder. After a moment, I check the front door lock, which seems to be in perfect condition with no sign of a break-in. The only other ways into the apartment would be through the service elevator or through the loophole in the painting, the way I came. Then another possibility strikes me. What if the owner of this apartment welcomed his future killer inside because he or she knew him? That would explain why the front door suffered no damage. Friends visiting friends. Again, I wonder whose apartment this is. Did my father have a mistress? If so, was that who died? And was he responsible for her death? Or does my father not have any connection to the apartment at all? True, the painting is in his study, but that doesn't mean he knows about the loophole. 
it's possible that Johnny Rose had nothing to do with the chaos that occurred within these walls. I continue to make my way through the apartment, peering into the downstairs guest bathroom. The whole room, including the mirror, is covered with a thin layer of dust. Whatever happened here must have happened some time ago. The stairs to the second floor are covered in a thick white carpet, which has blood stains on nearly every step. The upstairs is smaller than my parents' apartment, though not by much. To the right are the servants' quarters. The rooms are smaller and closer together, two simple bedrooms, each with a twin bed. The scene in each space is nearly identical. Clothing scattered on the wooden floors, lamps thrown to the floor and shattered, blood-soaked pillows and sheets overturned in gory disarray, reddish-brown streaks everywhere. Something truly frightening happened here. I step away and head toward the opposite side of the second floor. The door to the master bedroom is destroyed. It's off the hinges and cracked straight down the middle. The air smells musty, and the bed is totally stripped. Just a bare frame with more blood stains, lots of them, on a king-sized mattress. There is dried blood on the headboard, too. What happened in here? And how is it connected to my brother? My stomach begins to rumble and before I know it, I'm rushing into the bathroom and heaving into the toilet. As I flush and stare into the mirror, I see my father's face staring back, hear his voice in my head, mocking me, saying, You asked for this. This is what you wanted, Arya. I splash water from the sink into my mouth and onto my face. I take a clean washcloth from a shelf and wipe the back of my neck. After one last look at my father's haggard face, I leave the bathroom, finding myself back in the hallway. It's strange that there are no pictures of the family here, almost like they were purposely removed. Even my parents have dozens of photographs littering the apartment, relics of long-ago times when Kyle and I were children, when we were all happy. At least I thought we were. A few rooms upstairs seem untouched. A study with a rich mahogany desk and a white leather chair. A door leads from there into a room with dark red wallpaper and a full-sized bar, a playroom of some sort with a pool table and the largest touch-me screen I've ever seen. The last room I enter is eerily similar to the master bedroom. The bed is stripped here, too, and bloodstains on the carpet form a sickening kind of Rorschach test. I press a touchpad on the wall, and the closet door slides open, revealing all sorts of clothes, pants and brightly colored dress shirts, and a row of fashionable shoes. At the far end of the bedroom is a desk, with all of its drawers open. The floor is a sea of papers and personal belongings, and there are a few posters on the walls, but nothing else. I gaze around for a touch-me, or anything that might provide a clue to whose bedroom this is. I check underneath the bed and in the nightstand. Nothing. I am about to leave when a shirt in the closet catches my eye. It's deep purple, almost blue, with thin black lines around the sleeves and the bottom. It's innocuous enough, but I remember it immediately because I bought one like it for my brother for his birthday a year or two ago. I take it out of the closet and flip up the collar, where my brother's initials were monogrammed. Staring back at me are those very same initials, K.J.R. What is my brother's shirt doing here? The only thing I can think of is that he might have let a friend borrow it. I immediately think of Danny. Is this Danny's room? In all the years I've known him, I've never been to his apartment. His father was one of my father's most valued employees, a close friend. It seems unlikely that Johnny Rose would have used a mystic portal for travel, but perhaps it was an escape route in case anyone ever attacked us, an easy way out. Then Davida's most recent memory flashes before me her encountering Kyle coming back through the painting in my father's library. He said he'd been with Danny. Maybe my father didn't know the painting was a mystic portal at all. Maybe it was something Kyle and Danny used, a secret they shared. But that could make sense. What doesn't make sense is what happened here. If this is Danny's apartment, I can only assume that his parents were the ones who were murdered. Why else would there be bloodstains in the master bedroom? And what about Danny himself? Surely my father would never harm them, so who did? I'm rifling through the rest of the clothing, searching for something that will confirm this is Danny's bedroom, when I hear something that sounds like a click. I freeze. Is somebody here in the apartment with me? Holding my breath, I wait for another noise, 
any sign that I'm not alone. Could it be Hunter and the others? I don't hear anyone coming up the stairs from the office, but still, I wait. When I'm satisfied that no one else is here, I go back to poking around the bedroom. The mystic loophole exists for a reason, but what is that reason? And who put it there? I thought it might lead me to Kyle's hideout, but Kyle would surround himself with soldiers and protection. Why come to Danny's place? I stare at the rows of shoes, the laces perfectly tucked inside the tongues. Something, I think. Give me something. I'm about to close the closet door when I notice a scrap of paper sticking out of a black leather shoe. I reach inside the shoe, and out comes a picture. Or rather, a series of pictures in one narrow strip. There is a booth where you can get these taken at the Circle, the dome-enclosed shopping mall on 59th Street, where Kiki and I used to go on weekends. I stare at four pictures of my brother and Danny. I'm not sure when these were taken, but it seems like a while ago. Kyle and Danny appear slightly younger and certainly happier. The first picture is of the two of them staring straight into the camera, shoulders pressed together, their expressions serious. The next one shows them smiling, and in the third they're laughing. They both look so carefree I have a hard time believing that one of them is my brother. Then I feel a buzz in my pocket. Why touch me? I slip out the device and see the same private number that has been messaging these past few days. This time my screen says, Turn around. My heart catches in my throat. The noise I heard earlier was real. Someone is here, in the apartment. Is it my brother? I spin on my heels and see a figure standing in the doorframe, watching me. I grip the picture in one hand and my touch me in the other. I have no weapon, no way to defend myself. I am about to become another stain on the carpet. The figure steps into the room, and I see immediately who it is. Hello, Arya. Chapter 20 Benny? I'm in shock as I stare into the eyes of Kyle's girlfriend. Benny's usually made up to perfection, her blonde hair glossy and perfect, her brown eyes shaded with mystic-infused makeup, lips painted in something apple-red. She's three years older than Kiki and me, and while we're all friends, she has always seemed much more sophisticated than we are. Now she stands before me looking worried. She's thinner than I remember her, and her white shirt is wrinkled. Her hair is tied back in a loose ponytail, and she's not wearing a stitch of makeup. For someone with such style, she seems unkempt. Benny gives me a sad smile. We don't have a lot of time, she says. You're telling me. I step toward her, but she pulls back as if frightened. Then I remember that I look like my father. Oh, I say, trying to come up with some reason why Johnny Rose would be in this apartment. Ms. Badino, I'm surprised to see you here. I'm looking for... I know it's you, Aria. She holds up her touch me. I stare down at mine. Benny, she's the one who's been sending me the messages. I never would have guessed. I haven't spoken to her in what feels like ages. And when I've seen her on television, she appears utterly devoted to my brother. But if she is responsible for the texts, then she must want to take him down. There are a million questions I want to ask about what happened between her and Kyle. What comes out is, why? Benny gives me a sideways glance that reminds me that we used to be friends, that we have a history. After I left to be with Hunter, I assumed she hated me because she was with Kyle. Why is she reaching out now? Perhaps I'm just the lesser of two evils. Why am I helping you? Benny says. Well, I thought we were friends. We were, I say. I mean, we are. No, Benny stops me. You were right the first time. We were friends. Then you cast me and Kiki out of your life. I'm sorry, I say. Benny just shakes her head. It's too late for apologies, Aria. Besides, there are bigger things at stake. She walks over to the bedroom window, pressing a touchpad. From here, we can see out over the Aries. Benny points down at the Hudson River, and that's when I see the boats. Dozens of them are surrounding the west side of Manhattan. The green force field has enclosed almost all of the Aries by now. It's like seeing the world through mint-colored contact lenses. The boats are too far away to make out any details. 
All I can see are tiny black dots that swarm the water like dangerous ants. Philadelphia, I whisper. Benny turns to me. Exactly. But they're already here, I say. We can't stop them now. We still have to try, Benny says. Carl will listen to you like this. Her eyes run over me, taking in my disguise, my glamour. The resemblance is spooky, actually. I know. I stare at the screen of my touch me, thinking about the messages warning me not to trust Kyle. What happened between you two? I thought you were happy. You seem so close. Benny sighs. Do you mean those broadcasts? That was old Kyle. He wanted us to look like the perfect couple for the entire city to see. I suppose we were at first, says Benny. At the beginning of college, your brother was caring, smart, sensitive. I thought he was the best person I'd ever met. I didn't care that he was from a powerful family or that I'd heard such awful things about... She motions to me, dressed as my father, and I understand what she's trying to say. But then he changed, grew distant, less kind. I nod. You'd have to be blind not to see how different Kyle is now. He started shutting me out, Benny says. In public, he'd be all over me, sweet and affectionate. But then, as soon as we were alone, it was like I didn't exist. His only other friend was Danny, but the two of us weren't close. We just never really clicked. Benny peers around the room. Clearly, she knows more than I do about what happened here. I thought it was your father, that he was making Kyle feel inadequate and worthless. She trails off. I started to think maybe Kyle was seeing someone else, another girl. She laughs, a hollow sound. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. I remember when I thought Thomas Foster and I were actually in love, and then I caught him making out with someone else. I hated him for cheating on me. And it turns out I never even loved Thomas in the first place. It was all a lie. I can't even imagine how Benny must feel. I was sure he was going to end things with me, Benny continues. But then... The blood stain on the mattress catches Benny's eye. She's still as stone. I walked in on him and Danny. Together. She shudders. The night of that soiree I threw, where the kid OD'd, and I knew why Kyle wouldn't touch me anymore. Danny and Kyle. Together? That was the same night I caught Thomas cheating on me. What are the odds? I glanced down at the strip of photos I'm still holding. I nearly forgot about them. There, at the bottom, the fourth picture of my brother and his best friend shows them with their eyes closed, kissing. It seems natural, like they've done it a thousand times before. Kyle looks the most relaxed I have ever seen him. Happy. Even in the kiss, the corners of his lips are turned up in a genuine mm -hmm. smile. And this is when I realize that Benny is telling the truth. My older brother is gay. No one suspected anything, Benny says. I wanted to tell you, but you were never around. I guess you were sneaking off with Hunter. I was too embarrassed to tell Kiki. Plus, Kyle threatened me. You wouldn't believe it, Arya. He said that if I ever told anyone, he would kill me and then go after my family. He was so cold. I stare harder at the picture. All at once, Davida's memory makes perfect sense. The one that came to me as I entered the mystic painting. My brother crying into her shoulder and saying that he was with Danny. He meant romantically. They were a couple. Benny brushes her hair behind her ears. He said that if I left him, he would ruin me. So I stayed and pretended things were okay. Everyone was so concerned over you and your memory loss that no one paid attention to me or saw that I was suffering. Then Danny disappeared, and I thought maybe Kyle and I had a chance. Wait. I hold up one of my father's hands, remembering when I saw Kiki, when she told me Danny hadn't returned any of her calls. What happened to Danny? Benny stares at me like I'm simple. You've seen the apartment. What do you think? Apparently I wasn't the only one who discovered their secret. I start to answer, but the words don't want to leave my lips. What do I think? I think that Danny and his family were murdered here, in their own home. I think the bodies were disposed of somehow, and nobody ever learned what happened to them. It is the sort of job that screams of my father, but there's no real evidence that leads me to this conclusion. It could have easily been a robbery gone wrong, though if that were the case, I imagine it would have been on the news. No, this went under the radar. I remember the front door, 
how the lock was intact, how I thought whoever lived here might have voluntarily let in his killer, because they knew one another. Which means it was a hit. Did Johnny Rose give the order to eliminate an entire family, his so-called friends, and some of his men pulled the trigger? Or did my father kill them himself, the way he shot that gondolier right in front of me, for no reason at all? Then an even worse thought crosses my mind. Was it Kyle? I can't imagine how it could have been, even if my brother was a stick addict. Did he and Danny get into a fight? Did Kyle react in some sort of drug-induced rage? My headache is growing worse, and I begin to feel short of breath. A million thoughts battle each other in my head. Why didn't Kyle ever say anything? I can understand why he wouldn't tell my parents. But why did he keep this secret from me? I would have accepted him. He knows I believe that everyone should love whomever they want to. I never would have judged him. Meanwhile, I feel angry that he judged me about my relationship with Hunter. He knew how it felt to have to hide his love. Why did he give me such a hard time? Why did he wrap me out to my father? I don't know all the details, Benny says. Your brother isn't exactly forthcoming. Benny glances at her touch me. I've been gone too long. I have to get back. She turns to leave Danny's bedroom, then looks at me. You're coming, right? You'll take me to him? To see Kyle? She purses her lips. Why else would I be here? Benny waves me forward, and together we walk down the hallway to the stairs. The silence is as eerie as before, but I'm slightly comforted not to be alone this time. That said, Benny is more or less a stranger to me now. I have no idea where she's living, what she's been doing since I took up with the rebels. I glance down at my father's fingers, wondering how much longer I can retain his glamour. How did you know I was here? Benny takes me inside the office and motions to the painting I came out of, leaning against the wall. When Kyle still lived at home with your parents, I discovered the link between the painting in your father's library and the one here. He was late to take me out to dinner one night. I started poking around, and one thing led to another. She considers the painting. I ended up here, and that's when I walked in on him and your brother, she says. I kept quiet for a long time, but then things started to change. She glares at me, almost like I'm the one to blame for what my brother did to her. Kyle blackmailed me. He said that if I ever left him, he would have my parents murdered. He took over this building and set up his headquarters in the depths and forced me to live here, too, like a prisoner. I... I'm so sorry, Benny. I tell her. She forces a smile. Don't be. I'm allowed to leave as long as I'm supervised, and I more or less have my run of this particular building, which is how I had this installed. Benny points to the far wall where the bookshelves are. Hidden in one of the shelves is a tiny red eye. I didn't notice it before. A spy camera? I ask now. Benny nods. When Kyle took over this building, he had all of the residential apartments evacuated, so there wouldn't be anyone coming or going who wasn't under his command. So there are a bunch of empty apartments. And one day, I stole this and figured out how to program it to my touch me. Hearing Benny speak reminds me of when I was under surveillance by my parents, how I couldn't make a move without being monitored. I knew you would come looking for Kyle at some point, Benny says. I just needed to lead you in the right direction. So that's why you sent me the messages? I ask. Kyle doesn't know I have this phone, she says. I always delete my history in case he finds it, but all the messages I send go through the grid. I had to stay cryptic and private in case anyone ever logged on and deciphered what I was sending. Luckily, people have bigger concerns these days. Thank you, I tell her, for trying to help. Benny taps her touch me. Let's get one thing straight, Arya. I'm not your biggest fan right now, she says. But I know you're good. Inside. She lowers her voice. I used to think your brother was, too. She pinches the bridge of her nose like she has a headache. I've been watching the apartment to see when you would arrive. When I saw you, or, well, your father, I knew that was strange, because he and your mother left Manhattan. I said goodbye to them that night and watched them fly off in their copter. I was able to check the grid and saw that your touch me was showing up as inside the apartment. I knew that somehow you were using magic to change your appearance. I always knew Benny was smart, but more in a literature and history sort of way. 
She was the one who told me what books I should read. I never knew she was so stealthy. I'm impressed. I told one of the guards I was tired and needed a nap, she continues. He took me back to my room, and I smashed his head into the door and tied him to my bed. You what? I look to see if she's joking, but she's not. Then he smirks. You're not the only one who's capable of violence, Aria, she says. He was passed out when I left, but he'll wake up soon. I stuffed a sock in his mouth, but that won't last forever. If you're coming with me, we have to go. Now. Okay, I say. As we reach the elevator bank, Benny says, Technically, Kyle and I are living in the penthouse, a few floors above this, but it's just in case reporters ask. I'm never there. He has his bodyguards spread out on several floors. The bottom of the building in the depths is completely sealed off. You'd think it was an abandoned warehouse, she continues. There's no way in from down there. The entrances in the Aries are monitored 24 hours a day by Kyle's bodyguards. What are Kyle's actual headquarters like? I ask, trying to figure out what I'm getting myself into. The main floor in the depths used to be some sort of butcher shop, Benny says. It's disgusting. There are back rooms down there where Kyle meets with some of his soldiers. Lots of security equipment and cameras. They can see 360 degrees around the building, who's walking on the opposite side of the street, that sort of thing. On the second floor, above the operations area, is my actual bedroom. She takes a deep breath. Big windows, creaky wooden floors, a bed with a mattress that's about as comfortable as plywood. I pretty much have the run of that floor. But there are lots of rooms on the first floor I don't have access to. I think of Benny living here, stuck in the same room, day in and day out, like a princess in a tower. Rapunzel. Don't feel bad for me. Seriously. Benny reaches out as if to touch my shoulder, then changes her mind. Do you think you can stop him? I risked my life to get you here. If your brother found out I'm helping you, he'd... She swallows, choosing not to finish her sentence. Kyle's more like your father than I ever imagined. I don't want anything to happen to my family. I just need to see him, I say. One on one. I will do my best to stop whatever it is he's up to. That's why I came. Benny nods. I can't tell if she finds my words comforting. Take the elevator to the main level in the depths. I'll key in the code. Once the door's open, you'll be met by two guards. Your disguise will buy you some time. Say that you're here to see Kyle. They'll lead you to the front of the building, through the warehouse area, into his office. That seems simple enough. Here's the thing. Benny stares right into my eyes. Everyone knows that Johnny Rose is gone. The men will bring you to Kyle out of respect, but you'll need to work fast. They'll check the grid for his location and see that he's not actually in Manhattan. And then you'll be a goner. She's right. But how long will that leave me? Ten, fifteen minutes at the most to convince my brother to change his mind about the war? I suddenly get cold feet. How in the world am I going to accomplish this? Where will you be? I ask Benny. Here, she says. I'll wait for you. Come back up when you're done and we'll leave through the painting. She glances at her touch me. It's 5 p.m. now. If you're not back by 5.20, I'm leaving without you. I can't stay here. Not after this. Leave without me? Even if she does get outside, how will she escape Kyle's guards? A thought creeps into the back of my mind, and I study Benny, my former friend. Are her intentions good, or is this just another part of Kyle's scheme? Are you really on my side? I ask. How do I know you're not leading me into a trap? Benny sighs. You don't. Well, that's comforting, I say. Aria, you can choose to trust me or you can leave. Go, back through that painting and then to wherever you came from. But look. She goes to a large window in the kitchen, just above the sink, and lifts the blinds. All I see is green, a sickly wash of color over the glittering skyscrapers and the horizon. In the distance, the tiny black ships seem larger than they were only moments ago. They are approaching. The force field will be completed within the hour. I overheard Kyle talking about it. The Ares will be sealed off from the depths, protected. Everything up until now has been preparation for what's about to happen, she warns me. And then there's no turning back. I think about all of the people I've met recently, 
men, women, and children, mystics and humans. I think about the promises I made, about the kind of Manhattan where mystics can live without fear of being drained, where people from the depths can live a life equal to those of the Aries dwellers. This is what I believe in. I grit my teeth and pull down my father's sleeves. I try to harness some of his power, his swagger, his attitude. I have one shot at this. I better make it count. Using my touch me, I send a brief text to Hunter, Turk, and the others, letting them know what's going on. I don't want them to worry about me or do anything to endanger themselves. Then I click off the device and stuff it into my back pocket. All right, I say to Benny. Let's do this. Chapter 21 The elevator doors close on Benny, leaving her behind as I quickly descend into the depths of this building, alone. Butterflies fill my stomach. Danny and his family were murdered. Benny and Kyle's relationship is as false as my engagement to Thomas was. I would never in a million years have guessed that the messages were from her. And now I only have a matter of minutes, it seems, to try to change my brother's mind about his decision to let Philadelphia invade Manhattan. I tried to muster up whatever courage Davida must have felt the night she took on Hunter's glamour. She knew she was about to die, and yet she did what she felt she had to, for us and for Manhattan. Now, in a way, disguised as my father, I am doing the same thing. I just hope it works. I glance down at my father's hands, and see that the fingertips are beginning to turn green. My glamour is beginning to fade. I shut my eyes and picture my father, his dark hair and his strong, resilient face. My head throbs as I feel my blood begin to move, warming my entire body. Above the elevator doors, red numbers flash as I drop so quickly it hardly feels like I'm moving at all. I pass through the Aries and down into the depths. When I reach the first floor, I take a deep breath. This is it. Then there is a soft ding, and the elevator opens into a sea of darkness. I stare ahead into what appears to be a narrow hallway with almost no natural light. Other hallways run off to my right and left, like a maze. Per Benny's instructions, I expect there to be two rows soldiers waiting at the elevator bank as I emerge. There are none. This is not good, I think. Have I been betrayed? The elevator doors close behind me, and I stand there, listening. I hear voices, only I can't tell from which direction they're coming. I take a step forward as my eyes adjust. Metal sconces line the hallway, giving off only the faintest stream of light. I can see a few feet in front of me, but no more. I've taken only a few steps when I nearly smack into a tall, uniformed man, the Rose family insignia glowing brightly in the dark hallway. He has a tank-like chest and a ruddy, pockmarked face. Just behind him is another soldier, even taller than the first, his black eyes staring at me with confusion. Normally I would be intimidated, but I'm Johnny Rose, and Johnny Rose is never intimidated. Guards, I say in my father's rich baritone. They salute me. Sir, the first one says, staring at me. We assumed that you and Mrs. Rose assume and you make an ass of yourself. I say harshly, and since you work for me, your assumptions make an ass of me. I blink. Do you think I'm an ass, soldier? Both men shake their heads. Of course not, sir, the second one says. Good, I say, shoving my hands in my pockets in case they start turning green. My headache has intensified, and I worry I won't be able to keep up my father's glamour much longer. Where is Kyle? I must speak with him. We will take you to him immediately, sir says one of the soldiers. And I will be notifying my son that neither of you were at your post, I reply. My father never says thank you. I hear them both suck in air. Yes, sir, one of them says. Follow me. The men hurry in front of me, and soon the narrow hallway opens into a large space. I have to stifle my reaction. When Benny said that the bottom floor was a former butcher shop, what she really meant was slaughterhouse. The space here is open like an atrium, going up at least three floors. It's like the warehouse where we found Alyssa Genevieve, but twice as big and twice as frightening. The large windows are frosted glass, allowing light to filter in, but giving no view of the outside world. Despite the size of the room, the air feels dank and sweaty. 
Large pieces of machinery stand like monuments, and over toward one of the walls the flooring changes to tiles with large circular drains, above which dangle a dozen oversized metal hooks. As the soldiers lead me toward the back, I begin to sweat uncontrollably, imagining cattle and sheep being herded to their deaths through this room. I wonder if I will meet the same fate. The concrete floor is stained with dark swirls and globs of reddish-brown. More blood, reminding me of the scene upstairs. Death seems to linger in the air. I pick up my pace, following the men in front of me, hoping to be out of here as soon as possible. Eventually, we reach the other side of the room, where a door leads into another hallway, and then to still another door. One of the soldiers submits to a retina scan, and the metal door slides open. Mr. Rose, they say in unison. I nod and walk inside. This, I realize quickly, is Kyle's headquarters. Uniformed officers sit at terminals, wearing headsets and snapping orders to other soldiers who must be outside. The walls are covered in large touch-me screens that link to cameras outside the building. I see a shot of the Philadelphia boats approaching the west side piers. Another screen is full of rose soldiers hurting a crowd of men and women. I watch as a soldier shoots a man in the leg, and the woman next to him is forced to move along, her face covered in dirt and tears. I am glad there is no accompanying sound. The depths are in full chaos. The Rose soldiers wear uniforms with a red rose insignia above their hearts, a constant reminder of who they are fighting for. Not the people of Manhattan, but rather my family. Or at least, whatever's left of it. As I enter the room, a stillness washes over the place. Soldiers stare at me from their seats. I don't recognize them, but they certainly recognize me. One of the men who accompanied me here points to the back of the room. There, he says. I walk toward a solid black door and submit to a retina scan as well. For a second, I worry that I won't pass, but then there is a loud beep and the door slides open. There, in the middle of the room, is my brother. The first thing I notice is that he is alone, save for one guard who stands against the white cinder block wall, a gun at his side. There is a small television screen here, as well as a metal chair and a cot with a thin mattress. Does Kyle sleep here? Father, Kyle says. He turns and squints at me, quickly wiping his nose. His normally combed blonde hair is unkempt, and his blue eyes stare at me with a distilled hatred that I find unnerving. What do you want? Kyle says. I thought you'd left. I have a flash of memory of the sweet, gentle boy who played with me when we were small. But it's been far too long since he's been that boy. Kyle is gaunt. He's wearing loose-fitting black slacks and a white dress shirt open at the neck with the sleeves rolled up. Stubble covers his pink cheeks, and his lips are cracked. Soon, I say, peering around the room. I'm leaving soon. I motion to the soldier. A moment alone with my son? The soldier narrows his eyes and doesn't move. I look to Kyle. He sighs, then nods for the soldier to leave. I wait until the door slides shut. What are you doing here? Kyle asks, sounding like a petulant child. Despite the air conditioning, his forehead is damp with sweat. You left me in charge, remember? I remember. If you've come to tell me that you don't approve of our alliance with Philadelphia, I don't care. I made my own decision. He nervously pats his pants pockets, and I realize he must have a gun. I don't have any weapon other than my mystic powers, and if I use those... Surely all of the guards outside will know I'm not really Johnny Rose. You're done, old man, Kyle says angrily, his eyes red with rage. Over. You had your time. Now I make the rules. Then it hits me. Kyle hates my father more than anyone, even more than he hates me. If that's true, I may well not be able to convince him to change his mind. I left you in charge for a reason, I tell Kyle, trying to sound believable as my father. But I didn't mean for you to give half of the city away to Philadelphia and let them destroy the other half. The person who will successfully run the city is someone who acknowledges that the mystics and the poor have been trod under the heels of our families for too long. I continue. A unified city is the only way to go. I know that, Kyle says. That's why I'm enlisting Cotter's help. He runs Philadelphia like Manhattan should have been run. 
No mystic revolts, no uprisings from the poor. People there know their place, and that's how it's going to be here. I snort. Cotter is going to steal this city right out from under you. He's a foreigner. He is usurping power when I am handing power to you on a silver platter. Kyle gawps at me with disbelief. Oh, you're just giving me power, right? You're such a good father. You want me to succeed. Is that it? You never believed in me. You're leaving the city in shambles with me to clean up the mess, and that's only because Garland and Thomas Foster are dead. I've made mistakes, I say, realizing this isn't something my father would say. But what choice do I have if I want to make things right? People still believe in the roses. They're looking to you now for help. Don't bring someone else into the mix. You can be the person Manhattan needs you to be. Kyle doesn't interrupt me, so I continue. All you have to do is apologize to the mystics. Apologize? Kyle growls, approaching me and flexing his fingers. He is full of resentment and fury, no longer the clean-cut leader he presents in his press conferences and announcements. The Kyle I am staring at right now is simply deranged. Are you crazy, old man? Apologize and get them on your side, I say. Then the mystics can help you enforce the rules. Kyle stares at me like a volcano on the verge of eruption. <laughs> let me guess. All I have to do is promise not to drain the mystics and let them vote and not force them to live in a ghetto and blah, blah, blah. Is that where you're heading? I don't answer his question. This doesn't need to end poorly. Just follow my lead and we'll all be all right. I realize as soon as the words are out of my mouth that I've said the wrong thing. Kyle jerks back. Follow your lead? I mean, don't touch me, he screams, pulling a gun from his pocket and pointing it at me. Stay away from me, you monster. My head is pounding again. Kyle's shouting seems amplified, almost like he's yelling directly into my ears. My throat tightens and I feel unsteady on my feet. I start to sit, but Kyle hollers, Don't move! I stay where I am. You're disgusting, he says. You destroyed everything I ever loved. Anything that was ever good or right about me you took away. I will never forgive you. He waves the gun at me. Then, in his frustration, he closes his hand into a fist and punches the wall. The white cinder blocks explode like they were made of cardboard. Kyle stares down at his knuckles, which are barely scraped. Then he tilts his head at me and smiles. For a second, I'm reminded of the picture of him kissing Danny, of his smile. But that was joyful, full of love. Now Kyle's smile is gruesome, menacing underneath the fluorescent lighting. His body is full of a mean kind of frenzy. As Benny said, he seems capable of anything, which for me right now is not a good thing. I feel the blood draining from my face, and I worry that my glamour is disappearing. If Kyle sees that I've deceived him, he'll surely kill me. With every ounce of energy I have, I will my glamour to remain intact. I clench my jaw as I feel my limbs warm with energy, my blood slowly stirring. Before I can speak, the door slides open and one of Kyle's guards enters. Sir, he says, the people in the depths are revolting. We need extra men out there. Kyle softens momentarily, and I see a flash of worry cross his face. Stay here, he says, pointing his gun at me. Don't move. He leaves the room and begins bellowing orders. I hear a commotion. Slowly, I make my way over to the cot. I know I will faint if I don't sit down. By now, the soldiers in the other room must have checked the grid and discovered that my father isn't actually in Manhattan, that I'm nothing but an imposter. Benny must be gone. Thanks to my text, Hunter and the others know I'm down here somewhere, but how they will ever find me is a mystery. I rest my head in my hands. My body is buzzing with energy, making me feel even sicker, more helpless. I still feel hot, like I have a fever. I loosen the collar of my father's dress shirt, which is completely soaked with sweat. My mind swirls with images of Kyle and my father and Davida, memories from her heart trying to fight their way to the surface. Am I going to die here, alone? I have failed. Failed the people of Manhattan. Failed my friends, my family, even Kyle. Worst of all, I have failed Davida, who sacrificed her future for mine. 
tears begin to flow uncontrollably. I close my eyes, and the first image that comes to me is of Turk. It's not how handsome he is. Nothing to do with his muscular arms or his tattoos or his motorcycle. Instead, I hear his voice calming me, telling me that he loves me. I can see his eyes staring into mine, those hazel eyes with flecks of green and yellow, full of emotion. I feel a sharp pain in my chest, and this is when I realize that I've never told Turk I love him. Three simple words that seem so easy to say, and I've never said them. Will I see him before I die? I begin to cry even harder because I fear he will never know how I truly feel about him. The pain in my chest overwhelms me. I lie back on the cot and feel my consciousness slip away. Chapter 22 I knock gently on the door. Kyle! There is no response. It's Davida. Magdalena said you sent for me. I hear a rustling in the bedroom, and then the door slides open. Kyle is a wreck. He's wearing the same clothes as yesterday, and his eyes are bloodshot. Come in, he says. He sits on the bed and stares up at me. His blonde hair is disheveled, and he looks miserable. His cheeks are wet with tears, and there are tissues scattered all over the place, on his desk, on his floor, crumpled up on his bedding. It's nearly nine at night. As far as I know, he hasn't eaten all day. So, I say. He stares at the floor. So, yesterday. You don't have to explain, I tell him. I'm a maid. He doesn't owe me anything. I want to, he says. He blinks, and I see the pain in his eyes. I, Danny and I are together, he says in an agonized rush. You're the first... I've never told anyone except Benny, and, and that's only because she walked in on us. But she's keeping quiet. I wonder why Kyle's girlfriend would stay silent on such a matter, but I'm too nervous to ask. And really, it's not my place. I didn't mean for it to happen. It just did. Kyle laughs. Danny is amazing. The best person I've ever met. Kind, caring, nothing like anyone in this family. He's good, you know? He can't help but smile. I never meant to hurt anyone, or lie. We started out as friends, but it just grew. One of my father's associates, a woman, she's a mystic, helped me create a loophole with the library painting, only I didn't tell her why I wanted one. He stares at me seriously. Do you think I'm awful? I place my gloved hand on his knee. Of course not. Do you love him? Kyle nods. That's all that matters. I tell him, love is supposed to make you happy. Don't let it be something that ruins you. I wish I could take my own advice and tell Hunter how I truly feel about him, that he shouldn't be with Arya. He should be with me. But the heart wants what it wants, and his heart wants Arya. There isn't a thing I can do to change his mind. But what will people think, he says. He looks like he's been through hell. My sister, my parents, they'll never accept me. My father would kill me before he would let me be. He chokes back his words, and I realize how torn he must be, how his feelings are eating him up inside. They'll come around, I say, even though I have no idea if that's true. Johnny Rose is far from accepting, but surely he loves his son, and ultimately he will understand. I have to believe that. No! Kyle stands, grabbing his hair with his hands and pulling in frustration. I'm going to end things. It's over. Over? I ask. Is that what you really want? Kyle looks at me sadly. What choice do I have? I think for a moment. Love, I say. You can choose love. This isn't a fairy tale, Kyle says. There is no happy ending. I wish there were. But love doesn't always prevail, Davida. Sometimes you have to be realistic. My father expects me to follow in his footsteps. You still can, I say. He shakes his head. No, he's too proud. If people knew what I was, who I loved, my father would only view it as a weakness. He'd think people would stop respecting him. Look what he did to Arya. I think of the lengths to which Johnny Rose went to keep his daughter from loving a mystic. What would he do if he found out about Danny and Kyle? The answer can't be good. But does that mean Kyle should deny his true self? 
Do you want to live your entire life in fear? I ask. Or in a lie to yourself and to others? I don't wait for him to respond. You love someone who loves you back. Don't let it go. Kyle lifts his head and studies me with his pale green eyes. You don't think I'm disgusting? Never. I messed up, he says softly. What do you mean? Someone saw us, he says. Me and Danny. Someone other than Benny. Danny's father, Martin. He realized what we're using the painting for. He's friendly with Johnny. I can't imagine he'd keep quiet. Danny hasn't returned any of my calls or texts all day. What do you think I should do? I bite my bottom lip. It isn't my place to say. Should I get out of the city? Kyle asks. Help me, Davida. Maybe uh, go over to Danny's and get him to come with me? I'm worried his dad's going to... Just then, there's a knock at the door. Kyle, open up. It's Johnny Rose. Kyle jumps into action. Quick! He opens his closet door. Get in! His closet is practically as big as my bedroom. I step inside, and he whispers, Quiet! Then he closes the closet door and opens the door to his bedroom. I can't see what's happening, but I listen. Martin Fogg called me this morning. What were you thinking? Mr. Rose says harshly, behaving so ludicrously. Have you forgotten you are part of the most important family in this city? Did you think you wouldn't be monitored? I can't hear Kyle's response. I lean closer. There is no excuse for this filthy behavior. Mr. Rose is yelling now, and I hear something break, like it was smashed against the wall. You care nothing about this family, Mr. Rose is saying, and I think I can hear Kyle crying. You're an embarrassment, a waste of the Rose name. I'm in love, Kyle shouts. There is silence, and then I hear a loud thud, like a body hitting the floor. From this point forward, Johnny Rose says, you are no longer my son. You are nothing to me. You exist solely to continue the family line, and if you defy me, you will be eliminated. You will say nothing to anyone about this. It never happened. I have already taken care of your friend and his family. One wrong step, and you're next. Taking care of what? Kyle says, raising his voice in fear. What have you done? I hear a sickening thud and a groan as someone, I assume Kyle, falls to the floor again. I have done what needed to be done, Johnny Rose says sternly, his controlled anger so realized and frightening that it makes the hairs on my arms stand up, to protect this family from ridicule and from harm. I have sacrificed for you, and there will be no more words about it. Do you understand me? I hear another groan. I said, Mr. Rose says harshly, do you understand me? Kyle says, so softly I can barely hear him. Good. I am paralyzed with fear. I hear Johnny Rose exit, and only then am I able to take my first real breath. I press the touchpad inside the closet, and the room comes back into view. Kyle lies in the middle of the floor, face down, his chest heaving. I go over to him and place my arm around his shoulders. Shh, I whisper. You're going to be okay. That's a lie. I know he won't ever be okay. Based on what I overheard, his father took the one thing from him that mattered. I feel scared for Kyle. Scared for how this will change him. For what he might become. After what seems like forever, Kyle's breathing becomes less labored. I hand him a handkerchief from my pocket, and he wipes his red face with it. Then he hardens, stands up, steps away from me, and points to the door. Go? His order surprises me. Kyle, I say, I'm so... Go, he repeats. And never speak of this. I can tell from his expression that he means business. And so I do as he instructs. I leave. I wake up on the cot and find myself staring directly into my brother's eyes. Now is hardly the time for napping, he says to me. Slowly, I swing my feet forward and attempt to sit up. The good news is that my legs are still my father's legs, my body still my father's body. The bad news is that I feel worse than I have ever felt before. 
I ache all over, and my headache is numbing. It's difficult to think, to breathe even. I feel stabbing pains in my chest. I'm dying, I find myself saying to Kyle. And it's not a lie. I can feel myself slipping away, my strength fading. I don't have much time left. I don't care, Kyle says to me. You can die here on this shitty little cot and I'll be happy. I force my eyes open and look at my brother. I can tell the memory Davida gave me is her last gift to me. I finally know what happened to Kyle, what changed him. My father. I still don't know all the details, but I know enough. Kyle was not the one responsible for the death of Danny and his family. He loved Danny. It was my father who had them killed, because he considered Kyle and Danny's love a threat to our family's domination over Manhattan, in the same way that Hunter and I were a threat. And he was right. The only difference is that Johnny Rose missed with Hunter. With Danny, he zeroed right in on his target. The thought of an entire family perishing makes me sick, and makes me hate my parents even more, especially since my father actually liked the Fogs, at least as much as he was capable of liking anyone. Despite all of my brother's terrible actions, he was wronged. Now it's up to me to make things right, and I know exactly what I need to say. I'm sorry. Kyle looks at me strangely. What? I'm sorry for what happened, I say, thinking of Danny's home, the evil that visited there. Whether or not my father did the actual killing, I know Kyle has seen it, too. The shock on Kyle's face like I slapped him. You're sorry? I nod. I'm supposed to care that you're sorry? He says to me. And he leans down and punches me in the stomach. I double over as bile fills my mouth, dripping out of my lips and onto the cement floor. For a second, Kyle seems surprised. Then he punches me again. The blow resonates throughout my entire body with almost unbearable pain. I hate you, Kyle says, his voice wavering. I will always hate you, and you're not sorry. You just want me to think you are so you can control me. I shake my head. No, that's not it. I am sorry. Though I still look like my father, I find myself speaking from my own heart. I've witnessed my father murder someone right before my eyes. I know what it feels like to have him ruin your life just because he wants to, because he can. My father stole my memories. I almost lost Hunter because of him. But Kyle has suffered too. I just never knew it until now. I'm sorry for not understanding you. I tell him, and for ignoring you. And I am. I was too busy pursuing my own secret romance to be there for my brother. You deserve more from me, and I didn't give it to you. No matter what happens now, I am sorry for the pain you went through. I wish I could change the past, but I can't. I wipe my mouth with the back of my hand and see that all of my fingers are green, a dark, deep green too obvious to conceal, I move my hands behind my back, but I can feel my body shrinking, changing back to normal. It feels like I've been placed in a vice and someone is twisting me back to normal. My skin tingles and my heart rate increases. I scream in pain as I find myself swimming in my father's clothes, staring at my older brother, caught. Aria? He says, genuinely shocked. I nod. Kyle shakes his head in disbelief. It was you the whole time. You know about Danny? I tell my brother about how I found Davida's heart and swallowed it, how I took on her powers. At this point, there's nothing left to hide. Either he's going to kill me, or I'm going to die from the heart inside me. He might as well know the truth. His expression softens just a bit, and he stands up straight. I don't know what to say, he tells me. Whatever happens, I say to him, our parents are gone. You know as well as I do, they're never coming back. So be yourself. Don't hide who you are. Father was wrong to do what he did to you. Kyle swallows nervously, and something about the way he's standing, leaning to one side, reminds me of the boy he used to be before all of this. To both of us, he says. What do you mean? I ask. Father was wrong to do what he did to both of us, Kyle repeats. I think of how long I've been at odds with Kyle. It feels unfair that we're finally speaking to one another now that I'm about to die. 
He has done awful things, taken innocent lives, caused untold suffering. That is the work of a bad person. But now that I see what happened to him, now that I understand that he lost the most important person in his life, I can't help but feel sorry for him. I shouldn't have ratted you and Hunter out to father, Kyle says, and I see that his eyes are brimming with tears. I was doing so much stick, and I was so angry. I wanted to prove to father that I was a real man, worthy of the Rose name, and at the same time, I wanted to kill him. I had all these fantasies about how I would make him pay. I lost track of everything else. He clenches his hands into fists. It's not what Danny would have wanted for me. It's been weeks since he... Kyle snorts back what sounds like tears and mucus. The whites of his eyes are red, the corners leaky. If I hadn't gotten involved with him, he'd still be alive. His family would still be alive. You loved him, I say. You can't choose who you love. Danny wouldn't want you to be punishing yourself like this, Kyle. I stare at my brother, a shell of a person wrecked by guilt and grief. It's not too late for you, I tell him. Don't you see? He's about to answer when the door is broken down in a flash of green light so bright that I close my eyes. When I open them, Hunter is standing in the middle of the room, arms out, rays of green light spiraling from his fingertips. He is wearing his black fighting gear, silver stripes down the sides of his pants. He is strong, powerful, ready to save the day. Only despite his best intentions, I'm not sure he can. You, Hunter says to Kyle. Hunter? I say softly from the cot. Turk, Hunter calls out. She's in here. My ears prick up at the sound of Turk's name. And then he rushes into the room, crouching beside me and sweeping me into his arms. His skin feels hot against mine, but I don't mind. I just want him as close as possible. Are you all right? Turk whispers to me. We got your text and followed you. We were so worried. Kyle, I respond. Both Hunter and Turk stare at my brother. Not so big and strong without all of your men, eh? Hunter says, puffing out his chest and moving in closer. My brother just stands there, holding his gun, looking defeated. Shannon and Yarrick are outside, Hunter says to me. Rhea's back at your parents' apartment. There were only a few soldiers in this whole place. Easy enough for the four of us to take down. He cocks his head at Kyle. I figured you'd have more of your bodyguards here. I sent them outside, Kyle says. People were rioting in the streets. His voice is calm, even. He doesn't seem angry at all. People are rioting because of what you are doing, Hunter says angrily. What you've already done. Do you know how many people have died because of you? How many people are about to die? He steps closer and swipes his hand through the air. The long green rays blend together into a thick saber of light, which almost seems to purr as he points it directly at Kyle's throat. I should kill you right now. Do it, Kyle says. I deserve it. Hunter raises an eyebrow. You think I was born yesterday? Hunter, I managed to say. We talked. Turk presses his hand to my forehead. She's burning up. We have to get her out of here. He takes off my father's suit jacket and throws it on the floor, wiping some of the sweat off my neck with his hands. Then he rips open the shirt I'm wearing at the neck and rolls up the sleeves, trying to cool me down. Kyle, I say, will you... will you change your mind? Hunter glances back and forth between us. What's going on? Kyle takes a deep breath. I was wrong. No, Hunter says. I don't trust you. I was wrong, and I see that now. Kyle drops his gun on the floor. I surrender. I don't want to do this anymore. Believe him, I say to Hunter. Then I look into Turk's eyes. Please believe him. I go from hot to cold instantaneously. Before I know it, I feel cold, colder than I ever have before, like I've been soaked in an ice bath. I can barely breathe. Turk stares down at me, his eyes wet. I couldn't find the sister, he whispers to me. I can't save you, Arya. He takes my hand in his. Hunter's ray is still fixed on Kyle's throat. You want me to believe you? Hunter says to Kyle. Then stop this. Stop the force field. Stop the men from Philadelphia. 
Stop it all, and then, maybe, I will believe you. Guys! It's Shannon's voice. I watch as she enters the room and stops, taking it all in. Kyle, Hunter, me in Turk's arms. We have a problem, Shannon says, worried. Her hair is loose and wild. We can see on the Tachmis out there that the boats from Philadelphia have docked. The soldiers are on the ground in the depths, and there's a lot of blood. At this, Hunter's energy buzzes. He shifts his hand, and the long green ray hovers just above the hollow of Kyle's throat. Stop it, he repeats. Stop this now. I crane my neck to see Kyle, who seems terrified. I wish I could, he says. And from the sound of his voice, I believe him. Really, I do. But it's too late. Chapter 23 What do you mean it's too late? Hunter says, his mystic ray still at Kyle's throat. Hunter's handsome features are twisted into a dangerous-looking mask. His lips are curled, teeth exposed like he's some kind of feral animal. His energy blazes. One wrong move and it will surely pierce my brother's skin. The plans are already in motion, Kyle says stiffly. Like she said. He nods at Shannon. The boats from Philadelphia have docked, and my soldiers have allowed them into the depths. There's nothing I can do. Can't you order them to stop killing innocent people? Shannon says, her voice shaking. Before my brother can respond, a loud boom sounds outside. Then the ground beneath our feet begins to shake, like the floor might crack open and suck us all in. An explosion. There are no windows in the room, but surely it must come from the invasion by the Philadelphians. I can't stop my men, Kyle says. But once I do, they'll probably just be murdered by the Philadelphia Army. Cotter and I had an agreement. Once the Ares was sealed off and protected, he could do whatever he wanted in the depths. He sighs. There is no way I can change things now. I wish I knew what was actually creating the force field. Is it something that will stay in place now that it's up, or can we turn it off? And what will happen if we do? I try to ask but I can barely move my lips and no sound comes out of my mouth. What if you told him the deal was off? Turk suggests. He'd have to leave, right? I can try, Kyle says, but I doubt he'll listen. Cotter is an angry man, like my father. Well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, Shannon says, crossing her arms in disgust. We hear another boom outside, softer this time, and shouting, but I can't make out what's being said. We can't just stand here and do nothing, even if we just go out there and fight. She motions to the door. We have to help. I can no longer feel my fingers. They're numb, like they're resting in bowls of ice. My head is swimming, and I can barely register what's going on around me. I focus only on Turk's eyes staring down at me, his arms wrapped around me. She's not going to make it, I hear him say. What if you stop the force field? Hunter suggests. Undo it. The Ares won't be safe anymore, and Cotter will have to stop his men. Even he won't want to hurt the richest people in Manhattan. Kyle doesn't respond immediately, and I know that's because he thinks this is actually a good idea. I don't know how, he says. What? says Hunter. I don't know how to stop the force field, Kyle repeats. I can hear the frustration in his voice. Well, take us to it, Shannon says. Wherever you're operating it from, whatever it is you're doing, whatever you're siphoning this energy from, if you show it to us, I'm sure we can help. Kyle nods in agreement. Turk lifts me in his arms, standing up from the cot. I can see Hunter place a hand on Kyle's shoulder, making a march in front of us. If you try to run, I will kill you, Hunter says, without hesitation. I believe you. Kyle stares at me with a mixture of fear and pity. Follow me. Being carried by Turk makes me feel like I'm floating. Is this what it's like to die? To have all one's mass evaporating into nothing? Into air? I hope so. And I hope that death is less painful than what I feel now. My body feels wrecked. My skin feels like it's been scraped with rocks. My tongue is sandpaper in my mouth. Everything hurts. And now I'm hot again, like I've been roasted over an open fire, like I'm burning from the inside out. I can hear the soft ding of the elevator, and I feel us moving, ascending toward the Ares. 
I wonder where Benny is now, if she's already fled, and where Kiki is, if she's still in Manhattan, if she's safe. I can't help but imagine what is going on outside. Has a full-on war broken out? Are people being killed in the streets, exterminated by Cotter's army? Surely the rebels must be fighting, although there aren't many of them. If the mystics and non-mystics of the depths stand together and fight, will they have any chance of defeating Philadelphia? Have any other cities come to our aid? I seem to recall Rhea mentioning that the Philadelphia rebel mystics had a plan. I hear the elevator ding again and my eyelids flutter open. I look up at Turk, who carries me through the open doors into a space full of light. We stop moving and I hear Turk say, Crap. Then I open my eyes. The room we are standing in is like the draining room back in my father's office building, only brighter. The space is a dazzling white. The ceiling, walls, and floor are made up of what seem to be thousands of tubes covered by a thin sheet of glass. The tubes continue up the back wall and then out of it, leading where, I don't know. In the center of the room, about six feet off the ground, is a completely translucent ball, almost like the bubbles Kiki and I used to blow when we were small. This one is massive, at least ten feet in diameter. The edges of the bubble crackle and spark like live wires, glowing with a nearly blinding whiteness and filling the space with a low hum. Two long tubes protrude from the ball, twisting like snakes and funneling out a misty white energy. Suspended in the middle of the sphere is a young girl. She can't be more than sixteen, and her skin is so pale I can see the blue veins under the surface. Not pale. Clear. Like all the pigmentation in her body has been sucked away. Her arms and legs are outstretched, and nearly invisible threads of light green energy run from each finger into the tubes and out of her circular prison. Her eyes are closed. She is completely naked, with long, stark white hair that flows practically down to her feet. It's almost like she's sleeping, but I know that she isn't, that whatever has been done to her is completely unnatural. Hunter and Shannon are dumbstruck, staring up at the girl. Kyle stands in the middle of the room, embarrassed and defeated. Who's that? I croak. Who? Turk doesn't respond to me. Next to him, Shannon and Yarrick are still, their mouths wide open in shock. Do they know this girl? Hunter is the only one who reacts. How did this happen? He demands, shoving Kyle to the floor so violently that I hear the sound of something crack. Start talking, Rose. Hunter flares his fingers, and they begin to glow. He holds out his hands, directing his energy once again at Kyle. One wrong move, and my brother is toast. I expect my brother to fight back, but he doesn't. Instead, he exhales nervously, and the words start to flow out. Just after the Empire State Building explosion, my men encountered a woman in the depths. We were told she was a powerful mystic. We followed her and forced our way into her home. Who was she? Shannon asks. Her name was Lyrica, my brother says. I gasp audibly, struck by this admission. I have so many questions I want to ask, but my mouth and my brain don't seem connected. Turk attempts to calm me crouching on the floor and letting me rest with my back against his chest. Inside, another mystic was there. Kyle glances at the girl in the middle of the room. I recognized her immediately. How? Shannon asks. Most humans have no idea she even exists, let alone what she looks like. Alyssa Genevieve spoke of her, told me what to do if I ever encountered her. Kyle responds. And so I used it to my advantage. From my position on the floor, I can feel Turk's heart pounding in his chest. The puzzle pieces begin to fit together. In the triage center, Lyrica told me that she deserved to die. They came for me, she told me. I was protecting her, and they came for me. Alyssa had a plan, Kyle says, to use mystic energy to fuel a powerful force field, a way to seal off the city from any potential intruders, to create a safe space. I thought it was an idea Johnny would get behind, 
only he was far more interested in selling mystic energy than using it all up to create a mystic shield. He focuses on me. Then things happened with you, and Alyssa died. When I saw that Father was going to leave Manhattan, I realized this could be my moment to do something great, something completely unexpected. Yes, Turk says dryly. You're a real hero. Kyle ignores the barb. I'd been in my father's draining room before. I'd seen the process, but I had no idea where to find such a massive source of mystic energy. Even with what was left in the city reserves, it wouldn't have been possible to form such a thing. He looks up. Until I found her. Someone must have told you what to do, Shen says, surveying the scene. This is complex magic. Alyssa left a basic plan, Kyle says, for setting up this draining system. He motions to the glass tubes leaving the sphere and snaking their way into the walls. But Lyrico was the one who provided the real answers. I don't believe it, Hunter says. She would never betray her own kind. Oh, Kyle says. She didn't. We tortured her for hours, and she wouldn't give in. Nothing. Finally, the girl herself told us what we needed to know. I believe she wanted to save Lyrica's life, and that she didn't think we would ever follow through with our plan. He grimaces. She was wrong. I finally realize why Lyrica was resigned to her death. She blamed herself for the force field, even though it wasn't really her fault. With all the strength I can muster, I whisper to Turk. Who is it? Turk blinks like he doesn't believe what he's staring at. That, he says finally, is the last remaining sister. Suddenly, it begins to make sense. I sent for her. And she never arrived, Turk admits. At least, I thought she never arrived. You sent for her? Yarrick asks. This is clearly the first time he's hearing of this. After Arya swallowed Davida's heart, Turk explains. I knew it was too powerful for her body and that she would have to have it removed. Lyrica told me she didn't know what to do, but she would help locate her sister. I never heard back from her, so I assumed she couldn't find her. But she was here, Shannon says. She did come. And she was abducted before she could reach us, Hunter says. It's her energy that's been creating the force field. He turns to Kyle with eyes like daggers. Do you have any idea what you've done? The last remaining sister, the most important mystic in the world? And you've killed her. He motions to the sphere of light, like she's nothing, a toy for you to use and throw away once you're done. You're disgusting. Kyle closes his eyes. And for what? Turk adds, trembling. For power? To make a statement? I was wrong, Kyle says. I'm sorry. That's not good enough, Hunter cries. I watch as Shannon steps over to him, placing a hand on his shoulder. You have every right to hate me, Kyle says. But there's nothing I could do now. I can't change the past. Is she really gone? Shannon says. The shield is still in place, so she has to be alive, right? Turk. Hunter says, wiping his eyes and motioning to his best friend. You're the healer. What do you think? Still holding me, Turk studies the sister. She is completely motionless, eyes closed. I wonder if she has any idea where she is or what's happening to her. Is she in pain, unable to call out? Or is it like she's in a deep, deep sleep? From looking at her, it seems that she's been drained to a vegetative state, Turk says. She's alive, but just barely. Shannon stares up at the sphere. We could unplug the tubes. Then the sister would surely die, Hunter says, turning to me. And so would Arya. The sister can't save Arya, Shannon says, pointing to me. She's never going to wake up. She's lost too much energy. But if we unplug the tubes, then we can stop the force field and stop Cotter. So our only choice is to let Arya die, Turk says angrily. I won't let that happen. I try to speak, but no words come out. I want to tell them not to worry about me, to let me die, to save the city. Kyle clears his throat. The force field won't stay active if the machine is turned off. The energy that's been drained from her and released into the Ares will be funneled back here. Into this room. 
He peers around at the system of glass tubes and the sphere in the center of the room where the sister is suspended. What happens to the sister if we do that? Yarek asks. She might survive, Turk says, but she's already so weak. She has no way to prepare herself. He looks nervously to Hunter. There's a good chance a body would simply explode. What's the second option? Shannon asks my brother. I'm not sure there is a second option, Kyle says sheepishly from his spot on the floor, Hunter's energy still focused on him. I only learned how to set up the mystic shield. I was never much concerned with what happened to the mystic inside it. So what? Shannon tosses her head back. We just cross our fingers and hope we don't accidentally murder the last remaining sister? I don't want that burden on my shoulders. I'm not sure what choice we have, Hunter says. We can't risk destroying the sister, Turk says. There's a chance we could revive her. He squeezes my hand. She's the only one who can help Arya. Let's say we do this, Hunter says. We capture all the energy that's been released. Even if it doesn't kill the sister, who's to say that Cotter will actually call off his soldiers once the shield is down? Fair point, Turk says. Maybe he'll attack the Ares then, too. Claim all of Manhattan for his own. Shannon throws up her arms. That's a risk I'm willing to take. Well, I'm not, Turk snarls. They continue to argue. Then, from the corner of the room, Yarrick says, There's another way. The others focus their attention on him. Someone can take the sister's place. Yarrick points to the large ball of energy in the center of the room. I remember when Alyssa taunted me with her plans for the force field. She was going to ingest Davida's heart and use that extra power to create the shield. But once she did, she didn't want to use her own body to sustain it. She was going to use another mystic's energy to keep the shield running, sucking up his energy until there was nothing left of him. And then she was going to get another, and then another, Yarrick says. Surely if she was planning on doing that, the sister can be switched out with someone else. Someone with mystic energy, Hunter says. It would have to be a seamless transfer. Keep the force field intact while we switch the bodies, then reverse the direction of the machines. Only, Yarrick says, that person will most certainly die. That kind of energy, so much so quickly, would be too much for one body to handle. So someone has to volunteer their life, Shannon says. A mystic? Who's going to do that? She crosses her arms. Not me, I can tell you that much. Just then, a soldier rushes into the room. His blood-stained uniform is ripped at the arm, and his face looks like it's been sliced with a razor. Sir, the soldier says to Kyle, there's a problem. Kyle's eyes widen. A problem, Tobias? The soldier glances at Kyle, at Hunter's mystic ray, and then at us, likely wondering if he is about to be killed. The Philadelphia Army? Tobias says, sounding bewildered. They're not who we thought they were. Kyle looks at Hunter. Let me go see what's happening. Maybe I can use this to our advantage. I don't trust you, Hunter says. We have no choice, Turk says. Let him go. Yarrick, you go with him. If he misbehaves, I won't hesitate to take him out, Yarrick says. Reluctantly, Hunter shakes his hand, letting the steady ray of green energy dissipate. He yanks Kyle to his feet and hands him off to Yarrick, and they follow the bloody soldier out of the room. We're wasting time, Shannon says, pacing the floor. We need to deal with this now. Kyle is dealing with it, Turk says. We need to save Arya. Arya did this to herself, Shannon motions to me. I'm practically curled up in a ball, clutching my chest. It's difficult to breathe, and the images around me blink in and out. I don't know how much longer I will last. Look, I want her to live just as much as either of you. Shannon glares at Hunter, then at Turk. Okay, maybe slightly less than you two, but still, I don't want her to die. But what can we possibly do to save her? She nods at the sister. She was the only thing that could help. Again, I try to speak, and this time a bit of sound comes out. I feel a tiny surge of energy. This is it. My last moments. She's right, I say softly. Arya? Turk presses his hand to my forehead. She's on fire. Stay with us, Arya, he says. Please. The bright light from the room reflects off his face. 
making his silver earrings glint and giving him a kind of rebel angel glow. Before I met Hunter and the mystics, I never thought much about death. I was young. I had my entire life ahead of me. The most important thing I thought about was what I was going to wear when Kiki and I went out clubbing. If you had asked me, I would have guessed I'd die an old woman with tons of grandkids in my own bed. And then I fell in love for the first time. I made new friends. I realized that my parents were villains, not heroes. I met people who changed the way I thought about the world, who watched out for me as if I were their own, like Patrick Benedict and Lyrica. I made enemies, tons of them, humans and mystics alike, from Thomas Foster to Alyssa Genevieve to my own brother. But most of all, I learned the power of love. First love, like Hunter, and forever love, like Turk. Love that makes you strive to be a better person, because there's someone whose eyes light up when they see you, who yearns to press their lips to yours and tell you all the secrets of the world. Love is what makes life worth living. And now that I'm about to die, I realize how lucky I am to have so much of it in my life. Hunter, I whisper, be happy, live. Hunter blinks at Shannon, then at me. He understands what I mean. I gasp for air. It feels like I'm breathing through a tiny straw. Turk, I say. Turk forces out a smile. I love you. I'm relieved that I can finally say it, that he knows how I feel about him. I love you, Aria Rose. Always. Turk closes his eyes, pressing his lips to mine. It's the last kiss I will ever receive, and there is no one I would rather share it with. He pulls back, and I can see that he's crying. I want to tell him not to cry, to be happy, but there are no words left in me. I feel something speed up inside me, like a ticking clock. Shannon turns to Hunter and says, What a waste. Arya's life and the sister. I hear a commotion behind me. It's my brother. He's back. Arya, he says, leaning over me. Thank you for what you did for me, for what you said. I'm sorry I wasn't a better brother. I have no energy left to respond. I blink, nodding off. My vision becomes blurry. I'll do it, I hear Turk say. I'll take the sister's place. No! I want to scream, but I can no longer produce any sounds. Turk, you can't, Yarek says. Then I hear Hunter's voice. Turk, I can't let you sacrifice yourself. There's a pause. I'll do it. No! I hear Shannon shout angrily, but her voice seems far away, like she's in another room completely or somehow being muted. I look around, but all I can see is white. No people, no shadows. White. I don't want anyone to die for me. That's not how this story is supposed to end. I would never be able to live with myself if I was alive and Turk or Hunter was gone because of me. My skin feels incredibly tingly, like someone is pressing hair-thin needles into each of my pores. Faintly, I hear my brother say, Listen to me, all of you. I have an idea. Then I hear Turk's familiar voice, like a whisper. Shannon, give me your knife. Why? she says. Just do it. Suddenly, the white that's all around me begins to darken. Outlines form in shades of gray and black, I can see again, but just barely. I watch as Shen passes something long and silver over to Turk. He hovers above me, locking his eyes with mine as he says, Arya, do you trust me? I nod as best I can. I am fading, dying. Determination crosses Turk's face. And then he stabs me in the chest. They say that when you're about to die, your entire life flashes before your eyes. And while I don't see images of everything, my first steps, my first words, that sort of thing, I do see the people I knew and loved. Davida, with her wavy black hair, her face as bright as the sun. Kiki and Benny, laughing like they haven't a care in the world. Yarek, Rhea, Landon, and even Shannon, sitting around a dinner table in the hideout and sharing stories. Lyrica, with her long gray hair and her wise face. Patrick Benedict, who helped save me. Marcus, the little one I couldn't save. Kyle, his arms around Danny. 
Hunter, the first boy I ever loved, his sandy-colored hair tousled around his face, his piercing blue eyes winking goodbye to me. Turk, the last boy I will ever love, melting me with his soft voice and his warm touch. And even my family, whose faces seemed to blend together in the shape of a prickly red rose. This is what I think as I close my eyes for the last time. I am loved, and I have loved. And in all of life, truly, what is better than that? Epilogue I wake up in a familiar room. Then I realize it's my childhood bedroom. I am tucked into the bed I grew up in, the rose-colored sheets folded over across my chest. Is this heaven? Aria, a familiar voice says, You're awake. I turn my head, and Turk is there, sitting on a chair next to me. He's wearing an orange tank top that exposes the brightly colored tattoos on his arms, etchings I thought I would never see again. There's a hint of stubble on his cheeks and light purple circles underneath his eyes like he hasn't been getting enough sleep. He's all smiles, though, and he gazes at me with pure joy and relief. He leans down and plants a gentle kiss on my forehead. I am thrilled to see him, but then I remember where I am. Are you dead, too? I sit up, surprised I can move with no pain, and rest my head against the fabric of the headboard. What happened? No, Turk says. I'm not dead, and neither are you. He flicks on the touch-me screen. It's muted, but I see an image of the depths. Buildings blown to bits, metal and rock and glass strewn in piles of debris. The canals seem to be almost overflowing. But the people on the screen, and there must be hundreds of them that I can see, are rejoicing. They look wary, but there are smiles on their faces. I look at Turk. What happened? The boats from Philadelphia, he says. They came in and invaded the depths all right. Only they weren't Kata's army. They were rebel mystics. Rebel mystics? How? I ask. Turns out Carter had been kidnapped by the rebels. There was a man, Elias John, who had a power like Davida's, where he could take on another's glamour. He was parading around like Carter, fooling everyone. He's the one Kyle made the deal with. They came in and fought all the Rose soldiers, killing most of them, and liberated the deaths. I feel a smile wash across my face. Kyle's plan backfired, which is a good thing, because he had come to regret it anyway. The depths were not invaded and bombed. They were saved. The mystics, Hunter and Shannon, helped escape? They're fine, Turk says. Elias John took them aboard one of his ships. That's a relief, I say. Has there been a great deal of damage? Turk leans in and gives me another kiss. Nothing that can't be fixed. For a second... I allow myself to enjoy the feeling of his lips on my skin. Then I recall the sister and the mystic shield. What happened to the force field? I ask, glancing down at my hands, which are smaller than I remember, and, much to my surprise, not green at all. I remember how sick I was, feeling like I was about to die. I remember Turk standing over me, stabbing me. I gasp. What happened to me? Without saying anything, Turk stands up and extends his hand. I slip my own hand into his palm and stand up. I no longer have a headache. I'm no longer sweaty and weak. I feel light, strong, perfect. Turk helps me over to the mirror, resting against my bedroom wall. I am wearing a soft cotton nightgown. And then I see why I feel so good. I am staring at a stranger. My face is young my skin incredibly smooth. I'm shorter than I ever was, my eyes such a pale blue they are almost white. My nose swoops down in a straight slender line, and my lips are the palest shade of red. My skin is fair, and my hair is long and white, flowing almost all the way down to my feet. I'm speechless. I am the sister. How did this happen? I say softly. As you know, Turk says, a mystic's memories live in the heart. That's why you were able to access so many of the things that happened in Davida's past. 
Only since you had a human body, it was never meant to tolerate so much magic. Your body was poisoned. But the sister, he says, her body was fine. Perfect, actually. It's just that she had no magic left to her. Your brother had stolen all of her energy. I think back to the sister and the sphere my brother created, the shocking source of Kyle's mystic force field. Shannon said that it was such a waste what had happened, and it clicked for me. Turk says, I was going to volunteer to take the sister's place and save you, but in the end I didn't have to. Someone else did. We removed the sister from the draining contraption your brother created and were able to transfer your heart into her body. Because of what a strong mystic she was originally, she was able to absorb whatever amount of Davida's energy had infiltrated your own heart. So now, I'm a mystic, I say. Turk nods. Just like before, all of your memories intact. Just a different body. I study this foreign person in the mirror. The only thing I recognize is the tarnished silver locket around my neck. The heart-shaped relic I have managed to cling to since the eve of my engagement party. I grasp it in my hands and remember Lyrica's words to me right before she passed. You must die to be reborn. Her prophecy came true. I can't believe it. I gripped the locket in my hand. The first word that accompanied it was remember, a clue to help me uncover the memories my parents had stolen from me. Indeed, now the silver heart is a symbol of what I will never forget. What is true, Turk says. Then it hits me. I remember what Yarek said to us before I passed out, how they could use another person to absorb all of the mystic energy. That person would certainly die, but it would mean that I could live, and that the people of Manhattan wouldn't bear the burden of what had been done. The other person, I say, who took the sister's place. Did that person die? Turk nods sadly and motions again to the touch-me screen. He wanted to save the city. He realized he was wrong. You helped him see that. It was his suggestion, and since he had so much stick in his system, he was able to. He did the right thing, Arya. Now I realize who Turk means. Kyle is gone. I don't know what to feel. My brother was responsible for so much pain, so much death. A part of me feels incapable of mourning for him. But he was also my brother. He suffered too. He lost someone he loved. I used to think my brother had gone crazy. Now I realize he was tormented. I can only hope that now, wherever he is, he is at peace. There's going to be an election. A real one, Turk says. We're at the beginning of a new era for Manhattan. Everything we fought for is about to happen. How do you feel? Strange, I say. Not like myself. All our hard work, Davida's death, the loss of my brother, it has amounted to something after all. Hunter and I may not be together, but our dreams and the dreams of his mother are going to be realized. I spin around to face him. Do you still love me? He blinks. What do you mean? I'm different now. I, I look different. Maybe you're not attracted to me. Maybe you don't. Turk silences me with a kiss. It's full of passion. I love who you are, he says softly. Not what you look like. He takes my hand. Now come on. Put some clothes on and let's go find the others. Benny and Kid are outside asking for you. And Rhea has a freshly made bed for you back at the hideout. He thinks for a second. Although I suppose it isn't actually a hideout anymore. Now it's just a townhouse. Hunter and Shannon? I ask. And Yarrick? They'll be so happy to see you, Turk says, his eyes dancing with life and love and something even more potent. Hope. I quickly pull an old summer dress from my closet and put it on. Then I take his hand and walk to the door of my bedroom. A trail of white follows me. Maybe first, I say, giving him another kiss. I can get a haircut. <laughs>